makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Once again on the threshold of a well-remembered room. Lamplight streams across the handsome bindings of a cherished and well-read library. The fragrance of a bowl of ruddy apples fills the air. In a comfortable, worn leather armchair sits our old friend and favorite rocketeer, the genial Dr. Watson. Come in, Mr. Harris. Come in and welcome. Welcome to you and all our host of radio friends. You look as if your summer vacation had been a huge success, Doctor. Oh, it was indeed. I've taken off a bit of weight, don't you think? Absolutely. How did you do it? Oh, helping Holmes look after his blasted bees. Mary and I were down in Sussex for a month this summer, you know. I had no idea beekeeping was so strenuous, Doctor. Well, it wasn't that so much as the fact that I was jolly well stung on the lip by a rampant queen. <laughs> In consequence, I was obliged to partake of a liquid diet for one entire week. But uh, that's enough about me. Suppose we get on to the person I'm sure our listeners are most anxious to hear about, the world's greatest consulting detective by his own admission, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. And which of his adventures are we to have this evening, Doctor? Well, suppose I relate the case of the dog who changed his mind. It concerns a fabulous bottle of ancestral brandy and an old woman whose murder benefited no one but a famous society of wine tasters. Sounds promising. But uh, before we become further involved, don't you think this is a good time to mention the gentleman whose courtesy, not to say checkbooks, have made this winter series of broadcasts possible? A very sound idea, Dr. Watson. For our listeners should know all there is to know about clipper craft clothes. As millions of men have discovered... They're just about the most amazing clothes values you've ever seen. And as you well know, there's a why and a wherefore for everything. In this case, it's the famous Clipper Craft plan. By concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores from coast to coast, you get all the advantages of steady year-round operation, all the savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. It gives you the benefits of group buying plus the friendly personal attention you expect at the leading store in your community, at the store you can trust. And it doesn't take a Sherlock Holmes to discover that Clippercraft values are second to none. You can buy expensive-looking Clippercraft suits at only $35 and $40, with a few deluxe models at $43.75. You can buy Clippercraft top coats and overcoats at only $30 to $40, and sport jackets at only $24. Believe me, this is your clue to clothes satisfaction this fall. Simply compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the case of the dog who changed his mind? All right, sir. Yes, I, let me see. It was, it was in a good old Baker Street days, a rather gloomy day in late October, to be exact. We had uh, breakfasted late in front of a sea coal fire. With my body in one easy chair and my legs upon another, I sat listening with growing irritation to Holmes as he practiced interminable scales, laughs, lissandos, and what have you on his violin. At last, a particularly screeching dissonance was more than my frazzled nerves could bear. Holmes, must you do that? Calm yourself, my dear Watson. I was not responsible for that last bit of cacophony. It was caused by the scraping of a carriage wheel against our curbstone. I rather think we're about to receive a client, a lady, rather slight and agitated. Well, how can you possibly tell? You haven't even bothered to look out of the window. My ears, Watson, are nearly as well trained as my eyes. The infinitesimal creak of the carriage springs as its passenger descended to the pavement indicate a slender person. The tap of French heels indicate a lady. The quickness of her step indicates that she's agitated. Yes, decidedly agitated. You yeah, must say, Holmes, you have ears like a hawk. Yes. Your metaphor is a trifle mixed, my dear Watson, but I accept your tribute. Come in. Mr. Holmes? Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Naturally. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Oh, how do you do? 
Oh, thank heavens you're at home. You must come at once, Mr. Holmes. She's been murdered. I know she has. And they'll blame Reggie. Dr. Tillinghurst has sent for Scotland Yard. Oh, Mr. Holmes, can't you do something? My dear young lady, I can do a great many things, but not until you could give us a coherent account of your difficulty. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have made a fool of myself. But the whole thing is so impossible. You see, she'd never commit suicide. Even at 89, she enjoyed life tremendously. And no one could have killed her because she was alone with the door bolted from the inside. Who is this remarkable old lady, and why should anyone want to kill her? She's... She was Lady Blenkinsop, but who in the world would want to harm her? Oh, I'll admit she was eccentric and difficult at times. You know the French, Mr. Holmes, but it didn't frighten anyone, not even Bobo. Bobo? Oh, Bobo is her pug dog, terribly spoiled but devoted and funny, too. Oh. It was always with her, sitting on her lap or sleeping at the foot of her bed. Poor little thing, that's where we found him this morning when we broke in the door just stood there barking at the noise we made and wagging his tail at Dr. Tillinghurst. Why did you break in the door? Because it was still locked when Potter's, uh, he's the butler, brought up Lady Blenkinsop's early tea. She always locked herself in at night. Didn't want anyone to catch sight of her without her curls, I suspect. But this morning was different, I gather. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. I made her tea and a bit of toast at 9.30. You see, I'm her companion, but I do cook her breakfast and fix her a bit of lunch. There's a charwoman who comes in to do the heavy cleaning and cooks dinners. And Potter's attends to the rest of the house. Mm, rather a meager domestic staff for a person of Lady Blinkensop's standing. Eh, what? Is oh. she hard up for funds? Oh, no. I believe she's quite well off. Her own money, too. Of course, the Blinkensop estates went to Reggie when Lady Blinkensop's husband died. He inherited the title, too. Creating a certain amount of friction between the old lady and her nephew, no doubt. Oh, no, Dr. Watson. They were devoted to each other. Not that they didn't squabble now and then. Like last night, when Reggie stamped out of the house when she took her birthday brandy up to bed with her unopened, without offering him a drink. Well, surely he could drop round to his club if he wanted a nightcap. Oh, you don't understand. Lady Blenkinsop's birthday brandy is very special. We've always looked forward to it. But this being the last bottle, I imagine she wanted to save it. Yesterday was her birthday, you see, and I baked her a birthday uh, cake. What happened last night is not what brought you here. Oh, no. Last night was fun. Just Reggie and myself and Lady Blenkinsop and Potter's, of course. She always gave him a piece of the cake, too. It was all so gay. This morning was horrible. Right from the time you woke up? Oh, as a matter of fact, Potter's was whistling when I gave him her tray to take up. Here's Lady Blankenstock's tray, Potter. Oh, morning, Miss Kitty. Take this morning, aren't we? A bit. I overslept, but it's all right, I hope. I imagine Lady Blankenstock overslept, too, after last night's excitement. I wouldn't count on it. She's a great one, her ladyship is. Next year, she'll be 90. And here she is, as bright and sassy as the day his lordship brought her here, a bride from France. I'll never forget her driving up in the carriage surrounded with all those cases of brandy. Brought them over from France, she had. Said her father had sent them along so she'd have something fit to drink on her birthdays, at least. <laughs> there were so many bottles, I thought she'd never live to drink the last. But there's no more left, Miss Kitty. That one she took upstairs is the end. She always felt when that brandy was gone, she'd be gone, too. Oh, nonsense, Potter. That's just superstition. Here, you'd better take her tea up before it gets cold, or she'll snatch you bald-headed. <laughs> and how could she do that when it's bald? I've been 30 years now. <laughs> oh, Miss Kitty, there's the front door. It's all right, Potters. I'll answer it. Oh, Dr. Tillinghurst, good morning. Good morning, Miss Kitty. <laughs> Started away. I'll just leave my umbrella here in the stand. How's Lady Blenkinsop this morning? I don't really know. I've just sent her tray up. I think she may have slept later than usual. Yesterday was her birthday, you know. That's exactly why I dropped by. Thought she might have overdone it a bit. Can't be too careful at her age. Thought I'd like to listen to her heart. I'll go up and announce you. Good girl. I don't know what she pays you, but whatever it is, it's not enough. <laughs> I do all right. Besides, I enjoy my work here. She's really lots of fun. And doesn't give you much time to yourself, I imagine. Hello. What's wrong with Potter's? He's still standing outside the door. 
What's the matter, Potter? I have, I have knocked and I have knocked, but she doesn't say come in. Well, go in anyway. I can't. The door is still bolted. Let me try. Lady Blenkinsop? Lady Blenkinsop, are you awake? That's Bobo. He's heard us. But why doesn't Lady Blenkinsop answer? Open the door. Please open the door. Uh, I think we'd better force the door. Come on, Potters, help me. Yes, sir. We'll use this heavy chair. Steady now. One and two and... <coughs> easy, Bobo, easy, 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 easy. It's all right, old fellow. Oh, she's still asleep. But she's so white. Oh, Dr. Tillinghurst, I'm frightened. I'll have a look at her. Where's my stethoscope? No pulse. Pupils contracted. Miss Kitty, look there on the bed table. She did open the brandy bottle after all. Don't touch anything. Everything must be left exactly as it is. But Dr. Tillinghurst. Lady Blankensop is dead. Poisoned. Oh, no. Potters, go for the police. Yes, sir. Tell them Lady Blankensop has committed suicide. Tell them to inform Scotland Yard. But she wouldn't do that. I know she Miss wouldn't. Miss Kitty, I want you to go to the nearest apothecaries. I shall want some things. We shall have to make some tests. Meantime, I'll try to fasten this door. No one is to be loud in here. No one. Come on, Bobo. Come on. Come on. It's a good boy. But she didn't kill herself, Mr. Holmes. I know she didn't. She was terrified of death. Then someone else must have poisoned her. You did say she was poisoned. But Dr. Tillinghurst seemed to think so. But who could have done it? No one could have got into the room. The door was barred on the inside. So were all the shutters I noticed particularly. Could anyone have been hidden somewhere in the room before she went upstairs? Oh, no. I looked under the bed and the dressing table. She always made me do that when I brought her up to bed. She was terrified of the dark, you see. No, she was quite alone when she met her death. Maybe she took an overdose of something by accident. Maybe the brandy was poisoned. Maybe she had a secret sorrow. Watson, I abhor guessing games. I prefer facts. Uh, get your overcoat while I summon a four-wheeler. It's vital we reach Lady Blankensop's house before Scotland Yard has had a chance to muck up the clues. You say that Lady Blankensop was French. You don't happen to know her family name. Yes, Mr. Holmes. It was de Fezinac. Her father was a count. Hmm. De Fezinac. No wonder her bridal brandy was rather special, eh, Watson? De Fezinac, de Fezinac. Sounds vaguely familiar. Can't say I place it, however. The de Fezinacs are a branch, I might say, the main trunk of the great house of Armagnac. From which the name of the brandy is derived. By Jove, of course. Oh, I do remember Lady Blenkinsop going on about her family's vineyard. It seems it was customary for every daughter of the house to take with her, as part of her dowry, half a dozen cases of the brandy that was bottled the year of her birth. Lady Blenkinsop always boasted that hers was a particularly fine year. She opened a bottle every birthday. Half a dozen cases. Let's see, that's, that's 72 bottles. Lady Blenkinsop was 87. By Jove, that means she was 17 when she was married. All of which has no bearing on the case whatsoever. Never cut her up the mind with non-essentials, Watson. That's your weakness. Well, who's to decide what's essential in a case like this? I am. Tell me, Miss Kitty, who benefits by Lady Blenkinsop's death? Benefits? Why, no one. Goodness, no one ever wanted to... her to die, I'm sure. We were all much too fond of her. Let me put it this way, then. Who inherits Lady Blenkinsop's money? The nephew, I suppose, and you and Potters have been left a small legacy, no doubt. Gracious, no, Mr. Holmes. Lady Blenkinsop's last will leaves everything to a French society of wine tasters. The Chevalier de Vendage Ancien. The Knights of the Ancient Vintages. Go to the head of the class, Watson. It's for the improvement of the French wine industry, you see. Hmm. You said her last will. How long ago did she make it? Oh, about eight months ago, Mr. Holmes. Who was her heir before that? Why, Reggie, of course. But you mustn't draw any wrong conclusions about that, Mr. Holmes. Reggie didn't need the money, but he's plenty of his own. Really, they were very devoted to each other. They just, well, they just didn't always see eye to eye about certain subjects. For instance? Oh, I don't know. Reggie didn't approve of Bobo being fed sweetmeat. They had terrific squabbles about things like that. What exactly was the squabble that caused Lady Blenkinsop to change her will? It was all so silly, really. A tempest in a teapot. It didn't mean a thing. What didn't mean a thing? 
He's holding my hand. Reggie, I mean. He just happened to have handed me the morning mail, and he... Well, he just forgot to let go. Lady Blinkensop didn't approve, I take it. She was always afraid he would make what she called an unsuitable alliance. Uh, the French point of view, of course, eh, Holmes? Not entirely. How did Reggie react? He was furious. He said when he married, it would be when and how and to whom he dashed well pleased. Bully for him. But it's all so ridiculous. You see, Reggie never showed any interest in me before or since. Hmm. Pity, eh, Holmes? Oh, here we are. This is Lady Blankensop's house. Gloomy old mausoleum, eh, Holmes? Hop out, Watson, and ring the doorbell. That's a good chap. Oh, that won't be necessary, Mr. Holmes. I have a key. I gather Scotland Yard is here before us. How can you tell, Mr. Holmes? Unless I'm very much mistaken, that's Inspector Lestrade's official umbrella still dripping on the vestibule floor. Perhaps we're not too late after all. Oh, Miss Kitty, I'm so glad you've come back. I just brought the gentleman from Scotland Yard. He's in the reception room. Well, well, if it isn't Inspector Lestrade, the watchdog of Scotland Yard. Holmes, what in blazes are you doing here? My usual occupation, investigating a crime. There's no crime this time, Holmes. Lady dies. Poisoned, they tell me. Absolutely alone she is. Doors and windows locked tight on the inside. Clear case of suicide. The Scotland Yard method. Reductio ad absurdum. And what's wrong with that? Whatever it is. Personally, I prefer to review the facts. Dr. Dillinghurst says, will you be kind enough to come upstairs, gentlemen? He's waiting outside her ladyship's door. We'll be right up. Thank you, Potter. Hey, great Scott. What's that unearthly racket? It's Bobo, her ladyship's dog. Dr. Tillinghurst says he's been carrying on like that on her threshold ever since he took him out of the room and closed the door. Bobo, don't! Oh, stop him, somebody. She knows she's lying there dead, poor little creature. Can't you make him stop, Dr. Tillinghurst? He's always been so fond of you. Make him stop. He won't even let me near the door. Nice, Bobo. Be a good dog. Ah, you see? Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Tillinghurst. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Oh, how do you do, sir? How do you do? Suppose we allow Scotland Yard to handle the situation. Think I want to have Nan taken over by a vicious brute? <laughs> no, thanks. But he's not vicious. At least he never was before. Very well. I'll take over. Mr. Sherlock Holmes to the rescue. That's enough, Bobo. We know how you feel. That's right. Quiet down. Well, now look at that. He's crawling over to him. He's letting himself be picked up. He's licking his ear. <laughs> Wanted to tell me something, is that it? Yes, I understand. I understand very well, old fellow. Now, Dr. Chillingest, the inspector and I will see if we can get to the bottom of this mystery. Uh, it's no mystery to me, Holmes. That's what you think, my dear Lestrade. That's what you think. Now, if you'll follow me, gentlemen... Uh, this will be rather unpleasant, Miss Kitty. You'd better remain outside. You see, Inspector Lestrade, the pupils are definitely contracted. Face pale, extremities cyanotic. Uh, right you are, Dr. Tillingish. It's poison, all right. But which one? We won't know until we've made tests, of course. I sent Miss Kitty up with a solution of ferric chloride. If it's opium or one of its derivatives, as I suspect, that should do the trick. Uh, Dr. Tillinghurst, were you in the habit of prescribing opium or any of the other somniferous poisons for Lady Blankensop? Certainly not. I say, Holmes, look here. The brandy bottle has been tipped over. All the brandy's run out on the carpet. Oh, poor Lady Blankensop. She always said she'd die when the brandy was gone. And now it is, and so is she. Oh, that'll do, Potters. We've no time for idle superstition. Yes, sir. If you ask me, it's a plot. Whoever spilled the brandy knew it had been poisoned. Didn't want to leave any about to be tested. The brandy was not poisoned, Watson. Here, notice the wax that sealed the cork. Mm. That wax was melted over that cork when Lady Blenkinsop was a girl. She herself removed it last night after she'd locked her door when she was by herself. Well, at least she did have a drink of it on her birthday, poor old soul. And here it is now seeped into the carpet. What a dreadful waste. You say she never took a sedative, Dr. Tillinghurst, or a painkiller of any sort? That she did, sir. A bit of laudanum when she got a Tuesday. Oh, 
Yeah, of course, I, I did prescribe laudanum a year or so ago. Christmas it was, I think. Yes, when she develops an ache in a lower bicuspid. Did the Lady Blenkinsop suffer from frequent toothache potters? Only when she was excited, sir. Like holidays and birthdays and now and then when she bet on a horse. Then uh, yesterday being her birthday, she probably developed a toothache and took a dose of laudanum before retiring. Of course, that explains it all. Laudanum is an opium derivative. She took an overdose. You know, I never could persuade her to be accurate. Her confounded Gallic temperament. Uh, Potters, do you know where she kept her medicines? Oh, yes, sir. Top drawer of the dressing table. Oh, yes, of course, I remember. Let's see. Uh, yes. Yes, here we are. Batley's Liquor Opii Sedativus. That's double strength laudanum. She must have bought this at the apothecary's herself and didn't realize it was at least four times as strong as the prescription I gave her. Doesn't take much of an overdose to turn the trick when you're 89. Well, Holmes, there you are. Now are you satisfied? A plain case of accidental suicide by poison. I've never doubted that Lady Blenkinsop was dope, Lestrade, and quite probably by her own hand. But that's not what caused her death. No, Lestrade, Lady Blenkinsop was asphyxiated, strangled, the evidence is obvious. Really, Mr. Holmes. I'm astonished that a man of your reputation should be ignorant of the fact that the symptom of asphyxia and death by one of the somniferous poisons are almost identical. Yes, he's right, Holmes. Every doctor knows that. Besides, there's no sign of a struggle. If she'd been strangled, she'd have put up a fight. Not necessarily if she'd been doped first. Tell me, Potters. Was Lady Blenkinsop in the habit of wearing her pearls to bed? I see what you're driving at, Holmes. The pearls did it. Got caught around her neck. And with all that laudanum in her, she never realized they were strangling her. Wrong again, Lestrade. She was strangled, not accidentally by her pearls, but intentionally by someone who saw her helpless condition and held a pillow or perhaps the bedclothes over her mouth until she stopped breathing. In fact, I strongly suspect she came too long enough to put out a hand and upset that bottle of brandy. Oh, imagination, Mr. Holmes. Pure imagination. Really? Then how do you account for this lint up her nostrils? Well, I'll be... Well, I never noticed. You didn't notice, Lestrade, because you didn't look. If you perform an autopsy, I've no doubt you'll find more bits of lint in her lung. Lint from the very finest French linen. Lady Blankensop always bought her linens in France. Exactly. Oh, but this is preposterous. How did the chap get in to strangle her? Remember, the doors and windows were still bolted tight when Dr. Tillingus and the others broke in this morning and found her dead. When the doctor said he found her dead? Uh, what's the difference? Why do you suppose he sent the rest of the household out of the house in such a hurry? Uh, why? First, because he didn't want them to get a good look at her and realize she wasn't dead, only drugged. And second, and here comes the really diabolical part of the whole affair. Second, so he could come back quietly when the house was empty and finish her off with Ridiculous. Lot of lies. You can't prove a thing. No? Then why wasn't Bobo upset when you broke in this morning? Because he knew his mistress was still alive. Not. Why did he later turn on you and offer to bite you? Because he'd seen you go back and kill his mistress. <laughs> of course, it, if you're going to put a dumb beast in the witness box. And why is the brandy splashed on your shoe? That's not brandy, it's mud. I've been walking in the rain. Analysis will show what it is, Dr. Tillinghurst. Well, suppose it is brandy. I sometimes stop into a pub on a bad day for a brandy and soda. I may have spilled some on my boots. Uh, that's right, Holmes. Uh, what can we prove? Now, let's be sensible. What, what reason, what possible motive could I have for killing off one of my best patients? Uh, that's a fact, Holmes. No motive. No possible motive whatsoever. Would you consider a fabulous rope of pearls worth, say, eight or ten thousand pounds... Would you consider that sufficient motive, my dear Lestrade? But Lady Blenkinsop's pearls are still obviously on the body. Those are not the Blenkinsop pearls, Lestrade. Eh? What? Oh, I'll admit they're very clever imitations. Yes, if you'll investigate that bulge in the doctor's upper left-hand pocket, I think you may discover the genuine pearls. Well, Watson, quick, don't let him get away. No, you don't. Stop or I'll fill you full of lead. By Jove, I'm sorry, Holmes. I, I had no idea the blighter would make a bow for it. <laughs> don't worry, Watson. I fancy Lestrade is still capable of handling the more rough-and-tumble side of apprehending criminals. Oh, Mr. Holmes, what happened? I just saw Inspector Lestrade escorting Dr. Tillinghurst out of the front door in handcuffs. What does it mean? My dear Miss Kitty, it means that the criminal has yet to be born who can put anything over on Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Oh, 
A very entertaining story, Dr. Watson. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Mr. Harris. Now, of course, there are one or two small matters that puzzle me. Why did Holmes say the dog had told him something when he picked him up? A very interesting question with a very interesting answer. I'll give it to you after you've said a few words about the excellent product that puts the bill for us. Right, Dr. Watson. When you can go to your favorite store and get the nation's most exciting clothes value, that's just good common sense. For the Clipper Craft plan is just another matter of simple logic. So that you receive all the benefits of group purchasing, it concentrates the buying power of 924 leading stores across the country. It makes possible the nation's highest standard of clothes value brought to you at the leading independent store you really enjoy visiting and that enjoys serving you. Where you're a person, not just another number on a sales check. Now bear in mind that flipper craft clothes are faultlessly tailored from luxurious long-wearing fabrics that Clipper Craft smart styles fit to custom perfection. Despite the fact that costs of materials and manufacturing are rising, there are new fall Clipper Craft suits at only $35 and $40. There are a few special models at $43.75. Clipper Craft top coats and overcoats are only $30 to $40, and sport jackets only $24. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive prices at the nation's finest stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clippercraft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men Shop, Kresge, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 164-08 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great courteous and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. And now for your question about Bobo, Mr. Harris. When Holmes picked up the dog, he was struck by the fact that his paws were wet. Wet with something that smelled suspiciously like brandy. Later, when he entered the death chamber and saw the overturned bottle, he knew exactly what must have happened. I wonder if I'd have been that smart. Uh, one more thing, Dr. Watson. Yes, Mr. Harris? What story are you going to give us next week? Uh, next week, I think it'll be the case of the missing heiress. Or how a very charming and very hot-headed Canadian girl disappeared from her carriage in full regalia on her way to be presented at court. of Clipper Craft clothes and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast have brought you the first in a new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran. Our stories are written by Edith Miser with special music by Albert Berman. Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen again next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Case of the Missing Heiress. If you wish to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain tickets. This is Cy Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Stay with us for Melvin Elliott's report on the news which follows station identification. Fly Eastern Airlines' new type Constellation service to Houston in only five hours and 50 minutes. For immediate reservations, call Eastern Airlines or your travel agent. W.O.R., the World Series station in New York. Sherlock Holmes.
And so once again we find ourselves in Dr. Watson's cheerful fireless study. Outside, a cutting October wind scurries the brittle leaves. But inside, all snug and cozy with his feet on the well-polished fender, sits our favorite host and storyteller. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you. And which of Holmes' fabulous adventures are we to have tonight, sir? But tonight it's the case of the missing heiress. The Canadian heiress, to be exact, pert and pretty as a picture, and with a mind of her own. I can never forget her father's expression when he discovered the compromising situation she... Oh, <laughs> there I go, getting ahead of myself as usual. Well, now, don't look so worried, Mr. Harris. I haven't forgotten. This is where we say a few words on behalf of a very generous sponsor. Thank you, Dr. Watson. And our sponsor really is generous in more ways than one. And now, Mr. Harris, to our story, the case of the missing heiress. Put your boots on the fender and make yourself comfortable. Mm, a perfect combination. A crackling fire to warm one's feet and a hair-raising adventure to chill one's spine. <laughs> Sounds rather like, like one of those confounded hot and cold shower baths that are the curse of this modern age. Now, in the good old Baker Street days, when one made one's daily ablutions in a tin tub that was filled from a pair of steaming jugs... One got in and out as fast as possible to prevent freezing to death, eh, Dr. Watson? Only in the wintertime, Mr. Harris. Only in the winter. I remember one bright July afternoon in the year... Well, let me see. Well, never mind. It was before you were out of your cradle. I was tossing about in my morning trap. I, I thought you said it was afternoon. <laughs> when one shared lodgings and adventures with the great Sherlock Holmes, one frequently took one's morning tub in the afternoon or evening. So, uh... Well, where was I? Uh, uh, splashing around in your morning tub in mid-afternoon. Oh, yes, yes, yes. As a matter of accuracy, I was just removing the soap from back of the ears and giving a not inspired rendition of a current comic opera hit when Holmes burst in rather unceremoniously. <laughs> Wandering in the lie, a thing of shreds and patches. I am safe what you stop that caterwauling and so on a dressing gown. We're about to have a caller, and I'm sure it means another case. And why should that interrupt my bath? You're quite capable of handling the first stage of a case by yourself, Holmes. Not when it concerns a lady in hysterics in a court train. You're much better than I at managing female education. Holmes, what are you raving about? An elegant carriage has just galloped up to our curbstone. And without waiting for the footman to alight from the box and assist her, a middle-aged creature in full court regalia, complete to the feathers in her hair, bursts out into the street and is even now pulling our front doorbell out by the roof. Oh, Lord, well... Aha, uh -huh. Mrs. Hudson's let her in. She's coming up the stairs. Now, will you come out and protect me? Certainly not. Very well, then. I shall be obliged to usher her in here. No, 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 great Scott, wait. I'm coming, I'm coming. Good Lord, look at me. And a fine way to greet a lady. <laughs> Don't worry. Unless I'm greatly mistaken, she's too upset to notice. Yes, tie the cord around your middle. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Yes. And you put your slippers on the wrong feet. Oh, confound it. I will come in. Mr. Holmes. Oh, Mr. Holmes, thank heaven I find you at home. Why, Lady Mamie. Oh, Dr. Watson, delighted to see you. Could you get me a glass of sherry? Oh, this is terrible. I'm ruined. And the poor girl. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you must find her. You must. Of course, Lady Maynooth, but first, perhaps you'd better tell us the name of this damsel in distress and inform us just what difficulty she seems to be in. Oh, that's just it. I haven't the remotest idea. Uh, I don't mean I don't know her name. It's Elizabeth. Elizabeth Bascom. Yes, Miss Lizzie Bascom, the only child of old Hellfire Bascom, the Canadian copper king. That's right, Dr. Watson. Oh, quite the belle of the season, I gather. Yes, Elizabeth has certainly been popular. Not that it made the slightest impression on her. Mm, yes, perhaps that explains her popularity. That and her father's millions. Uh, but why are you so concerned about Miss Elizabeth Bascom, Lady Maynard? It's been my responsibility to stand for the young lady through her first London season. To see that she makes the proper social connections and, well, her father is bound and determined that she shall marry into the nobility. I had no idea that George Bascom, more often referred to as Hellfire, was one of your acquaintances, Lady Maynard. To be quite frank, Mr. Holmes, I've never set eyes on Elizabeth's father, but a, well, a mutual friend... Knowing that he was anxious to have her received in the best circles, and also knowing that my own uh, financial position has not been too secure lately, well, well I was, shall we say, persuaded to take Elizabeth under my wing. I hope you made a profitable arrangement. I did, Mr. Holmes, but I earned it every penny. You, uh, you mean the young lady is uncouth in spite of her good looks? Oh, no, Dr. Watson. The truth forces me to admit that Elizabeth is really quite presentable, and even lovable, when not cross. But when she is cross, she takes after her father? Exactly. She insists on going to solitary walks, completely unchaperoned. She strikes up an acquaintance with the most unlikely people. Mm, democratic, eh, Holmes? It might be considered democratic in an ordinary female. But where a young woman of Miss Bascom's wealth is concerned, it's rather dangerous. Oh, how true. 
We've been receiving, well, not exactly threats, but suddenly cranked letters ever since it became known that Elizabeth had come to stay with me. But she absolutely refuses to pay heed to her own danger. Says she's been handling situations of that sort all her life, and she refuses to come perturbed about it at this late date. And now it's happened. What has? Oh, well, well, I, I finally persuaded her to take an interest in young Lord Weaverbrook. A very beautiful match in every way. In fact, her father is arriving on the next boat in order to announce the engagement. Oh, surely that's nothing to be upset about. Oh, yes, but what is he going to do when he finds his daughter has been abducted? Abducted? You mean, forcibly? This note was pinned to the carriage seat when I returned and found Elizabeth gone. I gather from your costume, Lady Maynooth, that you were on your way to Buckingham Palace. Yes, Mr. Holmes. After considerable maneuvering, I had arranged to have Miss Bascom receive the court. It took a bit of doing, and I'll admit I expected trouble with Elizabeth. However, she fell in with a plan with quite a show of alacrity, even standing patiently for endless sittings of her train and taking lessons in how to make a court bow. Yes, I, I often wondered how one managed it. Don't interrupt, Watson. Uh, go on, Lady Menu. Today, I take it, was the day. Yes, and more perfect weather one couldn't have wished for. And I must say, Elizabeth seemed to be in high spirits. We were well prepared with the usual hamper of wine and sandwiches and cake. You know that interminable waiting for the danger talk? Yes, and I, I've thought often that the sight of the ladies in their full regalia on the way to a court function is one of the great sights of London. Elizabeth seemed to share your opinion, Dr. Watson. At any rate, she seemed in unusually high spirits as the other carriages crowded around us. Many may know. Even more exciting than a regatta. All the street musicians and the crowds packing on the sidewalk as if it were a parade. All waving and cheering and calling to it. Oh, there she goes. That's the bad thing. Give us an idea. One doesn't bring that to me. It's not fun. I'm sorry. Now, we'll cover your flowers with a nothing idea. The sun is really becoming rather oppressive. If you ask me, it's darn hot. Now, Elizabeth, you mustn't smile back. It only encourages them. But why shouldn't I smile? I'm so happy. Now, control yourself another moment, dear, and we'll be in time today where the crowd can't follow us. Oh, then we're nearly there. Heavens, no. It takes ages, even after you're in the courtyard. Yes. Here we go. That's better. Now, uh, let's see what's in our luncheon hamper. I didn't know I'm hot star. Oh, no. Uh, no, let's wait. Uh, I'm still so excited. Oh, oh Lady Mayu, look. Who is that handsome man walking among the carriages and sticking his head into some of them? Oh, dear, I wish he wouldn't. His mother would be so put out if she knew he were out here. They will do it all the boys. <laughs> they say it's much more fun than it is inside. Lady oh, Mayu is coming this way. Oh, he's going to stop. Well, so this is the carriage that has been causing all the commotion. No wonder. Hello there. Hello yourself. Well, that's refreshing. So this is the beautiful Lizzie who has set the town on its ears. Oh, Lady Manus, I, I didn't notice you at first. You wouldn't by any chance have some smelling salts? The Dowager Duchess of Peel seemed rather wonky as I passed the barouche. I, I wonder if you'd come and take a look at it. Well, of course, certainly. Let's see, where did I put the smelling salt? Uh, in your reticule, Lady Mamie. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I'd like that. Oh, and Elizabeth. Yes, Lady Mamie? If that gentleman should return, be sure you address him as your highness. <laughs> and that, Mr. Holmes, was the last I saw of Elizabeth Baxter. She was abducted, abducted in broad daylight. Right there in the courtyard of Buckingham Palace. You, uh, you don't think it was done by a prince of the blood royal? Oh, they've been known to pull some rather spectacular pranks. No member of the House of Hanover, Dr. Watson, would write this note. It was pinned to the cushions of the seat directly behind the box. Uh, may I see, Lady Maynard? Of course, Mr. Holmes. Yes, the whole affair was undoubtedly planned in advance. Oh, what makes you say that, Holmes? The words are printed in ink, large, bold lettering, and the paper's been folded. Furthermore, there's a rather carefully executed dusty palm print in the lower left-hand corner. But what is the message? What does the note say? The words of communication of this sort are always the least enlightening part of the official, Watson. But just to satisfy your curiosity, I'll read them to you. That's right of you. We have kidnapped Lizzie. If you know what's good for her, don't tell the cops. 
signed the black hand. Oh, a band of American cutthroats. The words kidnapped and cops are dead giveaway. I've heard of these black hand gangs. Poor Lizzie. You know, men like that are desperate characters. Oh, dear. We can only hope her father will arrive in time to pay any ransom demands. Oh, are you, Mr. Holmes? Yes, we uh, may be dealing with a band of cutthroats and desperados, but let's not jump to any conclusions, Watson, until we've examined the scene of the crime. What do you mean you expect to find clues in all that turmoil in the courtyard of Buckingham Palace? No, Watson, the scene of the crime is much closer than that. It is, in fact, drawn up to our curb. I allude, of course, to Lady Maynard's carriage. Oh, I see what you mean. I hadn't thought of that. Well, come along. What are we waiting for? For you to go and finish dressing, Watson. Whoa, Jonathan. Easy now, Penelope. Handsome horses you have, Lady Menu. Thank you. Uh, this is Horace, Mr. Holmes. Horace has been our footman for over 50 years. Hey, man and boy. And that's the truth. Record to be proud of, Horace, in these troubled times. Eh? He's a little deaf, Mr. Holmes. A little day. I said you've a fine record, Horace. Hey, I have that. Uh, if you'll open the door, please, Horace. Uh, Mr. Holmes is a detective. He's out to inspect the carriage. I know who Mr. Holmes is, Mum. Everybody knows Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Horace, when did you first become aware that Miss Bascom was not in the carriage? What? Uh, when her ladyship come back and found the note. You didn't see or hear anything unusual before that? I did not. Anyway, he's our coachman, you know. Uh, uh, gone off to help with Lord Dunphy's man, uh, who was having trouble with his horses. And I had the hands full hold of our horses, uh, <laughs> but I handled them. Can't tell about it. I mean, Horace. Uh, besides uh, which, I'm a bit deaf. <laughs> Not that you could notice, uh, but it keeps me from hearing things. Mm, I'm afraid Horace has got a broken reed in this affair. What's that? I said thank you, Horace. <clears throat> well, let's um, have a look inside the carriage. Give me my magnifying glass, Watson. <laughs> hmm. Yes, interesting. Very interesting. What have you found, Holmes? Bloodstains? On the contrary, there's not the slightest indication of a struggle. Either Miss Bascom left the carriage of her own free will, or she was lured out of it by someone she considered a friend. Very significant. Very. It's significant, Holmes, but uh, hardly helpful. Yes, here is her parasol, neatly furled. Surely if she'd been attacked, she'd have attempted to use it as a weapon. And the luncheon hamper, neatly placed in the corner, open up the lid, Watson. Uh, very well. Hello. What's up? The series is empty. Not even a crumb left. Why, that blackguard. They not only abducted my ward, they stole my lunch as well. Oh, what is it the pound case had easy been cut into? The scoundrel. Oh, Holmes, I'm afraid we have really drawn a blank. No clues, no clues at all. And not so fast, Watson. Here is a long thread of heavy silk. Uh, Lady Maynooth. Has Miss Lizzie, by any chance, a garment with a blue fringe in her wardrobe? Yes, of course. And a pelerine that goes over a few walking feet. But what does that to do with the case? She was wearing full court regalia when she was abducted. That's what makes it so preposterous, really. You know, you couldn't possibly kidnap a lady in a court costume. Hello, here's something in the side pocket of the hamper. Show that to Elizabeth Spodica, her guide book. She was always speeding off by herself with that under her arm. And the number of times it happened, she must have visited all the sites of London. Not all, Lady Menu. I fancy Miss Elizabeth rather specialized in the British Museum. Well, how do you arrive at that conclusion? The rest of the volume is rather stiff, showing very few of the pages have been read. But notice how readily the book opens at the portion describing the British Museum. And here, the paragraph describing the famous Elgin Marble. That page is decidedly dog eared. The Elgin Marble? Yes. But Holmes, I've no idea Elizabeth was a connoisseur of art. I fancy Miss Elizabeth is a connoisseur of many things of which you had no idea, Lady Benny. Oh, dear, what do we do now? I suppose we'd better consult Scotland Yard. I rather fancy that a certain Mr. Percy Smithers will prove more helpful in this matter. I suggest that Watson and I pay him a visit. Percy Smithers? Who in thunder is he? The famous archaeologist and authority on Greek and Roman relics. He is also curator of the Elgin Marbles. <laughs> Watson, the British Museum. Imposing if somewhat moth-eaten old mausoleum, eh, Juan? Oh, you needn't point it out to me as if I'd never laid eyes on it before. 
I had an uncle whose idea of entertaining his various visiting nephews was to trail them to the British Museum. And you, of course, have never been guilty of escorting your juvenile relatives to its echoing hall. Well, that is, uh, one must keep up the traditions, you know. Well, never mind. Open the door. I can't. It, it's stuck. Well, never mind. Here comes an attendant. I say, God, the engine seems to be a bit bulky. We can't get it open, don't you know? And why would you? It's been locked up for the night. Closing time was 20 minutes ago. Well, I guess we won't get to see the marbles today, Holmes. I'm not particularly interested in the marbles, Watson. The guard... Can you tell me if Mr. Smithers, curator Percy Smithers, is still on the premises? Oh, no, sir. He's gone home. You saw him leave? Well, he always leaves five minutes before closing time. I don't suppose you can give us his home address. Oh, you better than that, sir. There it be, over there. First house across the quadrangle. The one with the bay window? That's right. Thank you. Come along, Watson. You know this fellow Smithers, Holmes? Only slightly, Watson. I've met him at the Diogenes Club from time to time when I've gone there to see my brother, Mycroft. Like all the rest of the members, he's what you might call taciturn. Oh, the grumpy old professor type, I take it. Professorial and grumpy, I grant you, but he's certainly not old. In fact, Mr. Percy Smithers looks not unlike the Greek statues he's such an authority on. Only with more clothing, of course. Oh, yes, yes, I can remember that there were many elderly ladies who got up a petition demanding draperies be put on the marbles when they first went on exhibition. <laughs> I, of course, consider them perfect as they are. Then you've seen the Elgin marbles? For many times. You recall the statue of Perseus? Perfectly. Could you describe his attitude? I can do better than that. I can duplicate it. He's, uh, he's standing like this. Not bad, except the position to the left and right arm should be reversed. Well, has your frame took a fit, sir? Certainly not. I, I, I was just, uh, I was just explaining something. And stop following us. I wasn't following, sir. I was just going home to me supper. Bumpkin. You recall the face, Watson, of the Persia statue, I mean? Oh, naturally. How would you describe the nose? Well, that is uh, uh, Grecian, of course. Wrong again, Watson. That particular statue has no nose at all. Probably been missing for centuries. Oh. Well, but here we are at the Smithers' door. Ring the bell, Watson. That's a good time. Oh, we're giving orders. Well, I still don't understand what information you expect to gather from the curator of the British Museum about a missing Canadian heiress. You never know, Watson. You never know. Yes, what do you want? We've come to see Mr. Smithers. Mr. Percy Smithers. Well, you can't see him. I'm sorry to disturb him if he's having his supper, but this matter is rather urgent. You can't see him because he's not come home. And as for his supper, it's been burnt to a crisp waiting for him. And a fine trout it was, too, that he ordered special. What a pity. Uh, perhaps you could tell me if a young lady in a blue and pink walking suit has called on Mr. Smithers lately. Certainly not. Mr. Smithers is a respectable man and a womanator besides. Well, once again we draw a blank. This case seems to lead nowhere but down blind alleys. Oh, on the contrary, Watson, the fact that Mr. Smithers did not come home for his supper is decidedly revealing. You don't think he's been forcibly kidnapped, too, by the same outfit that abducted Miss Bascom? No, I don't think there are any indications of uh, kidnapping. At least I doubt that any force was used. Of course, how stupid I've been. Mr. Smithers and Miss Bascom have eloped. <laughs> Watson, the incurable romanticist. Well, no, Watson, a woman hater, myself accepted, of course, might conceivably change his mind. But no ardent lover would order trout, a single trout for supper, on the day on which he expected to run off with his inamorata. Well, well where does that all that get us? Whatever detained Percival Smithers was unexpected, entirely unexpected. Come, let's go home before our supper's been burned to a crisp. Oh, Holmes, how can you think of food when you haven't rescued Miss Baskin from heaven knows only what danger? Whatever danger this is in, I rather imagine she enjoys. Yes, there's nothing further we can do until tomorrow at 8.30. Why, 8.30? That is the time they unbar the entrance to the British Museum. Yes, we shall be waiting at 8.22. <laughs> When you note the low prices of Clipper Craft clothes, you're apt to be puzzled. How do they... Well, it's 8.25, Holmes. Another five minutes and we shall know if your guess is right. I never guess, Watson. You say, Holmes, isn't that Lady Mamie's carriage coming down the street at a full gallop? Yes, Mrs. Hudson must have told her she'd find us here. Yes, here she comes like a ship under full sail. I say, who's the red-faced little man with her? I rather imagine Papa Bascom has arrived. Oh, bless the dead, bless the dead, burn my... Oh, oh, you're Sherlock Holmes. Of 
Why in blazes haven't you found my daughter? I was right, Watson. It is Hellfire Bascom. How do you do, sir? Good morning, Lady Menu. Oh, Mr. Holmes, the most horrible news. The most horrible, horrible news. You haven't found a, a body? No, but first of all, when I returned home last evening, my butler informed me that all the sandwiches, the wine and the cake, had been found in the jardinier of my best ass, the Victor. Well, the, the cook is so excited she set us to leave. Yes, I rather suspected that hamper held something more interesting than food when I found that blue thread. And that's not all. Tell him the worst. Well, this morning, before I even had time to have my morning tea, Lord Brunswick's man returned in the court down and said it. They've been found in his carriage. Why, the scoundrel. Oh, he wasn't in it at the time. He was still at the reception when his coachman discovered the girl. But this makes matters even worse. The poor girl was abducted in her, in her petticoat. Yes, the poor, poor girl. Her reputation was a ruin. Oh, blast her reputation, ma'am. She'll catch her death a cold. Calm yourself, Mr. Bascom. I think I may be able to return your daughter with both her health and her reputation moderately intact. Uh, yes, they're opening the doors now. If you will follow me. What? In the British Museum. Calm yourself, uh, Mr. Bascom. A little culture is quite harmless, I assure you. Uh, ah, our friend the guard. I believe you're about to unlock the hall to the Elgin Marbles. Mind if we watch? Well, not if it'll give you any amusement. I've been unlocking it eight years now. It's never what's been what you might call fascinating. Today, I think you may be in for a surprise. Well, seeing's believing. Well, it's about time. Where did everybody you last night? Didn't you hear the shouting? Mr. Smithers, you've been locked in with them marble women all night. And one that wasn't marble. Lizzie. Lizzie. What in thunder are you doing here? Mm, yes, and wearing the tooth and blue walking suit. Papa! Well, what do you know? Papa, I want you to meet Mr. Percy Smithers, the famous scientist, and your future son-in-law. I am. I wouldn't let you marry a scientist if he was the last man on earth. But, Papa, we've been locked up together all night. Think of my reputation. Well, you... You scout. You planned all this. You lured my innocent little girl into the sack. Where's my dear? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Papa, don't be silly. I was the one that shot Percy. I planned it all. I picked yesterday because all the crowds would be at Buckingham Palace and the museum would be empty. So you threw the food into the jardinier, packed your walking suit in a food hamper, changed in Lord Dunce's carriage, and headed for the British Museum. Yes. The hard part was fascinating Percy so he wouldn't notice it was closing time. As a matter of fact, it wasn't as hard as I'd expected. You see, I suspected Percy, uh, well, liked me, but I couldn't get him to propose. But this is confounded really. Look here, my boy. You will marry her now if I have to get out my old fat gun. Well, of course, I, I rather wanted to anyway, but only on one condition. What's that? Bad plastic. She has to promise to live with him by income. Darling! That was all she wanted to know. And did Lizzie live within her husband's income, Dr. Watson? <laughs> More or less. At least his papa gave her pills from time to time. Percy never knew about it. Uh, how did Elizabeth and her archaeologist get along? Oh, splendidly. You see, Hellfire Baskin backed several expeditions to the British Museum, and curiously enough, Percival Smithers generally headed them. He did some splendid work, too. So when he was finally knighted and Lizzie became Lady Elizabeth, everyone said she more than earned the title. And now, Dr. Watson, how about a hint about next week's hair razor? Oh, next week is a hair razor, Mr. Harris, in more ways than one. It concerns a gentleman who had an unusually florid, I might say a crimson head of hair, and how he was hired for a decidedly curious job on that account. Oh, of course, it's the famous adventure of the red-headed leaf. How did you guess, Mr. Harris? How did you ever guess? The makers of Clipper Class clothes and 900. of Clipper Craft clothes for men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast 
present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Now, once more, we are about to visit Dr. Watson, the friend and chronicler of Sherlock Holmes and his amazing adventures. We find him sitting in his well-worn armchair, an eager look on his face and a humorous twinkle in his eye. Can it be that the good doctor is beginning to look forward to his weekly appearances before the microphone? Good evening, Mr. Harris. <laughs> it's set in the can. And tonight I have my narrative all picked out. Have you ever noticed that red-headed people always seem to lead very eventful lives? Look at Queen Elizabeth. Yes, and I've heard that Cleopatra was a break top, too, and she certainly had very few dull moments. And the stores that sell Clipper Craft clothes have no dull moments either. That's because millions of men have discovered that Clipper Craft gives them value beyond compare. 924 leading stores from coast to coast have concentrated their buying power, resulting in value without precedent because of the savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. What you get is the benefit of group buying with all the friendly personal attention traditionally yours at your own local independent store. You've never seen expensive-looking suits like Clipper Crafts at only $35 and $40, with a few deluxe models at $43.75. The same goes for top coats and overcoats at only $30 to $40, and sport jackets at only $24. Yes, your clothes problem is easily solved this fall, Simply compare Clipper Craft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, shall we get back to our story? Yes, indeed. Well, tonight I have decided to tell you the story of the Red-Headed League. The Red-Headed League? What a curious title. <laughs> more curious than the situation it gave rise to in Sherlock Holmes' life. One day, it was during the autumn of the year 1890, I burst in upon my friend to find him deep in conversation with a stout, florid-faced gentleman with the fiercest red hair it has ever been my privilege to observe. I was about to withdraw when Holmes pulled me abruptly into the room and closed the door behind me. Come in, my dear Watson, come in. You couldn't possibly have come at a better time. But Holmes, I was afraid you were engaged. So I am, my dear fellow. Allow me, Mr. Wilson, this is my friend and helper, Dr. Watson. Well, how do you do, sir? Oh, how do you do? Sit down, Watson, sit down. I know that you share my love of the bizarre, although you've never agreed that for the strangest effects and most extraordinary combinations, we must go to life itself. Well, you know, I... Mr. Haven't... Jabez Wilson here has just started a narrative which promises to be one of the most singular I've listened to for some time. Dear me. Now, my dear Mr. Wilson, perhaps you would have the great kindness to recommence your story. Uh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. As soon as I can find that newspaper clipping, I would, I'd put it in my... I could have sworn it was in my waistcoat. Watson, while we're waiting for Mr. Wilson to find his missing newspaper advertisement, suppose you tell me what you deduce from his appearance. <laughs> really, you know. Uh, well, let me see. Uh, I would say he was uh, middle-aged, if you don't mind my saying, and... Uh, well, he has red hair. Oh, obvious, Watson. Too obvious. I will come to your assistance. He has at some time done manual labor. He's a Freemason, has been in China, and has done a considerable amount of writing lately. Well, Mr. Holmes, you fair give me the creeps. Are, are you one of these mind readers? No, indeed. Then how in the name of good fortune did you know all that about me? About the manual labor, for example. It's as true as gospel. I began as a ship's carpenter. Your hands, my dear sir. Your right hand is quite a size larger than your left. The muscles are more developed. As for the Freemasonry, you wear a square and compass type in. Ah, I see that. But, but the writing, how about that? What else can be indicated by that right cup, so very shiny? And the left sleeve with a smooth patch near the elbow, where you rested on the desk. Well, uh, uh, about China. The fish that you had tattooed immediately above your right wrist could only have been done in China. That trick of staining the fish's scales a delicate pink is quite peculiar to China. And when, in addition, I see a Chinese coin hanging from your watch chain, the matter becomes even more simple. <laughs> well, well, I never. At first, I thought you'd done something clever. But now I see this 
Nothing to it after all. Mm, I begin to think, Watson, that I make a mistake in explaining. Omni ignotum pro magnifico, you know. Oh, yes, yes, of course. What reputation I may have will suffer shipwreck if I'm so candid. Have you found the advertisement, Mr. Wilson? Uh, yes, I've got it now. It was, it was in my watch pocket. This is what began it all, sir. You just read it for yourself. Watson, suppose you do that for us. Oh, it's a pleasure. First, make a note of the paper and the date. This is the Morning Chronicle of July the 27th, 1890. It was just two months ago. Very well. Proceed with the advertisement. It begins to the Red-Headed League. On account of the bequest of the late Ezekiah Hopkins, there is now another vacancy open which entitles a member of the League to a salary of four pounds a week for purely nominal services. All red-headed men above the age of 21 years are eligible. Well, that's very odd. Apply in person on Monday at 11 o'clock to Duncan Ross at the offices of the League, 7 Pope's Court, Fleet Street. Jim me, Holmes, what on earth does this mean? I think I promised you that this case was bizarre. Now, Mr. Wilson, if you'll continue with your story. Well, it's just about as I was telling you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, I have a small pawnbroker shop at Coburg Square. Of late years, the business has been pretty bad. I used to be able to keep two assistants, but now I only keep one. I'd have a job to pay him, only he's willing to come for half wages so as to learn the business. Obliging youth. What's his name? Uh, Vincent Spaulding. And I couldn't want a smarter assistant, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I know he could easily earn twice what I'm able to give him. But, well, as I say, if he's satisfied, who am I to go putting ideas into his head? Yeah. Your assistant seems to be as remarkable as your advertisement. He only has one fault, Mr. Holmes. Photography. Snapping away with his camera, then diving down into the cellar like a rabbit into its hole to develop his pictures. An amateur photographer, eh? He's still with you, I suppose. Oh, yes, sir. An observing young fellow he is. He was the one that brought this advertisement to my notice. It was just this day, eight weeks, when he rapped on my office door with this very paper in his hand. <laughs> Come in, come in. Oh, Mr. Wilson. Sir. Oh, that's you, Vincent. Well, what's the matter? You look excited. Oh, I wish to the Lord, Mr. Wilson, I was a red-headed man. Why that? Well, oh, look here, sir. What it says in this paper. There's another vacancy in the League of the Red-Headed Men. It's worth a pretty penny to him that gets it. The Red-Headed League? I've never heard of it. Never heard of the League of the Red-Headed Men? Oh, Mr. Wilson. A new eligible for one of the vacancies. <laughs> huh? Oh, what are they worth? Oh, merely a couple of hundred a year. But the work is slight and it needn't interfere much with one's regular occupation. In a couple of hundred of pounds a year, you say, here, let me see that paper, young man. Oh, here you are, sir. You see, as far as I can make out, the league was started by a millionaire named Ezekiah Hopkins, a red-headed man himself. And he left his fortune in the hands of the trustees with instructions to provide easy berths to men who had red hair. And from what I hear, the work isn't difficult. Yeah, but there must be millions of red-headed men. Oh, not so many as you might think, sir. You see, it's uh, it's confined to Londoners. Oh. And then again, it, it's no use if your hair is uh, light red or dark red or anything but real blazing fire red. They've got to pick the reddest hair they can find. Well, if there's a redder head of hair than mine in the length and breadth of London, I'd like to see it. Well, I, uh, I have seen a few that I consider redder. What? Nonsense. Here, where's my hat? Well, uh, what are you going to do, Mr. Wilson? I'm going around to apply for that vacancy. If it was raining gold, no one can say that Jabez Wilson is a man to go out with a sim. And did you get the job, Mr. Wilson? I did that, Mr. Holmes. There wasn't a head of air that can touch mine for redness, if I do say it myself. <laughs> There were thousands competing. And what was the work? Well, purely nominal, like the paper said. And it paid four pounds a week, regular as a clock. All, all I had to do was to sit at a desk in an office at that address there from ten to two and copy out bits from the encyclopedia. Hmm. Educational as well as remunerative. And how long did this work continue? Oh, about eight weeks. I was pretty well through the A's. Abbots, archery, architecture, and the like. Then suddenly it came to an end. I went to my work, ten o'clock as usual, 
The door was shut and locked and a card was nailed on the door. What did it say? The Red-Headed League dissolved September 27th, 1890. I said, oh, that's today. This very morning it was, sir. Well, I, I lost no time trying to find the man that hired me. Uh, four pounds a week's four pounds, you know. You say you tried to find the man that rented the office? Yes, sir. I, I inquired from the renting agent and he gave me the man's name and said that he'd moved to a new address. You went there, of course? Yes, sir. Well? Well, when I got to that address, it was a, a manufactory of artificial kneecaps. And no one had ever heard of the Red-Headed League. So then you came straight to me? Yes, sir. I, I thought it best not to lose any time. Quite right. By the way, Mr. Wilson, this assistant of yours, Mr. Vincent Spaulding, how long had he been with you when he called your attention to the Red-Headed League? Oh, uh, about a month. How did he come? Uh, in answer to an advertisement. Was he the only applicant? No, sir. Oh, I, I had a dozen. Why did you pick him? Well, because he was any, and, and would come cheap. At half wages, in fact. Hmm. What's he like? Uh, small, stout built, uh, very quick in his ways. No air on his face, though he's not short of 30. Uh, and he has a, a white splash of acid on his forehead. Hmm. I thought as much. Have you ever noticed that his ears are pierced for earrings? What? Oh, yes. He says the gypsy did it for him when he was a lad. Watson, what day of the week is it? Why, uh, Saturday, of course. Saturday, dear me, so it is. Well, Mr. Wilson, I think I may promise you some startling developments by tonight. In the meantime, Watson, I suggest we drop around sometime this afternoon to view the attractions of saxe coburg Square. Mr. Wilson's exemplary assistant in particular. seems to be Saxe-Coburg Square. Hmm. Shabby, genteel little backwater of a place. This, I fancy, is our friend's shop. The four-story building with the three gilt balls over it. Yes, the square itself seems fairly uninteresting, eh? Yes, very depressing. Let's see what street backs onto it on this side. Come along, Watson. Uh. I can't see what difference the next street can make to our problem, if it is a problem. Well, the whole thing sounds more like a practical joke to me. A practical joke which costs its perpetrator four pounds a week? Nonsense, Watson. No man's sense of humor resides in his pocketbook. Well, this street seems to have more life. It's one of the chief arteries leading to the north and west. Now, let me see. What's the order of the houses here? Order? Yes, it's a hobby of mine to have an exact knowledge of London. First, we have Mortimer's. Then the tobacconist, a little newspaper shop, the Coburg branch of the city and suburban bank, the vegetarian restaurant, and McFarlane's carriage works. Yes, now we can go back to the shop of our friend, Mr. Wilson. Oh, what's the hurry, Holmes? Don't walk so fast. I'll find out all I want to here. Oh, Miss Max, as if you were taking a memory course. Why should you want to know all the shops on that street? It's just a waste of time. Nothing that exercises the brain is a waste of time, my dear Watson. The trouble with most of us is that our brains have become flabby from lack of proper use. You rubbish. Well, here they are, back again. Why are you thumping on the pavement with your cane, Holmes? If you want to enter the shop, why not knock on the door? Yes, quite so, Watson. I'm afraid my etiquette is a bit faulty lately, so just to please you, I will knock on the door. I see. Someone's coming on the double. Looks like our practical assistant. Oh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Won't you step in? Thank you. No, I only wish to ask you how to go from here to the Strand. Uh, third right, fourth left. Smart fellow that, eh, Watson? Oh, I see no signs of a colossal intelligence. Nevertheless, he is, in my judgment, the fourth smartest mind in London. As for daring, I'm not sure that he's not the third. Mm, I see nothing so startling about him. The knees of his trousers, Watson. Didn't you notice? Well, what about them? Most enlightening, my dear Watson. Most enlightening. Oh, this is so much bolder, Dash. I just about had enough of it. I'm going to have myself a, a cup of coffee and some cake. There's an appetizing little big shop across the way. Very good, Watson. Suppose you meet me back here at ten tonight. Sharp, mind you. And 
kindly put your arm a revolver in your pocket. Oh. This business is serious. More serious even than I expected. <laughs> I say, Holmes, it's ten o'clock now. How long do we have to stand here in this confounded rain? I'm soaked to the skin. Until the other member of our party turns up, Watson. Oh. Ah, here comes the cab. Yes, I think he'll be in it. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Merriweather. Look here, Holmes. Why do you have to route me out on a night like this? Saturday night, too. I shall miss my rubber whist. It's the first Saturday night for seven and twenty years I've not had my whist. My dear Meriwether, I think you'll find that tonight you're playing for higher stakes than even you are accustomed to. And I can promise the play will be more exciting. Oh, indeed. But come, we must hurry. Oh, I beg your pardon. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Yes, I do, sir. This way, gentlemen. But to where are we going? Mr. Wilson's shop is here on the square. Stop burbling, Watson. Follow me and don't waste time. In your message to me, Holmes, you said something about John Clay, the murderer, thief, smasher, and forger. John Clay? Who is he? My dear Watson, John Clay is one of our most colorful and dangerous criminals. A young man, but at the head of his uh, profession. I'd rather have my bracelets on him than on any criminal in London. And I'd heard that his grandfather was a duke. And he himself had been educated in Oxford and Eton. Yes, he'll crack a crib in Scotland Yard one week and be raising money to build an orphanage in Cornwall the next. We've been on his track for years, Mr. Holmes, and have never set eyes on him. Well, I trust I may have the pleasure of introducing you tonight. Here we are. Down this narrow passageway. You better let me go first. And look here, Holmes, I... I don't like the looks of this at all. This passage goes underground. Gives me the creeps. Oh, I say, I've run into something. In the wall, I fancy. I forgot to warn you. There's a turn here to the right. Yes, I found that out. Thanks so much. Ah, here's the door. Just a moment till I light my dark lantern. Now, Mr. Merriweather, if you'll unlock the door for us. Uh, just a moment, till I find my key. Mm. Here we are. Better let me go first, sir, in case we're too late. Yes. The coast seems clear enough. Come along, both of you. Holmes, I don't like the look of this place. The lantern throws such weird shadows. It smells like a vault. It is a vault, my dear Watson. It's the basement of the city and suburban bank, to be exact, of which our friend, Mr. Merriweather, here is president. But what are all those wooden crates doing here? They explain why the most daring criminal in London is taking such an interest in this particular place. Uh, yes, Dr. Watson. These crates contain our French gold. French gold? Quite. You see, we had occasion some months ago to borrow 30,000 Napoleons from France. France? Of all things, most of which has never been unpacked. Rather an inducement for anything. No, oh, dear, dear Mr. Holmes, I think you rather unduly excited. After all, the building is guarded by ten burly watchmen. Yes, I dare say you're not particularly vulnerable from above. Nor from below, Mr. Holmes. Nothing but solid earth below these flagstones. Listen to this. Don't do that, Mr. Do you want to ruin all our plans? But look here, I see. It did sound hollow. Not so loud, please. Now then, I think we'd better take up our positions. You, Merriweather, behind those large boxes in the corner. Watson and I will hide behind this crate. I hope you appreciate the honor, my dear Watson. This crate contains no less than 2,000 golden Napoleons neatly packed in tin for them. Good heavens. You ready? We must put the screen over my dark lantern. And sit here in the dark? Certainly. Oh, dear. And I brought a deck of cards with me. I thought we might have time for a three-handed rubber. Not tonight, Mr. Merriweather. We're dealing with a dangerous man. And unless we can take him at a disadvantage, he may do us considerable harm. One thing more. When I flash my light, Watson, close in swiftly. And if he reaches for his gun, shoot. Shoot to kill. Oh, dear me. 
I wish I'd stayed at home. Quiet. I'm going to cover the light. Mr. Wilson's assistant. Spalding rubbish. This is John Clay, one of the most dangerous criminals in London. I've been after him for years. Help me search you, Watson. Oh, no, look out, Holmes. He's coming, too. Oh, take your filthy hands off me, you scarecrow. Here, yeah, now, none of that. You, you may not be aware that I have royal blood in my veins. When you address me, have the goodness to say, sir, and please. Oh, very well. Would you please, sir, march yourself upstairs, sir? where we can hand you over to the policemen who are anxiously awaiting your highness's arrival. And look about it. Better have another spot of whiskey, Watson. Oh, thanks. Oh, it is good to get onto dry toes again after sitting around in that cold cellar for hours. Not so much, Holmes. Do you want to drown me? <laughs> God bless you, my dear fellow. Oh. Uh, thank you. I say, Holmes, when uh, when did you first begin to suspect that, that fellow Spalding? I, I, I mean, Clay. When Wilson told me he was anxious to work for half price. Always suspect anyone or anything that comes too cheap. There's sure to be a motive behind it. Yes, but uh, how did you guess what the motive was? In this case, I mean... I suspected his fondness for photography and his trick of vanishing into the cellar. The cellar. There was the end of this tangled clue. And why was someone so anxious to have our friend Mr. Wilson kept out of his shop for several hours every day? Activities in the cellar again. By the way, that red-headed league hoax is one of the cleverest dodges I've come across in some time. Too clever, in fact. When I heard of it, I knew there was only one man who could have originated it. John Clay. We've had our skirmishes. This is the first time we've come face to face. So you went around to have a look at the shop? At his trousers, Watson. At the knees of his trousers, to be exact. Oh? You saw how worn and wrinkled they were. They spoke of hours of burrowing. Burrowing in the cellar. But what for? By tapping on the pavement, I found that the tunnel did not stretch out to the front. Where then? We strolled round the corner, you remember. And there stood the city and suburban bank, abutting our friend's pawn shop. Of course, yes. The influence was clear. Yes, but uh, how did you guess that he would make his attempt tonight? Perfectly simple, Watson. Perfectly simple. The offices of the Red-Headed League closed this morning. Mr. Wilson's absence was no longer necessary. The tunnel was completed. But it was essential that Mr. Clay should use it soon, or it might be discovered. Tonight being Saturday would be ideal, as it would give him two days for escape. Q.E.D. <laughs> there you are. Your reasoning is perfect. It's a long chain, and yet every link rings true. That saves me from ennui. These little problems help me to escape the commonplaces of existence. Yes, after all, l'homme c'est rien, l'oeuvre c'est tout. As Flaubert once wrote to George Sand, man is nothing. His work is everything. <laughs> Fascinating story, Dr. Watson. 
What a thrilling time you must have had during the days you lived with Sherlock Holmes. Mm. <laughs> I can't say I was ever bored. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley. Sherlock Holmes solves his problems with simple logic, and that's the kind of thinking behind Clipper Craft Clothes. This was the problem. How to make it possible for independent local stores to sell fine clothes for less money than ordinary clothes cost elsewhere? And here's the answer. 924 leading stores from coast to coast concentrated their buying power to bring you the most remarkable values you've ever seen. Clipper Craft suits are only 35 and $40, with a few special numbers at $43.75. Top coats and overcoats are only 30 to $40, and sport jackets but $24. Selling beautifully tailored, expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clipper Craft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clipper Craft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clipper Craft store in your The makers of Clipper Craft clothes for men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Now, once more, we are about to visit Dr. Watson, the friend and chronicler of Sherlock Holmes and his amazing adventures. We find him sitting in his well-worn armchair, an eager look on his face and a humorous twinkle in his eye. Can it be that the good doctor is beginning to look forward to his weekly appearances before the microphone? Good evening, Mr. Harris. <laughs> it certainly can. And tonight I have my narrative all picked out. Have you ever noticed that red-headed people always seem to lead very eventful lives? Uh, look at Queen Elizabeth. Yes, and I've heard that Cleopatra was a break top, too, and she certainly had very few dull moments. And the stores that sell Clipper Craft clothes have no dull moments either. That's because millions of men have discovered that Clipper Craft gives them value beyond compare. Behind these unheard of Clipper Craft values, is a triumph of American ingenuity and a really tremendous distribution idea. 924 leading stores from coast to coast have concentrated their buying power, resulting in value without precedent because of the savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. What you get is the benefit of group buying with all the friendly personal attention traditionally yours at your own local independent store. You've never seen expensive-looking suits like Clipper Crafts at only $35 and $40, with a few deluxe models at $43.75. The same goes for top coats and overcoats at only $30 to $40, and sport jackets at only $24. Yes, your clothes problem is easily solved this fall. Simply compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. Now, Dr. Watson, shall we get back to our story? Yes, indeed. Well, tonight I have decided to tell you the story of the Red-Headed League. The Red-Headed League? What a curious title. <laughs> no more curious than the situation it gave rise to in Sherlock Holmes' life. One day, it was during the autumn of the year 1890, I burst in upon my friend to find him deep in conversation with a stout, florid-faced gentleman with the fiercest red hair it has ever been my privilege to observe. 
I was about to withdraw when Holmes pulled me abruptly into the room and closed the door behind me. Come in, my dear Watson, come in. You couldn't possibly have come at a better time. But, Holmes, I was afraid you were engaged. So I am, my dear fellow. Allow me, Mr. Wilson, this is my friend and helper, Dr. Watson. Well, how do you do, sir? Oh, how do you do? Sit down, Watson, sit down. I know that you share my love of the bizarre, although you've never agreed that for the strangest effects and most extraordinary combinations, we must go to life itself. Well, you know, I... Mr. Have... Jabez Wilson here has just started a narrative which promises to be one of the most singular I've listened to for some time. Dear me. Now, my dear Mr. Wilson, perhaps you would have the great kindness to recommence your story. Uh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. As soon as I can find that newspaper clipping, I would, I'd put it in my... Oh, I could have sworn it was in my waistcoat. Watson, while we're waiting for Mr. Wilson to find his missing newspaper advertisement, suppose you tell me what you deduce from his appearance. Well, really, you know. Uh, well, let me see. Uh, I would say he was uh, middle-aged, if you don't mind my saying, and... Uh, well, he has red hair. Oh, obvious, Watson. Too obvious. I will come to your assistance. He has at some time done manual labor. He's a Freemason, has been in China, and has done a considerable amount of writing lately. Well, Mr. Holmes, you fair give me the creeps. Are, are you one of these mind readers? No, indeed. Then how in the name of good fortune did you know all that about me? About the manual labor, for example. It's as true as gospel. I began as a ship's carpenter. Your hands, my dear sir. Your right hand is quite a size larger than your left. The muscles are more developed. As for the Freemasonry, you wear a square and compass type in. Oh, I see that. But, but the writing, how about that? What else can be indicated by that right cuff, so very shiny, and the left sleeve with a smooth patch near the elbow where you rest it on the desk? Well, uh, 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 about China. The fish that you've had tattooed immediately above your right wrist could only have been done in China. That trick of staining the fish's scales a delicate pink is quite peculiar to China. And when, in addition, I see a Chinese coin hanging from your watch chain, the matter becomes even more simple. <laughs> well, well, I never. At first, I thought you'd done something clever. But now I see there's nothing to it after all. Mm, I begin to think, Watson, that I make a mistake in explaining. Omni ignotum pro magnifico, you know. Oh, yes, yes, of course. What reputation I may have will suffer shipwreck if I'm so candid. Have you found the advertisement, Mr. Wilson? Uh, yes, I've got it now. It was, it was in my watch pocket. This is what began it all, sir. You just read it for yourself. Watson, suppose you do that for us. Yes, with pleasure. First, make a note of the paper and the date. It's the Morning Chronicle of July the 27th, 1890. It was just two months ago. Very well. Proceed with the advertisement. It begins to the Red-Headed League. On account of the bequest of the late Ezekiah Hopkins, there is now another vacancy open which entitles a member of the League to a salary of four pounds a week for purely nominal services. All red-headed men above the age of 21 years are eligible. Well, that's very odd. Apply in person on Monday at 11 o'clock to Duncan Ross at the offices of the League, 7 Pope's Court, Fleet Street. Dear me, Holmes, what on earth does this mean? I think I promised you that this case was bizarre. Now, Mr. Wilson, if you'll continue with your story. Well, it's just about as I was telling you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, I have a small pawnbroker's shop at Coburg Square. Of late years, the business has been pretty bad. I used to be able to keep two assistants, but now I only keep one. I'd have a job to pay him, only he's willing to come for half wages so as to learn the business. Obliging youth. What's his name? Uh, Vincent Spaulding. And I couldn't want a smarter assistant, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I know he could easily earn twice what I'm able to give him. But, well, as I say, if he's satisfied, who am I to go putting ideas into his head? Yeah. Your assistant seems to be as remarkable as your advertisement. He only has one fault, Mr. Holmes. Photography. Snapping away with his camera, then diving down into the cellar like a rabbit into its hole to develop his pictures. An amateur photographer, eh? He's still with you, I suppose. Oh, yes, sir. An observing young fellow he is. He was the one that brought this advertisement to my notice. It was just this day, eight weeks, when he rapped on my office door with this very paper in his hand. Uh, come in, come in. Oh, Mr. Wilson, sir. Oh, that's you, Vincent. Well, what's the matter? You look excited. Well, I wish to the Lord, Mr. Wilson, I was a red-headed man. Why that? Well, look here, sir. What it says in this paper. 
There's another vacancy in the League of the Red-Headed Men. It's worth a pretty penny to him that gets it. The Red-Headed League? I never heard of it. Never heard of the League of the Red-Headed Men? Oh, Mr. Wilson. A new eligible for one of the vacancies. <laughs> huh? Well, what are they worth? Oh, merely a couple of hundred a year. But the work is slight and it needn't interfere much with one's regular occupation. Yeah, a couple of hundred uh, pounds a year, you say? Here, let me see that paper, young man. Oh, here you are, sir. You see, as far as I can make out, the league was started by a millionaire named Ezekiah Hopkins, a red-headed man himself. And he left his fortune in the hands of the trustees with instructions to provide easy berths to men who had red hair. And from what I hear, the work isn't difficult. Yeah, but there must be millions of red-headed men. Oh, not so many as you might think, sir. You see, it's uh, it's confined to Londoners. Oh. And then again, it, it's no use if your hair is uh, light red or dark red or anything but real blazing fire red. They've got to pick the reddest hair they can find. Well, if there's a redder head of hair than mine in the length and breadth of London, I'd like to see it. Well, I, uh, I have seen a few that I consider redder. What? Nonsense. Here, where's my hat? Well, uh, what are you going to do, Mr. Wilson? I'm going around to apply for that vacancy. If it was raining gold, no one can say that Jabez Wilson is a man to go out with a sieve. And did you get the job, Mr. Wilson? I did that, Mr. Holmes. There wasn't a head of air that can touch mine for redness, if I do say it myself. <laughs> There were thousands competing. And what was the work? Well, purely nominal, like the paper said. And it paid four pounds a week, regular as a clock. All, all I had to do was to sit at a desk in an office at that address there from ten to two and copy out bits from the encyclopedia. Hmm. Educational as well as remunerative. And how long did this work continue? Oh, about eight weeks. I was pretty well through the A's. Abbots, archery, architecture and the like. Then suddenly it came to an end. I went to my work, ten o'clock as usual. The door was shut and locked and a card was nailed on the door. What did it say? The Red-Headed League dissolved September 27th, 1890. But I say, oh, that's today. This very morning it was, sir. Well, I, I lost no time trying to find the man that hired me. Uh, four pounds a week's four pounds, you know. You say you tried to find the man that rented the office? Yes, sir. I inquired from the renting agent, and he gave me the man's name and said that he'd moved to a new address. You went there, of course? Yes, sir. Well? Well, when I got to that address, it was a, a manufactory of artificial kneecaps. And no one had ever heard of the Red-Headed League. So then you came straight to me? Yes, sir. I, I thought it best not to lose any time. Quite right. By the way, Mr. Wilson, this assistant of yours, Mr. Vincent Spaulding, how long had he been with you when he called your attention to the Red-Headed League? Oh, uh, about a month. How did he come? In answer to an advertisement. Was he the only applicant? No, sir. Oh, I, I had a dozen. Why did you pick him? Because he was any, and, and would come cheap. At half wages, in fact. Hmm. What's he like? Uh, small, stout built, uh, very quick in his ways. No hair on his face, though he's not short of 30. Uh, and he has a, a white splash of acid on his forehead. Hmm, I thought as much. Have you ever noticed that his ears are pierced for earrings? What? Why, oh, yes. He says a gypsy did it for him when he was a lad. Watson, what day of the week is it? Why, well, Saturday, of course. Saturday, dear me, so it is. Well, Mr. Wilson, I think I may promise you some startling developments by tonight. In the meantime, Watson, I suggest we drop around sometime this afternoon to view the attractions of Saxe Coburg Square. Mr. Wilson's exemplary assistant in particular. <laughs> Seems to be saxe Coburg Square. Hmm. Shabby, genteel little backwater of a place. This, I fancy, is our friend's shop. The four-story building with the three gilt balls over it. Yes, the square itself seems fairly uninteresting, eh? Yes, very depressing. Let's see what street backs onto it on this side. Come along, Watson. Well, uh... Can't see what difference the next street can make to our problem, if it is a problem. 
Well, the whole thing sounds more like a practical joke to me. A practical joke which costs its perpetrator four pounds a week? Nonsense, Watson. No man's sense of humor resides in his pocketbook. Well, this street seems to have more life. It's one of the chief arteries leading to the north and west. Now, let me see. What's the order of the houses here? Order? Yes, it's a hobby of mine to have an exact knowledge of London. First, we have Mortimer's. Then the tobacconist, the little newspaper shop, the Coburg branch of the city and suburban bank, the vegetarian restaurant, and McFarlane's carriage works. Yes, now we can go back to the shop of our friend, Mr. Wilson. Oh, what's the hurry, Holmes? Don't walk so fast. Found out all I want to here. Holmes, you act as if you were taking a memory course. Why should you want to know all the shops on that street? It's just a waste of time. Nothing that exercises the brain is a waste of time, my dear Watson. The trouble with most of us is that our brains have become flabby from lack of proper use. Rubbish. Well, here they are, back again. Why are you thumping on the pavement with your cane, Holmes? If you want to enter the shop, why not knock on the door? Yes, quite so, Watson. I'm afraid my etiquette is a bit faulty lately, so just to please you, I will knock on the door. I see. Someone's coming on the double. Looks like our practical assistant. Oh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, won't you step in? Thank you, no. I only wish to ask you how to go from here to the Strand. Uh, third right, fourth left. Smart fellow that, eh, Watson? Oh, I see no signs of a colossal intelligence. Nevertheless, he is, in my judgment, the fourth smartest mind in London. As for daring, I'm not sure that he's not the third. Oh, I see nothing so startling about him. The knees of his trousers, Watson. Didn't you notice? No, oh, what about them? Most enlightening, my dear Watson. Most enlightening. Oh, all this is so much balderdash. I just about had enough of it. I'm going to have myself a, a cup of coffee and some cake. There's an appetizing little big shop across the way. Very good, Watson. Suppose you meet me back here at ten tonight. Sharp, mind you. And kindly put your army revolver in your pocket. Oh. This business is serious. More serious even than I expected. <laughs> Say, Holmes, it's ten o'clock now. How long do we have to stand here in this confounded rain? I'm soaked to the skin. Until the other member of our party turns up, Watson. Oh. Ah, here comes the cab. Yes, I think he'll be in it. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Merriweather. Look here, Holmes. Why do you have to rout me out on a night like this? Saturday night, too. I shall miss my rubber of whist. It's the first Saturday night for seven and twenty years I've not had my whist. My dear Merriweather, I think you'll find that tonight you're playing for higher stakes than even you are accustomed to. And I can promise the play will be more exciting. Oh, indeed. But come, we must hurry. Yes, sir. Oh, I beg your pardon. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Oh, how, how do you do, do, sir? This way, gentlemen. But where are we going? Mr. Wilson's shop is here on the square. Stop burbling, Watson. Follow me and don't waste time. In your message to me, Holmes, you said something about John Clay, the murderer, thief, smasher, and forger. John Clay? Who is he? My dear Watson, John Clay is one of our most colorful and dangerous criminals. A young man, but at the head of his uh, profession. I'd rather have my bracelets on him than on any criminal in London. And I've heard that his grandfather was a duke, and he himself had been educated in Oxford and Eton. Yes, he'll crack a crib in Scotland Yard one week and be raising money to build an orphanage in Cornwall the next. We've been on his track for years, Mr. Holmes, and have never set eyes on him. Well, I trust I may have the pleasure of introducing you tonight. Here we are. Down this narrow passageway. You better let me go first. Look here, Holmes. I, I don't like the looks of this at all. This passage goes underground. Gives me the creeps. <laughs> I say, I've run into something. The wall, I fancy. I forgot to warn you. There's a turn here to the right. Yes, I found that out. Thanks so much. 
Ah, here's the door. Just a moment till I light my dark lantern. There. Now, Mr. Medeweather, if you'll unlock the door for us. Uh, just a moment till I find my key. Uh, here we are. Better let me go first, sir, in case we're too late. Yes. The coast seems clear enough. Come along, both of you. Holmes, I don't like the look of this place. Your lantern throws such weird shadows. It smells like a vault. It is a vault, my dear Watson. The basement of the city and suburban bank, to be exact, of which our friend Mr. Merriweather here is president. But what are all those wooden crates doing here? They explain why the most daring criminal in London is taking such an interest in this particular place. Uh, yes, Dr. Watson. These crates contain our French gold. French gold? Quite. You see, we had occasion some months ago to borrow 30,000 Napoleons from France. France? Of all things. Most of which has never been unpacked. Rather an inducement for any thief. Oh, really, Mr. Holmes, I think you're rather unduly excited. Now, after all, the building is guarded by ten burly watchmen. Yes, I dare say you're not particularly vulnerable from above. Or from below, Mr. Holmes. Nothing but solid earth below these flagstones. Listen to this. Don't do that, Mr. Bellewinner. You want to ruin all our plans? But, but look here, I say, it did sound hollow. Not so loud, please. Now then, I think we'd better take up our positions. You, Merriweather, behind those large boxes in the corner. Yes. Watson and I will hide behind this crate. I hope you appreciate the honor, my dear Watson. This crate contains no less than 2,000 golden Napoleons, neatly packed in tinfoil. Good heavens. Are you ready? We must put the screen over my dark lantern. And sit here in the dark? Certainly. Oh, dear. And I brought a deck of cards with me. I thought we might have time for a three-handed rubber. Not tonight, Mr. Merriweather. We're dealing with a dangerous man. And unless we can take him at a disadvantage, he may do us considerable harm. One thing more. When I flash my light, Watson, yeah. close in swiftly. And if he reaches for his gun, shoot. And shoot to kill. Oh, dear me. I wish I'd stayed at home. Quiet. I'm going to cover the light. through the opening. Righto. Quick, Watson! Look out, he's got a knife! Take your hands off me! No, you don't! You... Oh, if I can get my hand from him. Oh. Why, well done, Holmes, well done. You, why, you've knocked him out. Good. Drag him up here. Now, Mr. Merriweather, if you'll give us some light. Of course, of course. That's better. But I say, Holmes, it... Is that Vincent Spaulding chap, Mr. Wilson's assistant? Spaulding rubbish. This is John Clay, one of the most dangerous criminals in London. I've been after him for years. Help me search him, Watson. Well, look out, Holmes. He's coming too. Take your filthy hands off me, you scarecrow. Yeah, no, none of that. You, you may not be aware that I have royal blood in my veins. When you address me, have the goodness to say, sir, and please. Oh, very well. Would you please, sir, march yourself upstairs, sir? where we can hand you over to the policemen who are anxiously awaiting your highness's arrival. And be quick about it. Sherlock Holmes solves his problems with simple logic. And that's the kind of thinking behind clipper craft clothes. This was the problem. How to make it possible for independent local stores to sell fine clothes 
for less money than ordinary clothes cost elsewhere? And here's the answer. 924 leading stores from coast to coast concentrated their buying power to bring you the most remarkable values you've ever seen. Now bear in mind, you get all this at your own favorite local institution, at the store you can really trust. The result is that Clippercraft has maintained its low prices despite the fact that practically everything these days costs more. It's an understatement to say these values are sensational. Clippercraft suits are only 35 and $40, with a few special numbers at $43.75. Top coats and overcoats are only 30 to $40, and sport jackets but $24. Selling beautifully tailored, expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clippercraft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. spot of whiskey, Watson. Oh, thanks. Mm, feels good to get onto dry clothes again after sitting around in that cold cellar for hours. Not so much, Holmes. Do you want to drown me? <laughs> God bless you, my dear fellow. Oh. Oh, thank you. I say, Holmes, when, uh, when did you first begin to suspect that, that fellow Spaulding? I, I, I mean, Clay. When Wilson told me he was anxious to work for half price. Always suspect anyone or anything that comes too cheap. There's sure to be a motive behind it. But, but uh, how did you guess what the motive was? In this case, I mean. I suspected his fondness for photography and his trick of vanishing into the cellar. The cellar. There was the end of this tangled clue. And why was someone so anxious to have our friend Mr. Wilson kept out of his shop for several hours every day? Activities in the cellar again. By the way, that red-headed league hoax is one of the cleverest dodges I've come across in some time. Too clever, in fact. When I heard of it, I knew there was only one man who could have originated it. John Clay. We've had our skirmishes, but this is the first time we've come face to face. So you went around to have a look at the shop? At his trousers, Watson. At the knees of his trousers, to be exact. Oh? Uh? You saw how worn and wrinkled they were. They spoke of hours of burrowing. Burrowing in the cellar. But what for? By tapping on the pavement, I found that the tunnel did not stretch out to the front. Where, then? We strolled round the corner, you remember, and there stood the city and suburban bank abutting our friend's pawn shop. Of course, yes. The influence was clear. Yes, but uh, how did you guess that he would make his attempt tonight? Perfectly simple, Watson, perfectly simple. The offices of the Red-Headed League closed this morning. Mr. Wilson's absence was no longer necessary. The tunnel was completed. But it was essential that Mr. Clay should use it soon, or it might be discovered. Tonight being Saturday would be ideal, as it would give him two days for escape. Q.E.D. And there you are. Your reasoning is perfect. A long chain, and yet every link rings true. It saves me from ennui. These little problems help me to escape the commonplaces of existence. Yes, after all, l'homme c'est rien, l'oeuvre c'est tout. As Flaubert once wrote to George Sand... Man is nothing. His work is everything. A fascinating story, Dr. Watson. What a thrilling time you must have had during the days you lived with Sherlock Holmes. Mm. <laughs> well, I, I can't say I was ever bored. And now, Dr. Watson, how about a hint about next week's story? Oh, uh, next week's story is laid in that colorful, dangerous, and decidedly mysterious section of London known as Limehouse. It tells how Holmes, by investigating a corrupt councilman and the activities of a large tropical bird, laid bare one of the largest dope-running outfits in the history of the Port of London. I call it the Affair of the Politician, the Lighthouse, and the Trained Cormorant.
the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men, and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the affair of the politician, the lighthouse, and the train cormorant. If you wish to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. Cy Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. And now for our weekly visit to the familiar firelit study of our old friend, Dr. Watson. We open the door and find the good doctor on his hands and knees rummaging through a travel-worn and battered tin dispatch box. Great Caesar's ghost, don't tell me that's the one, the famous box containing the records of Sherlock Holmes' unpublished cases. It is indeed, Mr. Harris, it is indeed. But I thought that was supposed to be kept deep in the vaults of the bank of Cox and Company of Sharon Cross. Oh, not during the war, it wasn't, thank heaven. The bank was hit twice, you may remember. Yes, at the very beginning of the late unpleasantness, the government evacuated this box, along with several other notable British documents, such as certain Shakespeare folios, to a safe place in the country. Oh, I see. And they've just been returned to you now? Why the delay, Doctor? Would you believe it? They told me these papers were too valuable to be in private ownership. They claim they belong in the British Museum. I told them they could put these records in the British Museum when Holmes is safely buried in Westminster Abbey. A great many years from now, let's hope. Amen. Hmm, well, now, yes, I've, uh, I've been going over these files to see if I couldn't find our subject for tonight's story. Yes, I, I think I can do no better than relate this one. The one to which Holmes invariably referred as the affair of the politician, the lighthouse, and the trained cormorant. And, but... Good heavens, where are my manners? Here you are, panting to say a few well-chosen words on behalf of those very generous gentlemen, our sponsors. Go ahead, Mr. Harris, go ahead. With pleasure, Dr. Watson. And my story today is very simple, but very important. It's a tale of the greatest values in clothes the American public has ever seen. Values that have rhyme and reason behind them, that are the result of a carefully laid-out plan. Manufacturing ingenuity and a really great distribution idea make it possible for you to buy superlatively fine clipper craft clothes at astonishingly low prices. Yes, and right in your own local independent store where friendly attention is traditionally yours. Through the clipper craft plan, 924 leading stores across America have concentrated their buying power, bringing you tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. Take a look at Clippercraft's expensive-looking suits at only $35 and $40, with a few deluxe models at $43.75. And Clippercraft top coats and overcoats, too, at only $30 to $40. And sport jackets at only $24.
You don't have to be a Sherlock Holmes to solve your clothes problem this fall. Simply compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now to get back to the politician, the lighthouse, and the trained cormorant. Uh, what exactly is a cormorant, Dr. Watson? The uh, largest bird, Mr. Harris, that is inordinately fond of fish, which it dives into the water to catch. The word cormorant is a French derivation. Cor meaning raven and marin meaning marine. Oh, yes, the raven of the sea. Sounds vaguely sinister, Dr. Watson. It was, Mr. Harris, it was indeed. This particular cormorant, whose name was Tika, was directly responsible for the death of the disreputable old baggage who... Uh, but, oh, there I go, getting ahead of myself again. Uh, to begin at the beginning, it was a cold, wet November night. A Saturday night, to be exact. Holmes, overcome with the restless energy which sometimes burned inside him like a seething volcano, had insisted on a visit to the Port of London, the Chinese section of it that is so often referred to in tones of awe and terror as Limehouse. We had uh, just turned off West India Dock Road. Against the sky rose Limehouse Church, the one thing of beauty in a sordid landscape. Yellow and brown men patted by on slippered feet. Strange voices, whispering in strange tongues, crept out of dark corners. The air was heavy with the stench of beetle nuts, shandu and fried fish. A clinging mist crept in off the river. In the channel... A foghorn wailed like a lost soul. Holmes, what's the point of all this meandering? First up one dilapidated alley, then down the next. I'm frozen to the bone. Let's get home before someone slits our throats from behind. Nice trick if it can be done, Watson. No, a stab in the back, or perhaps a bit of thuggy with a fine silken cord would be more in keeping with this neighborhood. What's the good of all this prowling about? But, Watson, we promised Mrs. Hudson we'd bring her some tea, some suey sen, in little two-ounce packets at sevenpence each. A shy little tea to fill the hour of four to five with delicate scents and dreams. The slop she's been giving us lately is enough to rot the lining of one's stomach. Well, then, let's buy the stuff and go home. That is, if you can remember where the shop is. It's just across the crazy bridge up ahead there that leads to the Isle of Dogs. A small spice shop run by my good friend Sam Ling Lee. Well, then, let's go there and get it over with. Impatience, Watson, is the curse of our Western civilization. Always in a hurry. Never taking time to taste, to savor, really to observe life. Oh, what is there worth observing in this godforsaken district, I'd like to know? <coughs> Quick, Watson, doesn't duck into this doorway. That man was chasing her with a stiletto. After them, down the next alley. Too late, Watson. Great Scott Holmes. Aren't you going to do something? What is there to do, Watson? A poor, tortured soul. She's better off dead. Holmes, you are a cold-blooded fish. At least we could try to catch the man who stabbed her. That is a job for the official police. We must leave something for them to do, you know. Incidents like this occur every day in Limehouse. No, the individual I'd like to bring to justice is the real murderer in this and a hundred other cases. Who's that? The purveyor of little white packages like the one that poor frantic derelict clutched so tightly in her hand. The chief of the outfit which peddles death and decay in the form of exotic dreams. You know who he is? Naturally. The annoying part of the situation is that I've been completely unable to persuade any of his victims to testify against him. They're all so tragically dependent on him for his filthy wares. Oh, but enough of that. What have you just witnessed is commonplace. But here comes something I think you'll admit is rather unusual, even in Limehouse. Yes, what do you mean? Look there across the street, Watson. Ever see a man take a bird for a walk? It's Paru, the crippled Lasker, taking Tika for his nightly outing. They're coming down the steps of the house across the way. They're crossing the street. That's a curious-looking bird. It waddles like a duck. But its beak is different. His neck is almost as long as a swan's. That, Watson, is a cormorant, a very intelligent biped. In many tropical countries, the natives train them to catch fish. 
Do not fear, my beautiful Tika. The men will not harm you. Paru will protect his Tika. Careful. Here the stones are sharp. Well, I'll be... Undoubtedly, Watson. Paru couldn't be more attached to Tika if he were his own son. But, uh, did you see the bird's eyes? They shone yellow in the light of the street lamp like a cat's. Yes, many of the natives hereabouts are afraid of the bird. They say he has the evil eye. Perhaps that's why Peru and Tika are considered star boarders at the lighthouse across the way. The lighthouse? It's the name of the most notorious lodging house in all of Limehouse. Chinese, Laskers, and East Indians sleep there, ten and twelve to a room on the bare floors or on mildewed mattresses. Tika and Peru sleep curled up in a closet on the top floor. At least they have privacy. Mm, charming place. Why in heaven's name don't the authorities clean it out? Authority around here, Watson, is Harry Hawkins. Called Handsome Harry by the natives because he's so definitely the opposite. Mr. Hawkins not only owns most of the houses in this area, he's councilman for this district. Yes, but surely it's not good business to let your property go to rack and ruin like that place across the way. The lighthouse, Watson, is run by a vicious old reprobate who's known as Mother Fishface. Partly because she has no teeth and a cold and fishy eye, and partly because she runs a fish house in the kitchen under the steps where she dispenses decayed fish and chips at tuppence a portion to the poor starving wretches who inhabit the rooms upstairs. Mother Fishface is the only one who dares talk back to Mr. Hawkins. She's the only one who dares to be late with her rent. In fact, it's rumored that she has something on the old boy, and he's definitely afraid of her. There's where the body's buried, eh, Holmes? Or how he procures the opium and hashish he undoubtedly deals in. I suspect most of her boarders are smugglers of the vile stuff. Hmm. So we came down here for the purpose of buying tea for Mrs. Hudson, and now we suddenly seem to be interested in a dope-running outfit. Holmes, you don't fool me for a moment. <laughs> Five years' association with Sherlock Holmes seems to have sharpened your powers of observation, my dear Watson. Well, you... Quiet, Watson. Quick, slip behind this wall. Here comes Mr. Hawkins on his weekly collection rounds. Open up here. Saturday night. Rent's due. Here's your money, Mr. Hawkins. Blast you. Charming fellow, Mr. Hawkins. Quiet, Watson. He's about to knock on the kitchen door opposite. Let's see what happens at the lighthouse. Hi, oh, dear mother. It's me, Handsome Mary. Come to pay you a visit. What do you want, you old fool? What would I want, dearie? It's Saturday night. Rent night. You're a week behind now. Suppose that I am. You ain't starving. You can wait, can't you? No, no, old girl. You know I wouldn't press me, old sweetheart. Here, look. I brought you a present. A fine bottle of gin. What's wrong with it? Is it poisoned? No, have your little joke, won't you, dearie? No, I don't think you do a thing like that, Harry. The day they find me murdered... Ah, that's the day you'll wish you'd never been born. Oh, you do run on. If anything was to happen to you, you know it'd break me heart. <laughs> Wouldn't it just? Ah, uh, here comes that cripple and his bleeding bird. It's always sneaking into me door and making away with a fish. Uh, them birds has a weakness for fish. Well, if he don't keep out of my kitchen, it'll be the weakness that finishes him. Hey, you there, Peru. Yes, Madam Fishface. Keep your dirty bird out of my kitchen, and don't you call me Madam. My Tika is not as dirty as your kitchen, and as for your fish, I would not feed it to a swine, much less my beautiful Tika. <coughs> there he goes, sticking his head in the door. Here, get out, you. Stop. Come on. Stop. Do not raise that broom to my Tika. Not raise the broom, is it? Listen to me, you slimy heathen. That bird comes into my kitchen once more and I'll wring his bleeding neck. You listen to me, Madam Fishface, and listen well. You touch one feather of Tika's beautiful neck and I will... Kill you. I will kill you dead. Then I wish enough. 
I'll have no one threatening Mother Fishface. You heard what he said. You heard him. There. Out he goes, out of my house. Let him sleep in the streets. Let him sleep in the, in the gutter with his dirty bird. No, 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 Mother. Don't you get your dandered up. Go on in and drink your bottle. That's a good girl. It's Saturday night, remember? You've got a little spree coming to you. I know what I'm doing. No one has to tell me. Come, Tika. We do not enter her filthy premises again. We go sleep in the churchyard. It is warmer than Madam Fish Face's heart. Well, that little commotion seems to have resolved itself, eh, Mr. Holmes? I wonder. At any rate, the fog's lifted a bit. We'd better get around to Sam Lee's place before he shuts up his shop. I could do with a dish of hot tea. A dish? <laughs> It'd take a gallon to warm me up. Well, come along, then. It's no good loitering at Mother Fishface's door any longer, Mr. Hawkins. I fancy she and her bottle are locked in for the weekend. Oh, and break. Oh, it's you. And what is the eminent Mr. Sherlock Holmes snooping around here for, eh? Snooping? My dear Mr. Hawkins, you underrate me. Dr. Watson and I were merely enjoying the local colour. You have such lurid local colour in this district, haven't you? Delicious. A true Lapsang Sushang. Smoky, with a suggestion of a true tarred rope flavor. Mm, not bad. Could do with a spot of rum in it, though. Typically British reaction, Watson. The Englishman's always insulting his palate and desecrating his tea with surpluses. Cream, milk, rum, even nasty little pieces of lemon. At any rate, the libation served its purpose. It's thawed you out. Oh, I've drunk so much tea, I'm awash. My back teeth are practically floating. Never mind, you look less blue around the gills. Oh, I wish you wouldn't use that expression, Holmes. It brings back that horrible old woman's face. You see, she, she did look like a fish, you know. A dead fish. Uh, she... Hello. Look out of the window. Here's handsome Harry running down the street. Yes, seems to be headed in this direction. Yes, here he comes. Oh, Mr. Mr. Holmes. Oh, thanks. Thank heavens you're here. And your friend, too. I think you said he was a doctor. Yes, I'm a medical man. What seems to be the trouble, Mr. Hawkins? Uh, you better come right away. She'll be needing you. No mistake. Who'll be needing home? What's happened? It's Mother Fishface. After I'd finished my collections, I went back to tell her about the plumbers coming in on Monday. But the door was locked, and she wouldn't answer. Probably the result of too rapid absorption of the bottle you left behind. Oh, you're right here. Uh, not answering the door wouldn't upset me most times. Only tonight, there's a great smell of gas leaking out around it. Gas? Hurry, Watson. Let's hope we're not too late. Here we are. Two steps down. Careful. Top one's loose. Smell of gas. <clears throat> Very pronounced, eh, Holmes? Quite. Door locked. Shall I... Shall I break it down? Windows quicker. Stand back. I'll use this loose brick. Phew. What a stench. Stale fish and gas. Give it a chance to clear for a moment. I see. There she is, Holmes. You can see her lying there behind the table. But what's that draped across her leg like a snake? It's not a snake, Watson. It's Tika's neck. The bird is doubtless lying beside her, hidden by the body. Tika! Come on, over Tika. the sill we go. Tika! Did someone see Tika? I look everywhere for him. I am asleep on a grave, and Tika sits on the tombstone. When I wake up, he's gone. He's in there, Paru. I'm afraid we've come too late. Tika! My beautiful Tika! She has destroyed him! All right, come in, all of you. I kill her. I slit her throat. Paru, put away that knife. Take the bird outside. Try artificial respiration. Don't waste any time. Watson, you look out for the old woman. My pretty, my beautiful Tika. Yeah, I better turn off this here gas jet on the stove. It's wide open. Don't touch it. But confound it, did you have to do that? Well, you, you, you didn't want to asphyxiate a lot of us, did you? No, but I did want to examine that handle for fingerprints. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, it's, it's no go, Holmes. I can't bring her round. She's turning cold. Yes, gas poisoning. That's what finished her. Unusually florid face. Gas poisoning complicated by cerebral thrombosis brought on by alcohol and high blood pressure. Yes, I noticed the uneven dilation of her pupils. Yes. Poor old dear. One never knows, eh, Mr. Holmes? Who'd have thought the next time I saw her, she'd be lying there like that, cold as a mackerel? But if she wanted to commit suicide, Mr. Hawkins, why was only one gas jet open? Why not turn on the lot, eh, Holmes? I doubt very much if it was suicide, Watson. You, you don't mean it's murder? But the door was locked. No one could have got in. Well, that's right, Mr. Holmes. She never gave no one the key. It, it, it must have been accidental. Or at least it... That's what it was supposed to look like. What brings you to that fascinating conclusion, Mr. Hawkins? It was that bird what did it, mark my words. Time and again he knocked that gas jet open. Always old mother fish face would scream at him and, 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 and shut it off. Only tonight, like as not, she was too drunk to notice. Drunk from the gin you brought her? I always brought her a bottle of gin a Saturday nights. It was that dirty Laska did it. You heard him say he'd kill her. He knew she'd be drunk. And he shoved his bird in here. He did it, knowing he'd turn on the gas, reaching for a fish frying under the stove. Yes, there was a fish on the stove. But it was not frying because there's no frying pan. If there had been, the gas would have been lit and there'd have been no chance for it to escape and fill the room. Yes, there was a fish on the stove, carefully draped across this handle. You'll notice that it's still greasy and smells rather strongly of mackerel. These scratches, I imagine, were caused by the bird's beak as he snatched at the fish thereby pushing the handle and opening the jet. Oh, that's what I said. That dirty heathen pushed his scrawny old bird in here, knowing Mother Fishface was lying helpless drunk with no way of protecting herself. And how did he manage to push the bird in here with all the doors and windows locked? Oh, oh I see what you mean. And it couldn't have been murder. It was accidental, like. The bird flew himself in. And how did he manage to do that? Oh, through that little trap door. Up there beside the window. It, it's got a little swinging hinge to it. So the fish peddler could deliver fish through it when Mother Fishface wasn't home. That blinking bird, he flew up there, he did, shoved open the trap and flew down the, into the room. What happened next was just like you deduced it, Mr. Holmes. It, it, it must have been. Poor old Mother Fishface, murdered accidental by a bird. Very interesting theory, Mr. Hawkins, but unfortunately it does not jive with the facts. Yes, what do you mean, Holmes? Simply this, Watson. The bird couldn't have flown in because it so happens that this particular member of the feathered tribe is an Anopterum harisi, or, or Harris cormorant, which occurs only on the Galapagos Islands. It is entirely flightless. You mean it, it can't fly? Not any farther than Dr. Watson. But it did get in here somehow, Holmes. You'll have to admit that. Quite. The cormorant was introduced into this kitchen by the only person, other than old Mother Fishface, who had the key to that door. Who's that? You, Mr. Hawkins, the landlord. Rubbish. Why should I be wanting to kill the old girl? She was my best tenant. You killed her because you suspected she was going to spit to the port authorities. You got wind of the fact they'd sent me down here to get her story. You can't prove it. You can't prove a blasted thing. Supposing you have got my fingerprints in that gas jet. Dr. Watson here is witness to the fact that he saw me turn it off. Is that so, Holmes? Yeah, but you'll not find my fingerprints in the lock or in that doorknob, neither. I wondered why they were wiped clean. You were here earlier this evening. Your fingerprints should have been on the doorknob. Well, they ain't now. You can't convict me on that. What about the odor of fish that clings to your hands? Too bad you chose mackerel to lure Tika. Such a smelly fish. Furthermore, the notes on the papers which Watson discovered inside the woman's body... But Holmes, I... convict you of conducting a despicable and entirely illegal trade in opium. Another... Uh, Why, Mr. Hawkins, where are you going? Oh, I'm getting out. They won't get me. No, the detection and lay hands on me. Holmes! Why didn't you stop him? He'll be stopped, never fear. The authorities have had the place surrounded ever since we left the tea house. Sam Lee is my go-between. Or didn't you guess? You know, dashed well, I didn't. Furthermore, I don't know what you're talking about when you mention the papers I found in Mother Fishface's bodice. There weren't any papers. I know, Watson. Bluff. Pure bluff. The important thing is Hawkins thinks we've found those papers. It's remarkable how talkative the average criminal becomes once he thinks the jig's up. The port authorities should have no trouble in finding out all they want to know. Yes, at last, the chief of this dope-smuggling ring and the cause of untold human misery will be safely behind bars. Mr. Holmes, did you hear that? Yes, it's Tika. I thought Paru might be able to bring him round. You see, he didn't have as much alcohol in his system as Mother Fishface. 
Let that be a lesson to you, Watson. You go to blazes. It's a problem for the average family these days. Practically every necessity costs more, and most family budgets are not elastic. But there's one thing a man can buy today that gives him the most for his money he's ever known. Yes, even these days. Without the sacrifice of quality, you can buy really fine Clippercraft clothes for far less than ordinary clothes cost elsewhere. And in your own local independent store, where you get friendly personal attention. It's all made possible by the Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores from coast to coast. Stores you can trust. Stores where Clippercraft quality is still sold at amazingly low prices. Even today, Clippercraft suits are only $35 and $40, with a few special numbers at $43.75. Even today, top coats and overcoats are only $30 to $40, and sport jackets but $24. Selling beautifully tailored, expensive clothes, inexpensive in price, at the nation's finest independent stores, is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clippercraft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. And now, Dr. Watson, did they succeed in convicting the handsome Mr. Harry Hawkins? They did indeed, Mr. Harris. They did indeed. Mr. Hawkins spilled the beans, as you say, with very little persuasion. As a matter of fact, Mother Fishface did have quite a few incriminating records tucked away carefully, which we subsequently found. Uh, hidden in an old teapot or the family flower barrel, no doubt. Hidden away in a vault in the bank in Threadneedle Street, together with a very handsome collection of English bank notes. Oh, thrifty old gal. Who inherited the money, Doctor? Whom <laughs> saw to it that the money went to the Limehouse Mission for Stranded Seamen. He also arranged for Peru to spend his declining years there. He even managed to wangle a permission for him to keep Tika perched on the foot of his bed. Mm, I guess there's nothing that can't be done if Sherlock Holmes sets his mind to it. I agree, Mr. Harris. I, of course, I, I wouldn't want Holmes to know about it. <laughs> when did Holmes first suspect that Hawkins had murdered old Mother Fishface, Doctor? Oh, he was pretty sure of it, Mr. Harris, when he realized Hawkins had run for a doctor without first stopping to break a window or turn off the gas. In other words, Hawkins was taking no chances the old girl might come to. <laughs> That's about the size of it. And now I wonder if you'd like to give us an idea about what we can look forward to next week, Dr. Watson. Well, now, let me see. I, uh... Well, I think that next week I'll tell you how witchcraft suddenly came to life again in the west of England uh, and how the investigation of a fairy ring in the grass and a weather-beaten broomstick covered with medieval recipe for flying ointment led Holmes to one of the most diabolical criminals he ever encountered. I call it the laughing lemur of Hightower Heath. Sounds appropriate for what is practically Halloween. Why do you think I chose it, Mr. Harris? Why do you think I chose it? The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective... Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 205th Avenue, New York City. 
Your National Guard is destined to play a more important part than ever before in America's security plans. The National Guard offers young men regular army pay and training without interference with their normal civilian life. If you are between the ages of 17 and 35, married or single, join your local unit of the National Guard. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the Laughing Lemur of Hightower Heath. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clipper Craft dealer. He'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. <laughs> this is Cy Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes. Created for Arthur Conan Doyle. The dramatizations are by Edith Miser. And now, once again, we turn into the familiar gate. The wind whistles cold and sharp through empty branches. A brilliant October moon peers intermittently from behind scudding clouds. Hello, what's that in the good doctor's window? Pumpkin lantern. Dr. Watson is celebrating Halloween early this year. Come in, Mr. Harris, come in. Why the delay on the doorstep? Why, I, I was just admiring your Halloween decorations, Doc Watson. <laughs> a work of art, eh? Presented to me this afternoon by my youngest godchild. It's supposed to wolf goblins and witches and other nefarious familiars who are abroad this time of year. <laughs> you mean who are supposed to be abroad, Doctor? Well, not necessarily, Mr. Harris. Not necessarily. Well, here, take this chair by the fire. Thank you. Did I ever tell you of the time Holmes and I had a rather terrifying encounter with the notorious Laughing Lemur at Tower Heath? Why, you know you didn't, Doctor. Who was she? A witch who had been buried centuries before on wild and brooding countryside known as Dartmoor. This adventure took place on All Saints' Eve, the particular witch's Sabbath, which you Americans refer to as Halloween. And uh, <laughs> there I go off the deep end as usual. Suppose I pause to pour us each a glass of fresh cider, hmm? While you pay homage to our sponsor. What could be fair, Dr. Watson? To tell you that Uppercraft suits sell for only $35 and $40, with a few special models at $43.75. To say that Clippercraft top coats and overcoats sell for only $35 to $40, and sport jackets for only $24, is only half the story. Because you really only begin to appreciate that these prices are astonishingly low... When you've seen Clipper Craft clothes, custom details in the form of correct styling, perfect fit, luxurious tailoring, and rich, long-wearing fabrics are yours in Clipper Craft. Manufacturing ingenuity and a really great distribution idea make all this possible. Available to you in your own local independent store, where friendly attention is traditionally yours. For through the Clipper Craft plan, 924 leading stores across America have concentrated their buying power, resulting in tremendous things in manufacturing and distribution costs. You'll be amazed at Clipper Craft's values. Compare Clipper Craft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, to return to the Witch on the Moors. Oh, right. Uh... It was uh, one morning several years after my marriage, a, a brilliant fall day. The last day of October, to be exact. Mary and I had just finished our matutinal Finn and Harry when a violent jangle at the front door bell heralded a telegram from my erstwhile partner in crime, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. As nearly as I can remember, it ran, uh, If convenient, meet me, Paddington Station, 10.15. If inconvenient, come anyway. Bring service revolver. Don't suppose you have any silver bullets? Silver bullets? What was the meaning of that inquiry, Doctor? <laughs> As a matter of fact, that was my first question after Holmes had settled himself in the corner of our railway carriage. Holmes.
Holmes, I get from your telegram that we're about to embark on another investigation. A dangerous one, judging from the fact that you wish me to bring my revolver. But why the facetious inquiry as to the silver bullets? Because it's a common superstition among the native, the Moors of Devonshire, that the evil spirits who are bound there can only be killed by a silver bullet. Oh, who's interested in native superstitions? We are, Watson. We've been urgently summoned by Sir Lionel Fenwick of Fenwick Hall. The long dead ancestress of his is supposed to be on the prowl. It seems she's not only playing all sorts of outrageous pranks, but actually threatening the safety of his infant son, born only two weeks ago. In other words, Watson. We're not on the trail of a common criminal. This is a witch hunt. Pressing, eh, Watson, the first glimpse of the moor? Yes. We shall be there shortly. Uh, notice that ancient Roman tower. She's buried at the crossroads at the foot of that hill. It's from that building that she derives her name. Well, who derives what name? The Laughing Lemur of High Tower Hill. A lemur is the Roman word for ghost or spirit of the dead. But she was a witch besides. That's why she was buried at the crossroads. She would have been burned, of course, and her ashes scattered to the four winds, except that she was a great lady and married to the head of the house of Fenwick, whose given name was Hugo. Hugo was an old boy in his sixties when he married her. Much to the annoyance of his brother Edgar, he's a lusty, fun-loving young French noblewoman, a Louise de Lombal, whose mother was the notorious Madame de Montespan. Madame de Montespan? Well, wasn't she a, a sort of minor borgia? Yes, Watson. At any rate, Louise seemed young, gay, and exceptionally healthy and active. Too athletic, perhaps, for her ancient bridegroom, because she insisted he accompany her when she rode to hounds. When in due course of time was found, his neck broken, on the far side of a particularly high wall, which his wife, shrieking with laughter, jumped a few moments before. Even after Hugo's death, Louise rode day and danced by night, and day or night she continued to laugh. Death's bad taste, if you ask me. Quite. At first, her brother-in-law, Edgar, seems to have been fairly tolerant of the situation, since he now believed himself Lord of the Manor. But one day, three weeks after her husband's death, Louise came to him and informed him that she was going to have a child. The dead Hugo was an heir. She relayed the information with gales of laughter. Uh, poor Edgar. The joke was certainly on him. Oh, no. He started rumors about his brother's widow. The French perfumes she used were love potions. She and twelve companions she brought with her from France formed a coven. A coven? In the old days when witchcraft was in flower, Watson, witches and their familiars banded together in unholy groups of thirteen, which were called covens. Oh. Lastly, Edgar claimed that no mortal had fathered the child, that it was the offspring of the devil himself. In proof of intention, he pointed out cloven hoof prints under Louise's window. In short, the unfortunate lady was tried as a witch, and uh, English justice being, shall we say, uh, slightly biased in those days, she was sentenced to be hanged by the neck until dead. Dashed unfair, if you ask me. After which she was buried at the crossroads beneath the Roman tower, with a stake through her heart and a great stone over the grave to make sure she didn't return from it. Oh, a lot of primitive nonsense. I wonder. At any rate, during the last fortnight, some person or persons seem to have moved that stone and some rather curious, not to say frightening, phenomena have occurred. Yet the present house of the head of the house, Nick, seems to feel the safety of his firstborn is threatened, and that this danger should reach its peak tonight, which is All Hallows' Eve. Yes, here we are. This is our station. And that uh, gentleman waiting over there beside the wagonette with a pair of handsome cobs is undoubtedly Sir Lionel, present master of Fenwick Hall. Keep the rug tucked over your knees, gentlemen. It's a longish drive to the hall, and the wind across the moors has turned uncommon cold. I'll admit, Mr. Holmes, I was greatly relieved when I received your telegram saying I could expect you. Oh? Have there been any further disturbances since you posted your letter to me? There have, Mr. Holmes. The church bell has tolled at odd hours, last night and the night before. Furthermore, a young goat was discovered, dragged to the foot of the witch's grave, its throat all torn and bleeding. Of course, it could have been killed by a wolf or some ferocious dog, but... Unpleasant occurrences, Sir Lionel, but as you say, not necessarily supernatural. That's what I keep telling my wife and that stupid old nurse of hers. But I must say, when old Willie was found to be missing this morning, I really began to worry. Old Willie? He's the gatekeeper, Mr. Holmes. Lives in the little stone lodge beside the entrance to our property. He's tended that gate for over 50 years. Never leaves it night or day, uh, except to come up to the hall for the Christmas party and my birthday. Well, maybe the monotony finally got the best of him, eh, Holmes, and uh, he decided off. He couldn't wander very far, Dr. Watson. Old Willie is a cripple. 
He managed to hobble a few feet with the aid of his crutch. But, but uh, that's the curious part of the story. Willie was missing, but his crutch was there where he left it every night, propped up against the foot of his bed. Thank right, you. Was there anything else missing? Any clothing, overcoat, shoes, money, provisions of any sort? No, Mr. Holmes. Wherever Willie went, he went in his nightshirt. Not even his carpet slippers are gone. Nothing was missing? Nothing at all? As a matter of fact, one object has disappeared with him. The old broom with which Willie swept the leaves away from the gates. Old Nanny, my wife's nurse, set up a typical Irish wailing when she heard about it. Insisted old Willie had ridden off on it to join the witch's Sabbath tonight. She always hated him because he makes her get out of the cart and open the gates herself when she goes marketing for my... Typical household feud, eh, Holmes? I tried to reason with the ignorant old fool, but she kept moaning and groaning that she's always known Willie had the evil eye. She's managed to frighten my poor wife nearly to hysterics. Oh, my wife is Irish too, Mr. Holmes. Her name is Bridget, in fact. I must say they place more credence in these old wives' tales than we do here. Nanny says it's the curse of the House of Fenwick being visited upon us. The curse of the House of Fenwick? Yes, it, it, it seems a certain Lady Fenwick, born Louise de Lombard. Oh, yes, Holmes has already told me about her. Hanged as a witch and buried at the foot of the Roman Tower. That, well, it seems that when they had to place the noose around her neck, uh, she turned to my, uh, well, great-great-something-or-other grandfather, who had the bad judgment to be standing nearby. She turned to him and laughed. But my dear brother Edgar, a silken rope, que c'est charmant. <laughs> you think this is the end of Louise de Lamballe, but you are so very mistaken. You do not believe to have my first child, and so I say, I will not let your first child live. No, not the first child of any of the great house of Phoenix. Louise shall come back from the grave. She shall come back and take them all. <laughs> Has she managed to live up to her threats, Sir Lionel? Certainly not all of the oldest children of our house have met an untimely death, but uh, a rather high percentage have been stillborn. Uh, several have succumbed shortly after birth. The wind is rising. We're approaching High Tower Tor, Dr. Watson. The wind is always stronger here. How ghastly the Roman ruins look in the moonlight. When we reach the next bend in the road, we shall be opposite the witch's grave. I see. The curious strip of mist is flying across the road. Easy, easy, Phoebe. Easy, Blue Boy. What, what blazes has got to the horses? Something seems to open them. Great Scott, what's that? There's something white over there in the bracken. Rain in the horses, Sir Lionel. Right. I think our investigation may be in here. Right. Come along, Watson. Help someone. I'm a giant. I see that white thing. It's moving. It's crawling along the ground. Yes, the man. He's badly hurt. What's he doing all in white? It's a nightshirt, Watson. Hi. Oh, it's old Willie, but he, his face is all black. So are his hands. Willie, what's that stuff you've got in your skin? It's the salve, the flying salve she give me so I could fly here to High Tower Heath. We flew, me and me broomstick, we flew all the way. Good Lord, he's out of his head. He's delirious. Yes, he's in a bad way. Take his pulse, Watson. Here you are, Willie. Take a swig out of my flask. Thank you, sir. I'm frozen cold. I've been cold ever since I put on the salve. She said it's because we was flying so high. Who was she? What was her name? Uh, the witch, of course. What did she look like? Uh, that I couldn't rightly say. She was wearing a veil over her face and standing in the moonlight at the foot of my bed. I'd been asleep when she called to me. Wake up. Wake up, Willie Malloy. You? Who be? <laughs> Someone who can make you dance. Someone who can make you fly. You've always wanted to dance, haven't you, Willie? They're giving a dance tonight around my grave. Here, take this jar of ointment. Cover yourself well with it, Willie. Cover your old broomstick. It will make you fly. I'd like that. 
free like a bird. I'd like to fly. Then rub on the ointment. I'll wait for you outside. We'll fly to the tower and dance together around my grave. <laughs> I did like she told me, sir. I covered myself and me broom. And first thing I knew, I got lighter and lighter. Up and up I went, up in the clouds. And the next I knew, I was here on the heath, watching them dance, the little people. They were dancing around in a circle. But it made me dizzy to watch them. So I crept under a bush and went to sleep. This morning, I woke up cold and sick. The magic was gone. I couldn't fly, and I couldn't walk. Poor old boy. Hello. His pulse, it stopped. The home is good, Brandy. Willie, Willie, don't give up now. I'm afraid he has what. Yes, he's dead all right. Dead of narcotic poisoning and one of the most desperate tricks I've ever encountered. Mr. Holmes, what do you mean? I shall be able to answer that question more accurately, Sir Lionel, after I've had a chance to analyze the ointment that's smeared on this broomstick behind the body. What? Bring it along, Watson. Be careful you don't smear it on your clothes. The moon's rising above the hill. How white the crossroads look. Yes, this is where the witch is buried. I say, look here, all around. The heather is trampled down in a large ring. Great Scott, there was a dance here last night. I look at these footprints in this damp spot. Small footprints. All small. No wonder Willie said he saw the little people. Here we are, gentlemen. This is Fenwick Hall. Is that you, Lionel? Rachel, my dear, I've brought Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Thank heaven for that. It's time we had someone with intelligence to bring order into this hysterical household. Gentlemen, this is Rachel Conway, my cousin. How do you do? How do she you used do? to keep house for me before my marriage, and she very kindly consented to return while my wife, Bridget, was having her baby. And a good thing I came back. Bridget hasn't stepped a foot out of her bed since the child was born. She won't even try. Maybe she might, if you'd go away where you belong. That will do, Nanny. Hmm. What's that horrible stench? They've both moved into the nursery with the baby, Nanny and Bridget. She's had her bed brought downstairs, Lionel. They've been burning powders and drawing magic circles around the crib all afternoon. It's a wonder the baby isn't suffocated. Sure, and something's got to be done to protect the little one's soul from the ghouls and ghosties. His father won't give him a proper Christian christening. No, he must wait till the bishop gets back from Scotland. So it's up to his old nanny to protect the witches. You seem to be an expert on witchcraft, today. Sure I am that. Any part of Ireland's alive with them. No doubt. But at the moment, I'm more interested in finding out what this stuff is on the handle of this broomstick and discovering which one of the women in this household has been visiting the witch's grave. How can you tell that, Mr. Holmes? Tomorrow morning, Dr. Watson and I will search the room of every woman in this house. Whatever for, Mr. Holmes? It was a woman who lured Willie to the crossroads last night. No one can wander over the heath without collecting evidence of it on his or her clothing. Mud on the shoes, bracken on the coat or cloak. By the way, Sir Lionel, do you suppose I could speak to your wife a moment before she goes to sleep? That she cannot. She's asleep already. Really? I'd have thought she'd be concerned over her son's safety to doze off. Tonight of all nights. They gave her a sleeping potion. They put it into her tea. I see. You said the nursery was down here on this floor, I believe. That's right, Dr. Watson. But surely if the child is in danger, it would be best to move him on the ground floor. What he's in danger from can come through locked doors. He'll be in danger till he's christened. That's when the witches try to snatch him. It's the soul they're after, not the body. Nanny, one more word of that nonsense and I'll ship you back to Ireland. Now, get back to your mistress where you belong. Sure, if it's back to Ireland, I'm going. She goes with me and don't you forget it. Nanny's a fool, Lionel. You'd have her long ago. But poor Bridget was so homesick. I, I didn't have the heart to take her nurse from her. Good heavens, what am I thinking of? Cook has laid out supper for you gentlemen on a table in front of the fire in the library. I'll fetch some hot coffee. Uh, thank you, but we've no time to waste on food. I say, Holmes, I'm starved. Very well, Watson, suppose you make us some sandwiches while I set up our chemical equipment. 
Uh, if you could arrange it, Sir Lionel, I should like to have the use of a room not too far from the nursery. Uh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. You may take over the gun room. It's directly opposite. Good. And if you smell any further curious odors, don't be alarmed. I imagine we may be able to give nannies, powders and potions a run for their money. Watson, let's see what we've discovered in this confounded salve. Hog's fat, water, hemlock, aconite, blood. Probably from a rat or bat. I can't determine that without a more powerful microscope. Sink foil, deadly nightshade, and soot. Fine collection of poisonous ingredients, eh, Holmes? The interesting thing, Watson, is that they're all well-known ancient poisons. The aconite and deadly nightshade, or belladonna, being particularly potent. My belladonna's a violent delirium. No poor wonder poor old Willie thought he was flying. Yes, Watson, the salve that was used to anoint Willie and his broomstick was undoubtedly a medieval witch's formula for fly ointment. You don't really believe in things like that, Holmes? No, Watson, I don't think Willie actually flew from here to the Roman Tower. But he was undoubtedly under the impression that he'd done so. He was probably transported in a cart or carriage. But why should anyone want to poison Willie, take him across the moors and leave him to die? I don't think the intent was to harm him as much as it was to frighten him. Unfortunately, whoever took him to the witch's grave was frightened off when they found they weren't alone. When they found they weren't alone? Exactly. The little people were more than they bargained for. Oh, Holmes, really, there are times All when right, you... Watson, someone opened the door upstairs. Turn out the lamp. That's right. I didn't hear anything. Yes. Someone's coming along the upper hallway. I think my remark about searching the rooms tomorrow might lead to something. If any of the women in this household have anything to hide, you may depend on it, they'll try to get rid of it tonight. Someone's coming down the stairs. Yes, judging by her step, it's a woman. She's heading for the library. Stay here, Watson. Keep your eye on the nursery door. I'm going to follow her. I wouldn't throw those papers in the fireplace, Miss Conway. <gasps> Mr. Holmes! If you'll allow me to take one look at them... I'd rather die. Very well. Suppose I tell you what those envelopes contain. Some early photographs of Sir Lionel and letters from him. But they're not love letters. You must believe me, they're not. I do believe it, Miss Rachel. You were and still are in love with him. The affection has never been returned. Is that right? Yes, Mr. Holmes. But Lionel doesn't know how I feel. He doesn't know I've kept his letters. Please, please don't tell him. It would, it would kill me if he found out. I've kept many secrets in my time, Miss Rachel. I believe there's room for one more. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I... I don't know how to thank you. Don't try. And for goodness sake, go out to the kitchen and make yourself a cup of tea. Make some for Watson, too. I will, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I will. Holmes! Holmes, come quickly. The old nurse slipped out of the nursery. She's gone upstairs. Calm yourself, Watson. We'll catch her on the way back. Yes, I wonder what she'll bring with her. Strange. Her old hat is creak at night. Quiet, Watson. Yes, she's coming back. She's reached the head of the stairs. Now she stopped two steps down. So that's her little game, is it? Very interesting. Very... Yes, here she comes down the rest of the way. Strike a match, Watson. Now then, Nanny, what's that you've got in your hands? A ball of twine and a pair of shoes. And why not? My lady's shoes, it is. Forgot to shine them. So you did. Muddy, aren't they? Let me see them. You go to the devil. Well, I'll be... Yes, Watson, as I suspected, Lady Fenwick wasn't as bedridden as she wanted people to believe. Sometime during the last 24 hours, she's been out on the moors. That red clay on her boots is rather prevalent at the foot of High Tower Hill. You mean she's been pretending to be the ghost? Holmes, it's midnight. The witching hour. Ah! Help! Help the baby! Save the baby! Nanny! Bridget, I'm coming! No, no! For the love of heaven, stay up there! Come downstairs, Sir Lionel, if you value your name. Bridget, Mr. Holmes, what's happening down there? Light the lamp, watch. That's better. Now, Sir Lionel, if you'll investigate the second step from the top. Huh? Good lot. A piece of twine stretched across the stairs. Yes, a trip rope. You were supposed to fall downstairs and break your neck. Oh, no, no, Lionel. She didn't mean any harm. Nanny only wanted to frighten you so you'd let the priest christen the baby. You mean that's the reason she gave you, Lady Fenwick? Bridget, what in heaven's name has been going on here? Oh, darling, I was so frightened when Nanny told me about the curse and the witch's stone being moved. I didn't want anything to happen to the baby. I didn't know Willie would die. I only thought she wanted to get even with him. I didn't mean any harm. I didn't mean any harm. <laughs> well, well, 
I'll say that was a spine chiller, Dr. Watson. <laughs> Appropriate for Halloween, don't you think? But look now, why did old Lenny want to call Oh, Mr. Harris, before I explain all that, suppose we show our gratitude to the people who make this program possible. A very sound idea, Dr. Watson. It's quite a shock when you're face-to-face with clipper craft clothes. I mean, an extremely pleasant shock. For even experts are amazed at clipper craft values. Without the sacrifice of quality, you can buy really fine clipper craft clothes for far less than ordinary clothes cost elsewhere in a pleasant atmosphere at your own local independent store where you get friendly personal attention. Clip has delivered the goods in more ways than one. Through the famous clipper craft plan, 924 leading stores from coast to coast have concentrated their buying power. The result, exceptionally fine quality at exceptionally low prices. Remember, clipper craft suits are only 35 and $40 with a few special numbers at forty-three seventy-five, Top coats and overcoats are only $30 to $40, and sport jackets only $24. Selling beautifully tailored expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clipper Craft plan. That's why who know insist on Clipper Craft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clipper Craft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clipper Craft clothes are... Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. Now, Dr. Watson, I was about to ask you, why did old Nanny want to stir up so much trouble? Oh, she hated the Moors, Mr. Harris. She hated Willie and she hated Sir Lionel. She was a thoroughly warped personality. Holmes suspected her immediately, of course, when he smelled the hocus-pocus powder she'd been burning in the nursery. He knew she must have made the flying ointment that was responsible for Willie's death. Well, now, Doctor, what about the gravestone? Ringing church bells and the little people. Who oh, is it plays Halloween pranks, Mr. Harris? You mean children? Right. Holmes realized that when he saw the size of the footprints on Hightower Heath. Well, I'm blessed. I hope so, I'm sure. Now, let me see. Uh, next week, I'll tell you how Holmes and I investigate the case of a little governess whose employer agreed to pay her extra wages because she was willing to cut off her hair. And wear a bright blue dress. Sounds like rather curious requests, Dr. Watson. Why was she asked to do those things? That question led Holmes and myself to visit a decidedly sinister country place called the Copper Beaches. We found a most unexpected answer in the act. <laughs> of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the Adventure of the Copper Beaches. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. <laughs> This is Cy speaking for Clifford Clothes. This is a mutual broadcast. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes.
Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Good evening, Mr. Harris. Good evening. Good evening, Doctor. Good heavens, what's all that pile of envelopes you've got there? That, Dr. Watson, believe it or not, is fan mail. You don't say. You mean some of our listeners have really bothered to write to us about these uh, little reminiscences of mine? Why, they have indeed, Doctor. What's more, most of our listeners seem to have a favorite Sherlock Holmes adventure they'd like to have you tell. You don't say. Well, you know, Mr. Harris, I, I always aim to please... Any suggestions for tonight's story? <laughs> hundreds, Doctor, hundreds, literally. And offhand, I'd say the most frequent request in this week's mail is for a story called The Copper Beaches. The Adventure of the Copper Beaches. Well, as a matter of fact, that's always been one of my favorites, Mr. Harris, probably because of the curious secret we discovered in the attic. And uh, may I say here, I'm always happy to get fan mail. And oh, speaking of fan mail, Mr. Harris, that's something you're interested in, too, from another angle, of course. How about it? Quite right, Dr. Watson. Mentioning fan mail naturally brings to mind Clipper Craft Clothes because of their millions of fans the country over. And there's good reason for these loyal followers. You wouldn't believe, yes, even clothing experts are amazed, that clothes as fine as Clipper Craft are available at prices so exceptionally low. Now, things like this don't just happen. It's the result of manufacturing ingenuity and a really great distribution idea, the unique, the famous Clipper Craft plan. Now, this plan concentrates the buying power of 924 leading stores across America, makes possible these truly phenomenal values at your own local independent store. In a pleasant atmosphere where you get friendly personal attention, you can buy Clipper Craft suits at only $35 and $40 and a few special numbers at $43.75. Top coats and overcoats are only $30 to $40, and sport jackets only $24. You'll always insist on them if you compare Clipper Craft clothes with clothes selling for many dollars more. Well, Dr. Watson, now what about the Copper Beaches? It was uh, a cold, gloomy morning in early spring. We were sitting on either side of a cheery fire in our rooms in Baker Street. Holmes had been silent and moody all morning, smoking his long cherrywood pipe, which usually displaced his favorite clay when he was in a disputatious mood. Altogether, he was in no sweet temper. Matches, matches, where are the matches? Look at that confounded fog. What happens to all the matches in this house, I'd like to know. Oh, my dear Holmes, why not use the tongs and the live coal if you want to relight your pipe? Mm. No, I've burned myself. For heaven's sake, Holmes, stop spluttering. I say something's annoying you. Why don't you get it off your chest? It's that latest book of yours. Hmm? Sensationalism, Watson, rank sensationalism. You're always placing the emphasis on the crime. Crime is common. Logic is rare. You should stress the logic. You've degraded what should have been a course of lectures into a series of tales. Now, really, Holmes, that's not logical. You're always complaining that crime is falling off. You say there are no first-class criminals left. Quite. And therefore, if you depend on the crime to hold your readers, you'll soon be a back number. Criminals. <laughs> They've lost all their enterprise and originality. My practice seems to be degenerating into an agency for recovering lost lead pencils and giving good advice to young ladies from boarding school. <laughs> advice to the love lord, eh? Well, look at this. This note that came in the morning post. Yes, the last straw, that's what it is. Here, read it. Dear me, let me see it. Dear Mr. Holmes, I am very anxious to consult you as to whether I should or should not accept a situation which has been offered me as governess. I shall call at half past ten tomorrow if I do not inconvenience you. Yours faithfully, Violet Hunter. But it's almost eleven now. Exactly. She's late, just like a woman. I say, Holmes, this must be the young lady now walking briskly up the street. Let me see. Hmm, brisk, purposeful manner, nice, bright, intelligent face. Yes, she's stopping at our door. There may be something in this case after all, my dear Watson. Yes, she's not the hysterical sort that makes a fuss over nothing. Shh, here she is. Come in. Oh, how do you do? This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Quite. And this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you how do? How do you do? Won't you sit down? Thank you. I trust you'll excuse my troubling you, Mr. Holmes, but I've had a very strange experience... 
And as I have no relations of any sort to advise me, I thought I'd best come to you. I shall be happy to do anything I can. I, um, I've been a governess for five years in the family of Colonel Spence Munro. He's been transferred to Nova Scotia, so that for the last few months I've been without a situation. But the money I had saved began to run out. I... I was at my wit's end. Go on. Yesterday, I called at a well-known employment agency run by a Miss Stoper. When I arrived, the outer office was filled with young ladies looking for situations. I was told to wait. I did so. After about half an hour, my name was called out. Well, the door to Miss Stoper's private office was ajar. Seated beside her was a prodigiously stout man with a round, smiling face and a heavy chin. His eyes were like two little slits. Come in, my dear. Come in. Uh, Mr. Rucastle, this is Mr... Oh, yes. What is your name, my dear? Miss Hunter. Violet Hunter. Oh, yes. Violet Hunter. Capital, capital. I couldn't ask for anything better. I'm sure you will do, Miss Hunter. I, I hope so, Mr. Rucastle. You're looking for a situation as governess? Yes, sir. What salary do you ask? Well, I, I had four pounds a month in my last place. Four pounds? Sweating. Rank sweating. How anyone could have the audacity to offer that to a lady with with such attraction, such accomplishments. Well, my, my accomplishments may not be all you expect, Mr. Rucastle. A little French, a little German, music and drawing. <laughs> my dear Miss Hunter, all that's beside the question. The point is, are you or are you not a lady? Well... The answer is yes. A lady fitted for the rearing of a child who may someday play a considerable part in the history of his country. Your salary with me, madam, would commence at a hundred pounds a year. A hundred? Oh, Mr. Rocastle. Furthermore, it's my custom to advance my young ladies half their salary beforehand. Well, may I ask where you live, Mr. Rocastle? Hampshire. Charming rural spot. The Copper Beaches is the name of the place, five miles north of Winchester. The dearest old house. And... And what would be my duties? One child, a dear little romper age six. Oh, if you could see him killing cockroaches with a slipper. Smack, smack, smack. Three gone before you could wink. <laughs> well, my sole duty, then, is to take care of this... this child. Well, I... I am sure your good sense would suggest that you obey any little commands which my wife, wife might give. Well, I should be happy to make myself useful. In dress, for example. We're fatty people. Fatty, but kind-hearted. If you were asked to wear a particular dress that we might give you, you, you wouldn't object to our little whim, eh? Why, well, no. More to, to sit here or there. That wouldn't be offensive to you? Why, why, no. Or to cut your hair short before you came to us? My, my hair? Oh, yes, it's, it's quite essential. It's, it's a little fancy of my wife's, you see. And ladies' fancies, my dear Miss Hunter, they must be consulted. But, but my hair... Oh, no, I couldn't. No? What a pity. In that case, Miss Stoper, I'd best inspect a few more of your young ladies. Good day, then, Miss Hunter. I'm afraid you must consider yourself struck from our list. You can hardly expect us to exert ourselves to find another such opening for you. But, Miss Stoper... Good day, Miss Hunter. Uh, just a minute, Miss Stoper. Let's not be too hard on the young lady. Uh, after all, my request was a bit sudden... Perhaps, Miss Hunter, you'd like uh, 24 hours in which to consider the matter. And in view of the fact that you have particularly beautiful hair, I uh, I might be willing to raise the salary to 120 pounds a year to, to recompense you for our little eccentricities. Unusual, my... Very unusual, my dear Miss Hunter... What do you make of it, Watson? Well, perhaps the gentleman's wife's a lunatic, and he wishes to humor in her fancies to, in order to prevent an outbreak. Possibly, Watson, possibly. But the money, Mr. Holmes, the money. Oh, and I need it so. Well, yes, the pay is good. Too good. Why should they give you 120 pounds when they could have their pick for 40? There must be some strong reason. But I... I have no choice. Then you've made up your mind to accept? I must. I thought if I told you the circumstances, you would understand afterwards if... Well, if I wanted your help, I should feel so much stronger if I knew you were behind me. Yes, you may carry that feeling away with you. And if at any time you should find yourself in danger... Danger? But what danger could there be? My dear Miss Hunter, it would cease to be a danger if we could define it. But remember, at any time, day or night, just telegraph and I'll come to your help. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. You realize 
surprised, Watson. It's been almost a week since Miss Hunter called and we haven't heard a word from her. I don't like it. Oh, nonsense, Holmes. She seemed to be a young lady who is quite capable of taking care of herself. Just the same, I should never have permitted an unprotected female to accept a situation like that. Data. If I only had some data. Can't make bricks without straw. Well, at any rate, nothing very dreadful can happen out in the open country like that. That is where you're wrong, Watson. It's my experience that the vilest alleys in London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling and beautiful countryside. Holmes, you give me the creeps. The pressure of public opinion is greatest in the towns. There's no lane so vile that the scream of a tortured child or the flood of a drunkard's blow does not beget sympathy and assistance from the neighbors. But the countryside, my dear Watson, filled with its lonely houses, think of the hellish cruelty, they, the hidden wickedness. Had our young friend gone to live in Winchester, I should not have this fear for her safety. It's the five miles of country which make the danger. See what that is, Watson. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. It's uh, a telegram for you, Holmes. Give it to me. It's from Miss Hunter. Uh, well, what does she say? Come at once. We'll meet you at the Black Swan Hotel, Winchester, at three this afternoon. And at my wit's end, don't fail me. What do you suppose has happened? Hurry, Watson. We have no time to lose. There's a train from Waterloo Station in half an hour. If only we get to her in time. Yes, there's the Black Swan opposite the station. Well, and if I'm not mistaken, that is Miss Hunter waiting for us on the steps. Oh, Mr. Holmes, it's so kind of you to come. And you too, Dr. Watson. I can't tell you how anxious I've been. <laughs> there, there, Miss Hunter. I, uh, Watson, you'd better handle this situation. You're better with hysterical women than I am. Holmes, you are a cold-blooded fish. It's not hysteria, it's relief. It's all right, Miss Hunter. We are here, you know. Uh, I'm really not as foolish as I sound. It, it's just that the strain of the last two weeks. But I'll tell you about that as we go along. There's a shortcut to the Copper Beaches through the woods. Come along, then. Now, Miss Hunter, if you'll tell us what's been happening since you arrived at the Rue Castle household. Well, Copper Beaches is a large, sinister-looking house, almost completely surrounded by woods. It depressed me from the moment of my arrival. I was met at the door by Mr. Rue Castle and his wife. And is she... No, Mr. Holmes. She is not mad. I see. She's a small, pale-faced woman, much younger than Mr. Rue Castle. In fact, I gather that she's his second wife... There was a daughter by the first marriage, a girl now over 20, but she's not living at the house. Mr. Rue Castle said that she could not get along with her stepmother, so he sent her to America, to Philadelphia. America? How extraordinary. And uh, does Mrs. Rue Castle strike you as a difficult woman to get along with? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. She's shy and rather quiet. More than once I've surprised her in tears. At first I thought it might be worry over the disposition of her child. What's the matter with his disposition? Well, he's badly spoiled. He's an ungovernable temper and seems to take a great delight in torturing birds and small animals. Mm, pleasant little beast. And the rest of the household? There's only one servant. Toller is his name. A rough, uncouth man with a perpetual smell of drink about him. Why they keep him, I don't know. Except perhaps because he's the only one who can manage Carlo. Carlo? Carlo is a huge, underfed mastiff that's kept chained in the stables during the day. But at night they let him out. He's a terrible beast. Even Mr. Rue Castle is afraid of him. Well, I'm sure he'd tear any trespasser to bits. Mm. I wonder why Mr. Rue Castle desires such ferocious protection. I'm sure I don't know. Unless... Unless there is something on the top floor of the West Wing that he wants to hide. The West Wing, eh? Yes. The door that leads into it is opposite my room. It's kept securely locked. I have noticed Mr. Rue Castle going in and out a couple of times. The windows of that wing are all shuttered, too. And locked from the inside. Mm, looks nasty to me, Holmes. Watson, don't interrupt. Well, the second day after my arrival, immediately after breakfast, Mr. Rucastle asked me to put on a dress which had been laid out on the bed for me. What was it like? It wasn't a new dress, Mr. Holmes, but the material was excellent and of a particularly brilliant shade. An electric blue. Oh, charming color, I thought. I put it on and went down to the living room. Mr. Rucastle had placed a chair for me by the front window. Sit here with your back to the window. You may read this book aloud. <laughs> A French novel. I, I think we'll uh, find it most uh, amusing. After an hour or so, you may go back upstairs and change to your own clothes. But, Mr. Rue Castle, I don't understand. Who asked you to understand? Just do as I say. Strange. 
Very strange, Miss Hutter. I've had to sit there in the window for an hour every morning since then. As time passed, I became more and more curious. Why were they so careful to keep my face turned away from the window? Naturally, I was consumed with desire to see what was going on behind my back. Well, today I devised a means. I noticed at breakfast that Mr. Rucas had had quite a few drinks. A happy thought seized me. My hand mirror had been broken. I concealed a piece of it in my handkerchief and later in my book, feeling sure that Mr. Rucastle was too drunk to notice. By holding the book up, I was able to see everything behind me. And what did you see? At first, there was nothing. At the second glance, however, I saw a young man in a grey suit leaning against a railing which bordered our field. He was looking earnestly in my direction. Mr. Rucastle must have noticed my surprise, for he burst out angrily. <laughs> Really, Miss Hunter, your attention must be wandering. That's the second time you've read that passage. Furthermore, there's an impertinent fellow up the road who keeps staring at you. A friend of yours? Oh, no, Mr. Rootcastle. I don't know anyone around here. You kindly turn round and motion him to go away. But wouldn't it be better not to notice Do him? as I tell you. I really don't encourage you to have any followers. Oh, very well, Mr. Rootcastle. There. Hmm. Impertinent fellow. That'll be all for this morning, Miss Hunter. Let me go to your room. But, Mr. Rucastle, I hope you don't think... Go to your room, I say. Yes, sir. And after this, you needn't bother to wear that blue dress. I did as I was told, Mr. Holmes. But on the way upstairs, I noticed that the door to the west wing had the key still in the lock. Oh, Rucastle must have been drunk to forget that, eh, Holmes? Quiet, Watson. I'll admit my curiosity was greater than my sense of caution. I opened the door and mounted the stairs to the attic. In the hall at the top of the house, I found three doors. The middle one barred with the end of an old iron bedstead. Good Lord. It was terribly spooky up there. Once something brushed against my face. <gasps> what was that? Oh, it must have been a bat. Oh, dear. Is it... Is there anyone in there? Who's there? Can I help you? So, <gasps> it was you then. I thought it must be when I saw the door open. Oh, oh Mr. Rucasa, I'm so frightened. <laughs> My dear young lady, what frightened you? Well, I, I was foolish enough to come into this vacant wing, but... It's so lonely and eerie, and a bat swooped down into my face. Is that all? What? What, what else could there be? Why do you suppose I keep that door locked? Well, I, I'm sure I don't know. It's to keep people out who have no business there, you see. Well, I, I'm sure if I'd known... I... Well, you know now, my dear young lady. And if you ever put your foot over that threshold again, I'll throw you to the mastiff. <laughs> What a dreadful experience. Mr. Holmes, I feel sure there's someone locked in that room. Someone who's unhappy, perhaps tortured. Oh, good heavens, it's almost five. I promised to be back by six. Mr. and Mrs. Rucastle are going out. If Mr. Rucastle should discover where I've been. You've acted like a brave and sensible girl, Miss Hunter. Yes, indeed you have. Dr. Watson and I will hang around until the Rucastles have left. Well, that should be around seven. Good. I don't imagine the Mastiff will be let loose until they return. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. It will be too dangerous for them to get back to the house. Excellent. We'll hope the Tuller's still drunk. At any rate, you must get us into the house. We must explore the West Wing. I'll do my best, Mr. Holmes. And now I must hurry. Goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye, Miss Hunter. Well, my dear Holmes, what do you make of it all? The blue dress and the man in front of the house. Obviously, they've had her impersonating someone. Someone young, whose hair had been cut off during an illness. That someone is probably the person imprisoned in the West Wing. How sinister. That is not the most sinister part of Miss Hunter's story, Watson. No? <clears throat> what is then? The unpleasant disposition of the child. But what has that got to do with it? My dear Watson, as a medical man, you're always gaining light as to the tendencies of a child by a study of the parents. Heredity is a science that can be worked backwards as well. You can get a good insight into the character of the parents by studying the children. This child is cruel. Abnormally cruel. He probably inherits it from one of his parents. I only hope nothing serious happens before seven o'clock. Gracious. 
Just what a night. The first thunderstorm of the season. See, listen to that dog. He has an ugly temper. Look at the copper beaches swaying in the wind. Yes, there's Miss Hunter standing in the front doorway. She's waving to us. The coast must be clear. Come in, come in. Goodness, you must be soaked to the skin. What's that pounding? It's Toller. He was just going out to release the dog. I sent him to the wine cellar, then locked him in. Splendid. I managed to get Toller's keys this afternoon, too. He was quite drunk. They're duplicates of Mr. Rue Castles. Better and better. But come along upstairs. We have no time to waste. You got your revolver handy, Watson? Yes. Good. Good heavens. That lightning must have hit near here. One of the copper beaches, no doubt. Now, which key? Ah, this one, I fancy. That's right. Oh, there's nothing here. Come along. Listen to that rain on the roof. The middle door, you said. Hello in there. No answer, I don't like that. Watson, help me remove this bedstead. Right. That's right, it's tied at one end. Cut the rope. That's it. The, the door's locked. We must break it in, then. Come on. One, two, two three. Hello? There's no one here. That villain, Lucas, must have made away with his prisoner. That's your right. He's probably been carried off. But how? Through the skylight. It's still open. Shove that table over here. All right. What are you going to do? Stand on it, of course. Yes. Two pairs of footprints. There's a ladder resting against the eaves. So that's how he did it. But that's not possible. The ladder wasn't there when the Rue Castles went away. Then he must have come back. Come a dangerous back. and clever man. Listen. Listen. Yes, I think I hear his footsteps on the stairs. <gasps> oh, Mr. Holmes! It's Mr. Rue Castle! He'll kill us all! I thought I'd find you here. Villain, what have you done with your daughter? I'm the one that should ask that, you thieves, you robbers. I've caught you. I'll fix you. Carlo! Carlo! He's gone for the dog. We'll be torn to shreds. Quick, Watson, we must close the front door. Shut up and stand back, Watson. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Oh, thank heavens you've done it. You've killed Carlo. Oh, I thought it was too late. Oh, it's too horrible. I think I feel... No, 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 Miss Hunter. You're out of danger. Just you go upstairs and take your bag. Dr. Watson and I are going to take you back to town with us on the nine o'clock train. And now, Watson, suppose you see if there's anything you can do for that villain, Rue Castle. He's not worth saving, but... I suppose your conscience won't rest unless you have a try at it. And now, before Sherlock Holmes sums up for Dr. Watson, suppose we sum up for Clippercraft clothes. Regardless of price, you'll go a long way before you find clothes as fine as Clippercraft. Low prices are just half the story. Low prices like Clippercraft suits at only 35 and 40 dollars with a few special numbers at forty-three seventy-five, like top coats and overcoats at only thirty to forty dollars, and sport jackets at only twenty-four dollars. No, it's what you get for what you spend that makes Clippercraft values remarkable. Correct styling, perfect fit, truly custom-like tailoring, and rich long-wearing fabrics, all made possible by the unique Clippercraft plan that concentrates the buying power of nine hundred twenty-four leading stores across the country resulting in tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. Remember, all this is available to you in your own local independent store, where friendly attention is traditionally yours. Selling beautifully tailored expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clippercraft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 
16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. So you think Watson at Rue Castle will live? I'm afraid so, Holmes. Oh, I'm so glad to get away from that dreadful place. Yes, I'm sure you are, Miss Hunter. I say, Holmes, just what did happen to the prisoner in the West Wing? Uh, and who was it? It's all disgustingly simple, my dear Watson. It was Rue Castle's daughter, as I suspected. It seems that she'd inherited some money from her mother. And when she threatened to get married and take her money with her, her father tried to get her to sign a paper giving the money to him. He worried her until she got brain fever and had to have all of her hair cut off. Well, where did you get that information? From Tara. In spite of everything, Miss Rucastle's young man stuck to her and she to him. After that, Mr. Rucastle locked his daughter up and brought Miss Hunter down from London in order to impersonate her to get rid of a persistent suitor. This young gentleman, however, was a persevering chap. Oh, good for him. Having greased Tara's palm very thoroughly, he learned the true state of affairs. And with the help of Tara and a long stepladder... He rescued his fiancée. It's really quite romantic, isn't it, Holmes? <laughs> you and your romance, Watson. You're a regular old woman. Well, I'm glad we were able to help the poor thing. But I wouldn't go back to that house again. Not for twice the salary. Oh, uh, that reminds me, Miss Hunter. I was talking to a friend of mine about you the other day. Uh, she has a private school in Walsall. I believe she said she had an opening for you. Oh, Mr. Holmes. You're not a cold-blooded fish at all. You're a darling. Uh, now, <clears throat> now, my dear, it's quite uh, inconsequential. I really, you know. It... Where do I say? Well, shut up, Watson. And what may I ask have you in store for us next week, Doctor Watson? But next week, uh, suppose I tell you the story of a curious cadaver which was found in some recently excavated Roman baths. The dead body was clothed in the tunic and toga of a Roman senator. In the last stages of decomposition, I suppose. Oh, no, not at all, Mr. Harris. The body had the appearance of having died not more than a few hours previous. of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Cadaver in the Roman Toga. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. Four leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley. Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. 
once again we find ourselves in front of Dr. Watson's crackling fire. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Harris. Just a moment till I put on a, a fresh pan. Not so our listeners can really hear it. Ah, yeah, that's the ticket. Now, uh, go ahead, Mr. Harris. Outside, a cold white autumn mist shrouds the black tree skeleton. But inside, we sit warm and cozy and ready for another of Dr. Watson's fabulous Sherlock Holmes adventures. What's it to be tonight, sir? Your conversation of white shrouds and skeletons brings to mind one of the most bizarre problems we ever undertook to solve. It came dash close to being our final problem, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Sounds promising, Doctor. Nothing I like better than hearing about Holmes in a tight spot. And whenever our adversary proved to be the notorious Professor Moriarty, it was generally a very tight spot. Professor Moriarty? Wasn't he the man Holmes referred to as the Napoleon of crime? The same. Actually, this case began when Sir George Westbrook discovered a corpse dressed in a Roman senator's toga, tunic, and sandals. Holmes always maintained he could deduce a man's entire history from his wardrobe. But uh, this time... <clears throat> Doctor... Speaking of judging people by their clothes, I thought oh, I... Bless my soul. Yes, of course. I almost forgot. Let's have a few words from our sponsor, who is also an authority on the subject of gentlemen's apparel. Uh, may I say, Dr. Watson, that most people, like Mr. Holmes, do judge people by their appearance. That's mighty important in connection with Clippercraft clothes. Because you'd never guess Clippercraft costs so little. Such low prices for such truly fine quality are rare, to say the least. Clippercraft suits are yours for only $35 and $40, with a few special numbers at $43.75. Top coats and overcoats are only $30 to $40, and sport jackets $24. These are planned values, the result of the Clippercraft plan concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores across the country, resulting in tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. Remember, all this is yours in your own local independent store where friendly attention is traditionally yours. Want to convince yourself? It's as easy as a visit to your Clippercraft dealers. Just compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, to get back to the gentleman in the Roman toga. Uh, right, Mr. Harrison. It all began on a freezing winter morning. My first view of Baker Street presented a dispiriting glimpse of icy sleet falling between the dun-colored houses. I donned my carpet slippers, my oldest trousers, and a well-worn bathrobe with the firm intent of enjoying a placid breakfast and settling myself in front of the fire for the rest of the day. I no sooner opened our sitting room door, however, when I caught sight of Holmes tramping about wearing to himself and tossing a shiny golden coin into the air. Confounded if I could only lay hands on the villain. Uh, morning, Holmes. What seems to be the difficulty today? Hmm? Difficulty? Moriarty is back in business. Only this morning, Mrs. Hudson received this coin. Here, have a look at it. Hmm, a handsome gold sovereign. Flooding the town with them. Great Scott, don't tell me, Professor Moriarty, the greatest criminal in Europe has turned philanthropist. No such luck. That coin, Watson, is counterfeit. A brilliant job, more to pity. Only an expert can spot it. No wonder Moriarty has been so quiet these last two months. It takes time to develop a coin as perfect as this. Well, at least he hasn't had time for murder, arson, or any more of his serious crimes. Serious? You think flooding the country with counterfeit coins isn't serious, Watson? Do you realize what this will do to the value of the pound? By Jove, of course. I... Uh, Holmes, that's our doorbell. Tell Mrs. Hudson I'm not at home. But Holmes... I'm not accepting any tuppenny halfpenny cases. Not while Moriarty is threatening the credit of the Empire with his fraudulent gold pieces. Uh, come in, come in. Uh, I, uh... Which of you gentlemen is Sherlock Holmes? And my friend over there has the honor. Whatever it is, I'm busy. Oh, but this is terribly, terribly important, sir. I... I don't know what to do. He, he's dead, you see. Dead men do not interest me. Uh, couldn't you uh, inform his relatives? Well, that's just it. I don't know who they are. I, I, I don't even know who he is. I, I don't even know when he died. Albert, he's my assistant, says it must have been over a thousand years ago, but that seems quite impossible. There's not the slightest sign of decomposition. Oh? On the other hand, until Albert and I broke through this morning, no one had been in that room for centuries. Uh, what room? Uh, the Roman baths. I, I discovered them, you know. The bricks are undoubtedly ancient Roman. 
Even the cadaver was clad in a senator's toga. And, and genuine, I assure you. We found him there in one corner. Now, let's get this straight. You found a fresh corpse dressed in a Roman toga in some Roman ruins that have been buried for centuries. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Watson, what are you waiting for? Bring the gentleman a chair. But uh, you said you were busy. Don't be irrelevant. This sounds interesting. Oh, uh, very well. Well, uh, won't you uh, sit here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm afraid I forgot to introduce myself. Here. here. Here's my card. Read it for me, Watson. Sir George Westbrook, President L and W A Association. That means London and Wessex Archaeological Association. Of course, of course. I remember hearing the Corporation of London had engaged you to investigate some ancient Roman remains which you discovered in the Billingsgate section. That's right, Mr. Holmes. They're under the basement of the Coal Exchange in Lower Thames Street. Albert and I have been burrowing away down there for over a month. This morning we broke through the final bit of brickwork and emerged into a large subterranean chamber. All right, Albert. I think the opening's big enough. Here, give me the lantern. I'll go through first. Yes, sir. Why, Sir George, your hand is shaking. <laughs> is it any wonder? <laughs> I'm excited, Albert. Unless I'm very much mistaken, we've unearthed some baths that were built by the early Romans. <laughs> yes, well, come along. Careful. Don't, don't tear your clothing. I say, sir, it is a biggish room, is Splendid, Albert, splendid. Look at that ceiling, will you? In almost perfect condition. Hello, what's that in the corner over there? Hmm? Looks like a heap of white cloth. No, no, the... There's a, a leg sticking out of it. Good Lord, it's a body. We'd best have a look at it, sir. Yes, but be careful. Don't don't touch it. Don't touch anything. What's that white thing he's got on? Why, it's a toga, Albert. A Roman toga. It's sopping wet, sir. If you ask me, he's been drowned. <laughs> say drowned, Sir George? That's right, Mr. Holmes. No, but that's impossible. There hasn't been any water in those baths for over a thousand years. Interesting. Very interesting. Tell me, Sir George, mm. what was the condition of the air in that chamber when you broke in? Stale? Vitiated? No, Mr. Holmes. It, uh, it was quite fresh. That's curious now that I think of it. Because there was no other entrance to the room except the one we'd come through. The doorway to the rest of the baths was filled by a, a great heap of bricks and rubble. You were unable to identify the corpse. As a matter of fact, we uh, didn't do any further investigating. Albert was quite overcome by the sight of the body. <laughs> I'm afraid he's never been very strong about such things since the time that mummy disintegrated in his arms while we were working on those pre-Hellenic excavations in Crete. Hmm. I sent him home and came straight here to consult you. You mean you left no one behind to guard the body? No, Mr. Holmes. What? Where's my hat? Where's my coat? Watson, don't just stand there. There's no time to lose. <laughs> I suppose I should have informed the authorities, Mr. Holmes, that the thought of all those stupid Scotland Yard inspectors trampling around in my beautiful ruins like a herd of elephants. I left a couple of dark lanterns burning. Oh, yes, here they are, in this packing case. All right, now, follow me, gentlemen. Why do basements have to be so damp and depressing? Careful there, careful. This is, this is where we started to dig. It's a rather rough tunnel slanting downward. We'll have to bend over, I'm afraid. You're sure that this earth won't cave in on us? No, I don't think so, unless, of course, someone should give it a tremendous push of some sort. Ah, it is where we broke through the wall. Well, you'll be interested in this, Mr. Holmes. Notice the masonry. Yes. Yes, the bricks are undoubtedly Roman. Let's see, they measure... Nine and a half inches long by four and a half inches broad, and only one and three quarter inches thick. Not unlike those of the Roman bars at Rochester. Except that there, the tiles are a mere one and a half inches thick and measure sixteen inches by twelve. Oh, really, Holmes, did we come here to discuss bricks or inspect a body? Never neglect an opportunity to increase your store of knowledge, Watson. Oh, and stuff my brain with a lot of useless tittle-tattle, not me. Here's the hole we made in the wall, Mr. Holmes. It's not very large, I'm afraid. Uh, I'll go through first and light the way. 
Now, gentlemen, if you'll follow me. I'll go next, and you can bring up the rear, Watson, with the other lantern. Now then, Watson, Alio. Don't be in such a rush. Here, take the lantern. It's a tight squeeze, you know. I... Hello, I think I'm stuck. If you'll pull his other arm, Sir George. Right. Oh, Phew, oh. glad to get out of that. I told you you should go on a diet, Watson. Oh, just because you're satisfied to look like a walking skeleton, you were... Hello, this is a gloomy-looking spot. More like a tomb than the sort of place one thinks of as an elegant Roman bathing establishment. Yes, it certainly is more like a tomb at present, complete with the remains of the deceased. Although how he was able to insinuate himself into this chamber... Yes, I... quite. A superficial survey of the walls and ceiling certainly shows no signs of any recent entry except by way of the hole through which we just dragged Watson. Interesting, very interesting. Yes, suppose we view the body we came to investigate. Yes, he's over here, Mr. Holmes, against the south wall. Oh, what, watch your step. The flooring here is a bit uneven. Here he is, exactly as we found him, lying on his face with one arm stretched over his head. Say, a uh, skinny old boy, wasn't he? I say, these robes, or whatever it is he's wearing, they are sopping wet. Yes, the poor fellow was undoubtedly drowned. Lungs still full of water. Extremities icy, rigor well advanced. Well, he's been dead six to eight hours, I should say. Well, how about it? Not necessarily. The floor he's lying on is extremely cold, also the air. Of course, the really fantastic part of the whole picture is the man's raiment. The tunic and the toga with the wide purple stripe. Even the thong sandals are the authentic garments of an early Roman senator. So I see, so I see. Whoever this person was, he was thoroughly at home among Roman customs and manners. That ring of office on his outstretched hand is undoubtedly authentic. Oh, look here, Holmes. You, you don't actually believe this is a, a genuine Roman senator who got himself drowned in this room and managed somehow to stay in this state of preservation? No, Watson. There are several obvious flaws to that theory. In the first place, although the costume is authentic in line, cut, and drape, the wooden fabric of this toga was woven not on an ancient hand loom, but by a modern machine. Second, the liquid in which the gentleman was drowned would have evaporated in a short time, even in very stale air. And third, this room is neither the frigidarium, which was the cold plunge, nor the caldarium, which was the warm. No, judging by the recessed benches built into the walls, this room was the suratorium, or what the Romans called the vapor bath. But of course, Mr. Holmes. Why didn't I think of that? But, good Lord, then, then how was he drowned? And why? Uh, suppose we turn the victim over, Sir George. His identity may give us the answer to those questions. Right, oh, easy. There. By Jove, he, he looks well, he's even more Roman from this side. That nose, those hawk like features, like some rapacious old Caesar on a Roman coin. Rather accurate and appropriate description, my dear Watson. Yes, this, unless I'm very much mistaken, is Brutus Octavius Bainbridge, the world's greatest numismatologist. You mean the coin expert? But of course. I thought the old fellow looked familiar. Well, I've heard he often wore Roman dress when he was lounging about at home. Oh, so that part of our mystery is a perfectly normal explanation. Don't be too disappointed, Sir George. There are several other little questions to be cleared up, the answers to which may be rather more exciting than you anticipate. Well, what do you mean, Holmes? Well, for one thing, Mr. Bainbridge disappeared very suddenly from his home one night a little over two months ago. About a fortnight later... The British Isles began to be flooded by an extraordinarily clever counterfeit sovereign. Thank you. I pointed out to Scotland Yard that there might possibly be a connection between the two events. You mean Mr. Bainbridge was a, a counterfeit? I mean, as the greatest living authority on coins and coinage, he was undoubtedly kidnapped by a band of unusually daring counterfeiters and forced to assist them in their work. I thought you might possibly come to that conclusion, Mr. Holmes. Great stuff. That voice. Where does it come from? Over a hidden speaking tube of some sort, I imagine. But who is it? Unless I'm very much mistaken, that voice belongs to my arch adversary. Greetings, Professor Moriarty. So now you've taken up counterfeiting. Have I destroyed so many of your activities that you're running short of funds? I've warned you repeatedly, Holmes, that you were getting to be a nuisance. Surely you must have realized how dangerous that can be. But, my dear Professor, surely you must realize that danger is the breath of life to me. <laughs> this time, home, you've overreached yourself. On the contrary, Moriarty, it's you who have gone too far. <clears throat> Watson, get Sir George out of here. I'll keep talking to give you a chance to escape. Was it necessary to kill Bainbridge after you'd finished picking his brains? Not necessary, my dear home. 
but expedient. We drowned him. I wonder if Dr. Watson can guess why. Well, guess if I can. Why not shot or strangle? I think what's all this about, Holmes? Get out of here, you idiot. But I leave you in danger, I should say not. You see, Dr. Watson, drowning would serve two purposes. It would eliminate Mr. Bainbridge. And it would provide a taste of your for Mr. Sherlock Holmes. What do you mean? I knew he'd never turn down an invitation involving a corpse in a toga or step simply drowned in an ancient Roman bath. Watson, if you have no regard to your own safety, at least have the intelligence to get Sir George out of here. I'm dashed if I understand what's going on here. <laughs> You will, Sir George, you will. Sorry to have to execute you, too, but I'm afraid you signed your own death warrant when you sent for Mr. Sherlock Holmes instead of Scotland Yard. <laughs> I rather thought you would, you know. Ah, well, this is what comes of associating with anyone who is foolish enough to think he can outwit Professor Moriarty. Look here, you old blunderbuss. You needn't think you can bully back Sherlock Holmes or me either. No. Great Scott, what's that? I rather imagine one of the good professor's hirelings has blown up the entrance to Sir George's tunnel. What do you... You mean we're, we're buried alive in this sepulchre? Mm -hmm. Just like Aida and her young man. Isn't it romantic? You might try singing yourself to death as they did. Such a waste of time, I always thought. What the pity Mr. Bainbridge won't be able to join you. You'd have made such a jolly quartet. <laughs> well, that's tall, eh, Holmes? Looks as though we're entombed in this blasted place until Sir George's assistant turns up tomorrow morning and finds the tunnel caved in. Tomorrow, my dear Watson, is Sunday, and the day after a bank holiday. Better blow out one of the lanterns and save it for later. But this is terrible, Mr. Holmes. Well, we'll, we'll be asphyxiated by the time Melbourne arrives on Tuesday. I doubt it, Sir George. There's a very definite movement of air, fresh air, icy fresh air. If you'll wet a finger and hold it up, you'll notice what amounts to a slight breeze. No, I doubt that we shall die from any lack of oxygen. We may very well perish, however, from cold and exposure. It doesn't take long to freeze to death in this temperature. Oh, we needn't be so confounded cheerful about it, Holmes. Don't interrupt, Watson. As I was saying, we may very well expire unless we can discover how Mr. Bainbridge's body was brought into this room. What good will that do? Any passageway large enough to permit the entrance of this corpse will also serve as an exit for Sir George and myself. You, Watson, may have a bit of trouble. Oh, you go to blazes. But, Mr. Holmes... What passageway could there be? As you know, the architecture of the ancient Roman baths was fairly identical. There was obviously only one doorway into this uh, bath, and that's blocked by a great fall of earth and bricks. Quite. But aren't you forgetting, Sir George, the small, unseen, tube-like passage that invariably ran under all the rooms except the cold plunge? Of course. The hypocaust. You know, what in thunder is a hypocaust? A smallish tunnel lined with red paving squares, which ran from a furnace outside the buildings under all the principal rooms of a Roman bath. If we could discover some loose tiling in this wall, we may thank the ancient Romans for inventing what our poor, retarded civilization considers a modern improvement, namely central heating. <laughs> Discouraging. I've dug up two dozen spots. Cheer up, Watson. At least the activities kept you from freezing to death. Yes, it's ruined my trousers. Good thing I was wearing my old suit. I say the light's getting dimmer. Holmes, the second lantern is about burnt out. Keep digging, Watson. It's our only chance. I say, Mr. Holmes, uh, could you come over here a minute? I think I've found a sort of grating under this last patch of bricks. Good Lord, let's see. Yes. Yes, we found it. Watson, help me with these bricks. Okay. Uh, there. Watson, bring the lantern. Right here. There they are. Now then, let's see. It's black down there, isn't it? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sir George. We are now in the vapor room. The blocked-up entrance over there leads to the hot bath. That would put the cold plunge on our left. No good going in that direction. 
When we go down into the tunnel, we should turn right to get out. Quite correct, Mr. Holmes. I'll go first. Give me the lantern, Watson. It's flickering, Holmes. It's gone out. Very well, then. We'll have to crawl our way out in the dark. I've been crawling like a snake for hours. Stop complaining, Watson. At least we're not sealed up in that boat. Now, maybe not, but I can't say this is any great improvement. Oh, I don't ask to stand upright. If I could only get to my hands and knees for a moment. There's a shallow pool of water here. How oh, jolly. If you do the bath only, I'd just as soon not have ice water, you know. Save your breath. How are you getting along, Sir George? I'll, I'll manage. Oh, what? Now what? Something went over my hand. Probably a sewer rat. Delightful. Maybe we can take it home for a pet. Quiet, Watson. I think we've reached the end of the tunnel. Yes. It opens out. You mean I can finally get up off my stomach? Yes, give your hand. Oh. I think my back is permanently bent. Hello. There's some steps here. Steps going up. And the door at the top. It's open a slit. Yeah. There's a light. Well, there must be another entrance at ground level. Yes. Follow me and be very quiet. Better have your revolver handy, Watson. This may well be the most dangerous part of the entire adventure. Easy now. Let's have a look through the crack before we open the door. It's a large, bare-looking place. Then what's all that machinery? Those are melting furnaces, presses, weighing apparatus, rolling machines. And on the far side of the acid and water baths in which Bainbridge was undoubtedly drowned. In short, you see before you a very complete mint for the coining of counterfeit money. Mr. Holmes, who's that sinister-looking man stepping out of the shadows? There, there, look. He's adjusting a jeweler's magnifying glass in one eye. Now he's... he's hunched over a pile of golden coins. Good Lord. His head oscillates from side to side like a snake. Enjoying the fruits of your labor, Moriarty? You! Holmes! You didn't expect us to return your call quite so promptly, eh, Professor? Don't bother to reach for that acid. Watson has you covered. Better put your hands up. That's right. Now, you'll come around that table. Slowly. That's right. I have a little present for you. A pair of bracelets that... Oh, he's going through the window! Shoot, Watson, shoot, confound it! I can't! Why not? Well, blast it all. You're asking me out of the house in such a jitter this morning. I forgot to slip my revolver into my overcoat pocket. <laughs> Don't look so crestfallen, Watson. I'm rather relieved we didn't get the handcuffs on the professor. Once he's safely behind bars, I'll have no opponent worthy of my talents. I should probably die of sheer boredom. You mean sheer conceit? <laughs> was quite a story, Dr. Watson. There's always plenty of action when Professor Moriarty's around. How true, Mr. Harris, how true. This particular adventure had a rather pleasant epilogue. Uh, what was that, Doctor? Oh, well, suppose I tell you about it after we pay our respects to the gentlemen who so graciously make this program possible. What could be fairer? You know, the thing you remember about clipper craft clothes is not their low prices. Not until you're ready to buy again, that is. What you really live with is clipper craft's superb styling. The perfect fit, fine tailoring, and long-wearing fabrics. No one would dream your Clippercraft suit had cost only thirty-five or forty dollars, or forty-three seventy-five for a few special numbers, or that your top coat or overcoat had cost only thirty to forty dollars, or your sport jacket twenty-four dollars. No, these exceptional values are made possible by the unique Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of nine hundred twenty-four leading stores across America bringing these fine clothes to you in a pleasant atmosphere where you get friendly, personal attention. Selling beautifully tailored, expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clippercraft clothes are... Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Presby, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, 
and the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. Now, Dr. Watson, about the epilogue to the adventure of the corpse in the Roman toga. Well, the officers of the Royal Mint tended to Holmes and myself a dinner in recognition of our invaluable services in breaking up a counterfeiting outfit which had threatened the value of British currency. Holmes received a large illuminated scroll and a, a sizable check. Always acceptable, eh, Dr. Watson? <laughs> yes, quite so. I was presented with a priceless Roman ring of office which we had found on the dead man's finger, and a magnificent copy of Vitruvius de Architectura. On the flyleaf in Holmes' handwriting was the inscription, One never knows what bit of useless tittle-tattle may save a man's life. The chapter on the hypercost was underlined. Got you that time. And now, Dr. Watson, I wonder if you'd like to give us a hint about next week's story. Well, next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes and I found a man shot under a smashed streetlight. All the evidence pointed in one direction. But the victim had been shot at point-blank range, and there was only one wound, but we heard two shots. Oh, Holmes always referred to it as the case of the well-staged murder. The makers of Clipper Craft clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft. 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Hunger and starvation are the enemies of civilization and democracy. It's up to every American, man, woman, and child, to save a little food every day. In that way, the people of Western Europe can be helped in their fight for decency and freedom. Listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the well staged murder. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clipper Craft dealer and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. From New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Once again, we find ourselves in front of Dr. Watson's crackling fire. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Harris, just a moment, till I put on a, a fresh fan, not so our listeners can really hear it. Yeah, that's the ticket. Now, uh, go ahead, Mr. Harris. Outside, a cold white autumn mist shrouds the black tree skeletons. 
But inside, we sit warm and cozy and ready for another of Dr. Watson's fabulous Sherlock Holmes adventures. What's it to be tonight, sir? Your conversation of white shrouds and skeletons brings to mind one of the most bizarre problems we ever undertook to solve. It came dash close to being our final problem, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Sounds promising, Doctor. Nothing I like better than hearing about Holmes in a tight spot. And whenever our adversary proved to be the notorious Professor Moriarty, it was generally a very tight spot. Professor Moriarty? Wasn't he the man Holmes referred to as the Napoleon of crime? The same. Actually, this case began when Sir George Westbrook discovered a corpse dressed in a Roman senator's toga, tunic, and sandals. Holmes always maintained he could deduce a man's entire history from his wardrobe. But uh, this <coughs> time... He... <coughs> Doctor... Speaking of judging people by their clothes, I oh, thought I... Bless my soul. Yes, of course. I almost forgot. Let's have a few words from our sponsor, who is also an authority on the subject of gentlemen's apparel. Uh, may I say, Dr. Watson, that most people, like Mr. Holmes, do judge people by their appearance. That's mighty important in connection with Clippercraft clothes. Because you'd never guess Clippercraft costs so little. Such low prices for such truly fine quality are rare, to say the least. Clippercraft suits are yours for only $35 and $40, with a few special numbers at $43.75. Top coats and overcoats are only $30 to $40, and sport jackets $24. These are planned values, the result of the Clipper Craft plan concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores across the country, resulting in tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. Remember, all this is yours in your own local independent store where friendly attention is traditionally yours. Want to convince yourself? It's as easy as a visit to your Clippercraft dealers. Just compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, to get back to the gentleman in the Roman toga. All oh, right, Mr. Harrison. It all began on a freezing winter morning. My first view of Baker Street presented a dispiriting glimpse of icy sleet falling between the dun-colored houses. I donned my carpet slippers, my oldest trousers, and a well-worn bathrobe with the firm intent of enjoying a placid breakfast and settling myself in front of the fire for the rest of the day. I no sooner opened our sitting room door, however, when I caught sight of Holmes tramping about wearing to himself and tossing a shiny golden coin into the air. Confounded if I could only lay hands on the villain. Uh, morning, Holmes. What seems to be the difficulty today? Hmm? Difficulty? Moriarty is back in business. Only this morning, Mrs. Hudson received this coin. Here, have a look at it. Hmm, a handsome gold sovereign. Flooding the town with them. Great Scott, don't tell me Professor Moriarty, the greatest criminal in Europe, has turned philanthropist. No such luck. That coin, Watson, is counterfeit. A brilliant job, more to pity. Only an expert can spot it. No wonder Moriarty's been so quiet these last two months. It takes time to develop a coin as perfect as this. Well, at least he hasn't had time for murder, arson, or any more of his serious crimes. Serious? You think flooding the country with counterfeit coins isn't serious, Watson? Do you realize what this will do to the value of the pound? Oh, by Jove, of course. I... Hey, Holmes, that's our doorbell. Tell Mrs. Hudson I'm not at home. But Holmes... I'm not accepting any tough any hateny cases. Not while Moriarty is threatening the credit of the Empire with his fraudulent gold pieces. Well, well, come in, come in. Uh, I, uh... Which of you gentlemen is Sherlock Holmes? Well, my friend over there has the honor. Whatever it is, I'm busy. Oh, but this is terribly, terribly important, so I... I don't know what to do. He... He's dead, you see. Dead men do not interest me. Uh, couldn't you uh, inform his relatives? Well, that's just it. I don't know who they are. I, I, I don't even know who he is. I, I don't even know when he died. Albert, he's my assistant, says it must have been over a thousand years ago, but that seems quite impossible. There's not the slightest sign of decomposition. Oh? On the other hand, and until Albert and I broke through this morning, no one had been in that room for centuries. Uh, what room? Uh, the Roman baths. I, I discovered them, you know. The bricks are undoubtedly ancient Roman. Even the cadaver was clad in a senator's toga. And, and genuine, I assure you. We found him there in one corner. Now, let's get this straight. You found a fresh corpse dressed in a Roman toga in some Roman ruins that have been buried for centuries. Yes, Mr. Holmes. 
Watson, what are you waiting for? Bring the gentleman a chair. But uh, you said you were busy. Don't be irrelevant. This sounds interesting. Oh, uh, very well. Well, uh, won't you uh, sit here, Mr... Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm afraid I forgot to introduce myself. Here. Here. Here's my card. Read it for me, Watson. Sir George Westbrook, President L and WA Association. That means London and Wessex Archaeological Association. Of course, of course. I remember hearing the Corporation of London had engaged you to investigate some ancient Roman remains which you discovered in the Billingsgate section. That's right, Mr. Holmes. They're under the basement of the Coal Exchange in Lower Thames Street. Albert and I have been burrowing the way down there for over a month. This morning we broke through the final bit of brickwork and emerged into a large subterranean chamber. All right, Albert. I think the opening's big enough. Yeah, give me the lantern. I'll go through first. Yes, sir. Why, Sir George, your hand is shaking. <laughs> is it any wonder? <laughs> I'm excited, Albert. Unless I'm very much mistaken, we've unearthed some baths that were built by the early Romans. <laughs> yes, well, come along. Careful. Don't, don't tear your clothing. I say, sir, it is a biggish room, isn't it? Splendid, Albert, splendid. Look at that ceiling, will you? In almost perfect condition. Hello, what's that in the corner over there? Hmm? Looks like a heap of white cloth. No, no, the... There's a, a leg sticking out of it. Good Lord, it's a body. We'd best have a look at it, sir. Yes, but be careful. Don't, don't touch it. Don't touch anything. What's that white thing he's got on? Why, it's a toga, Albert. A Roman toga. It's sopping wet, sir. If you ask me, he's been drowned. <laughs> You say drowned, Sir George? That's right, Mr. Holmes. No, but that's impossible. There hasn't been any water in those baths for over a thousand years. Interesting. Very interesting. Tell me, Sir George, mm. what was the condition of the air in that chamber when you broke in? Stale? Vitiated? No, Mr. Holmes. It, uh, it was quite fresh. That's curious now that I think of it. Because there was no other entrance to the room except the one we'd come through. The doorway to the rest of the baths was filled by a, a great heap of bricks and rubble. You were unable to identify the corpse. As a matter of fact, we uh, didn't do any further investigating. Albert was quite overcome by the sight of the body. <laughs> I'm afraid he's never been very strong about such things since the time that mummy disintegrated in his arms while we were working on those pre-Hellenic excavations in Crete. Hmm. I sent him home and came straight here to consult you. You mean you left no one behind to guard the body? No, Mr. Holmes. What? Where's my hat? Where's my coat? Watson, don't just stand there. There's no time to lose. I suppose I should have informed the authorities, Mr. Holmes, that the thought of all those stupid Scotland Yard inspectors trampling around in my beautiful ruins like a herd of elephants. I left a couple of dark lanterns burning. Oh, yes, here they are, in this packing case. All right, now, follow me, gentlemen. Why do basements have to be so damp and depressing? Careful there, careful. This is, this is where we started to dig. It's a rather rough tunnel slanting downward. We'll have to bend over, I'm afraid. You're sure that the, this earth won't cave in on us? No, I don't think so, unless, of course, someone should give it a tremendous push of some sort. Ah, here's where we broke through the wall. Well, you'll be interested in this, Mr. Holmes. Notice the masonry. Yes. Yes, the bricks are undoubtedly Roman. Let's see, they measure... Nine and a half inches long by four and a half inches broad and only one and three quarter inches thick. Not unlike those of the Roman bars at Rochester. Except that there the tiles are a mere one and a half inches thick and measure 16 inches by 12. Oh, really, Holmes, did we come here to discuss bricks or inspect a body? Never neglect an opportunity to increase your store of knowledge, Watson. Oh, and stuff my brain with a lot of useless tittle-tattle, not me. Here's the hole we made in the wall, Mr. Holmes. It's not very large, I'm afraid. Well... Uh, I'll go through first and light the way. Now, gentlemen, if you'll follow me... I'll go next, and you can bring up the rear, Watson, with the other lantern. Now then, Watson, alley up. Don't be in such a rush. Here, take the lantern. It's 
try to squeeze, you know. I, hello, I think I'm stuck. If you'll pull his other arm, Sir George. Right. Oh, yeah. oh. Phew, glad to get out of that. I told you you should go on a diet, Watson. Oh, just because you're satisfied to look like a walking skeleton, you were... Hello, this is a gloomy-looking spot. More like a tomb than the sort of place one thinks of as an elegant Roman bathing establishment. Yes, it certainly is more like a tomb at present, complete with the remains of the deceased. Although how he was able to insinuate himself into this chamber... Yes, I... quite. A superficial survey of the walls and ceilings certainly shows no signs of any recent entry, except by way of the hole through which we just dragged Watson. Interesting, very interesting. Yes, suppose we view the body we came to investigate. Yes, he's over here, Mr. Holmes, against the south wall. Oh, watch your step. The flooring here is a bit uneven. Here he is, exactly as we found him, lying on his face with one arm stretched over his head. Say, a uh, skinny old boy, wasn't he? I say, these robes or whatever it is he's wearing, they are sopping wet. Yes, the poor fellow was undoubtedly drowned. Lungs still full of water. Extremities icy, rigor well advanced. Well, he's been dead six to eight hours, I should say. Holmes, how about it? Not necessarily. The floor he's lying on is extremely cold, also the air. Of course, the really fantastic part of the whole picture is the man's raiment. The tunic and the toga with the wide purple stripe. Even the thong sandals are the authentic garments of an early Roman senator. So I see, so I see. Whoever this person was, he was thoroughly at home among Roman customs and manners. That ring of office on his outstretched hand is undoubtedly authentic. Oh, look here, Holmes. You, you don't actually believe this is a, a genuine Roman senator who got himself drowned in this room and managed somehow to stay in this state of preservation? No, Watson. There are several obvious flaws to that theory. In the first place, although the costume is authentic in line, cut, and drape, the wooden fabric of this toga was woven not on an ancient hand loom, but by a modern machine. Second, the liquid in which the gentleman was drowned would have evaporated in a short time, even in very stale air. And third, this room is neither the frigidarium, which was the cold plunge, nor the caldarium, which was the warm. No, judging by the recessed benches built into the walls, this room was the suratorium, or what the Romans called the vapor bath. But of course, Mr. Holmes. Why didn't I think of that? But, good Lord, then, then how was he drowned? And why? Uh, suppose we turn the victim over, Sir George. His identity may give us the answer to those questions. Righto. Easy. By Jove, he, he looks really even more Roman from this side. That nose, those hawk-like features, like some rapacious old Caesar on a Roman coin. Rather accurate and appropriate description, my dear Watson. Yes, this, unless I'm very much mistaken, is Brutus Octavius Bainbridge, the world's greatest numismatologist. You mean the coin expert? But of course... I thought the old fellow looked familiar. Well, I've heard he often wore Roman dress when he was lounging about at home. Oh, so that part of our mystery is a perfectly normal explanation. Don't be too disappointed, Sir George. There are several other little questions to be cleared up, the answers to which may be rather more exciting than you anticipate. Well, what do you mean, Holmes? Well, for one thing, Mr. Bainbridge disappeared very suddenly from his home one night a little over two months ago. About a fortnight later... The British Isles began to be flooded by an extraordinarily clever counterfeit sovereign. By Jove. I pointed out to Scotland Yard that there might possibly be a connection between the two events. You mean Mr. Bainbridge was a, a counterfeit? I mean, as the greatest living authority on coins and coinage, he was undoubtedly kidnapped by a band of unusually daring counterfeiters and forced to assist them in their work. I thought you might possibly come to that conclusion, Mr. Holmes. Great Scott, that voice. Where does it come from? Over a hidden speaking tube of some sort, I imagine. But who is it? Unless I'm very much mistaken, that voice belongs to my arch adversary. Greetings, Professor Moriarty. So now you've taken up counterfeiting. Have I destroyed so many of your activities that you're running short of funds? I've warned you repeatedly, Holmes, that you were getting to be a nuisance. Surely you must have realized how dangerous that can be. But, my dear professor, surely you must realize that danger is the breath of life to me. <laughs> this time, home, you've overreached yourself. On the contrary, Moriarty, it's you who have gone too far. <clears throat> Watson, get Sir George out of here. I'll keep talking to give you a chance to escape. Was it necessary to kill Bainbridge after you'd finished picking his brains? Not necessary, my dear home, but expedient. We drowned him. I wonder if Dr. Watson can guess why. Well, dashed if I can. 
Why not shot or strangle? I, I say, what's all this about, Holmes? Get out of here, you idiot. Well, I leave you in danger, I should say not. You see, Dr. Watson, drowning would serve two purposes. It would eliminate Mr. Bainbridge, and it would provide a taste for Mr. Sherlock Holmes. What do you mean? I knew he'd never turn down an invitation involving a corpse in a toga, ostensibly drowned in an ancient Roman bath. Watson, if you have no regard for your own safety, at least have the intelligence to get Sir George out of here. I'm dashed if I understand what's going on here. Mm -hmm. You will, Sir George, you will. Sorry to have to execute you too, but I'm afraid you signed your own death warrant when you sent for Mr. Sherlock Holmes instead of Scotland Yard. I rather thought you would, you know. Ah, well, this is what comes of associating with anyone who is foolish enough to think he can outwit Professor Moriarty. Look here, you old blunderbuss. You needn't think you can bully Rex Sherlock Holmes or me either. No. Great Scott, what's that? I rather imagine one of the good professor's hirelings has blown up the entrance to Sir George's tunnel. What are you... You mean we're, we're buried alive in this sepulchre? Mm -hmm. Just like Aida and her young man. Isn't it romantic? <laughs> you might try singing yourself to death as they did. Such a waste of time, I always thought. What a pity Mr. Bainbridge won't be able to join you. You'd have made such a jolly quartet. <laughs> That's tall, eh, Holmes? Looks as though we're entombed in this blasted place until Sir George's assistant turns up tomorrow morning and finds the tunnel caved in. Tomorrow, my dear Watson, is Sunday, and the day after, a bank holiday. Better blow out one of the lanterns and save it for later. But this is terrible, Mr. Holmes. Well, we'll, we'll be asphyxiated by the time Eldred arrives on Tuesday. I doubt it, Sir George. There's a very definite movement of air, fresh air, icy fresh air. If you'll wet a finger and hold it up, you'll notice what amounts to a slight breeze. No, I doubt that we shall die from any lack of oxygen. We may very well perish, however, from cold and exposure. It doesn't take long to freeze to death in this temperature. Oh, you needn't be so confounded cheerful about it, Holmes. Don't interrupt, Watson. As I was saying, we may very well expire unless we can discover how Mr. Bainbridge's body was brought into this room. What good will that do? Any passageway large enough to permit the entrance of this corpse will also serve as an exit for Sir George and myself. You, Watson, may have a bit of trouble. Oh, you go to blazes. But, Mr. Holmes, what passageway could there be? As you know, the architecture of the ancient Roman baths was fairly identical. There was obviously only one doorway into this bath, and that's blocked by a great fall of earth and bricks. Quite. But aren't you forgetting, Sir George, the small, unseen, tube-like passage that invariably ran under all the rooms except the coal plunge? Of course. The hypocost. Oh, what in thunder is a hypocost? A smallish tunnel lined with red paving squares, which ran from a furnace outside the buildings under all the principal rooms of a Roman bath. If we can discover some loose tiling in this floor, we may thank the ancient Romans for inventing what our poor, retarded civilization considers a modern improvement, namely central heating. <laughs> Discouraging. I've dug up two dozen spots. Cheer up, Watson. At least the activities kept you from freezing to death. Yes, it's ruined my trousers. Good thing I was wearing my old suit. I say, the light's getting dimmer. Holmes, the second lantern is about burnt out. Keep digging, Watson. It's our only chance. I say, Mr. Holmes, uh, could you come over here a minute? I think I've found a sort of grating under this last batch of bricks. Good Lord, let's see. Yes. Yes, we found it. Watson, help me with these bricks. Okay. There. Watson, bring the lantern. Right here. Here they are. Now then, let's see. It's black down there, isn't it? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sir George. We are now in the vapor room. The blocked-up entrance over there leads to the hot bath. That would put the cold plunge on our left. No good going in that direction. When we go down into the tunnel, we should turn right to get out. Quite correct, Mr. Holmes. I'll go first. Give me the lantern, Watson. It's flickering, Holmes. It's gone out. Very well, then. We'll have to crawl our way out. 
in the dark. I've been crawling like a snake for hours. Stop complaining, Watson. At least we're not sealed up in that vault. Well, maybe not, but I can't say this is any great improvement. Oh, I don't ask to stand upright. If I could only get to my hands and knees for a moment. There's a shallow pool of water here. How jolly. I could use a bath, only I'd just as soon not have ice water, you know. Save your breath. How are you getting along, Sir George? I'll, I'll manage. Oh, what? Now what? Something ran over my hand. Probably a sewer rat. Delightful. Maybe we could take it home for a pet. Quiet, Watson. I think we've reached the end of the tunnel. Yes, it opens out. You mean I can finally get up off my stomach? Yes, give your hand. Oh, I think my back is permanently bent. Hello, there are some steps here. Steps going up. And the door at the top. It's open a slit. Yeah, there's a light. Well, there must be another entrance at ground level. Yes. Follow me and be very quiet. You'd better have your revolver handy, Watson. This may well be the most dangerous part of the entire adventure. Easy now. Let's have a look through the crack before we open the door. It's a large, bare-looking place. Then what's all that machinery? Those are melting furnaces, presses, weighing apparatus, rolling machines. And on the far side of the acid and water baths in which Bainbridge was undoubtedly drowned. In short, you see before you a very complete mint for the coining of counterfeit money. Mr. Holmes, who's that sinister-looking man stepping out of the shadows? There, there, look. He's adjusting a jeweler's magnifying glass in one eye. Now he's... he's hunched over a pile of golden coins. Good Lord. His head oscillates from side to side like a snake. Enjoying the fruits of your labor, Moriarty? You! Holmes! You didn't expect us to return your call quite so promptly, eh, Professor? Don't bother to reach for that acid. Watson has you covered. Better put your hands up. That's right. Now, you'll come around that table. Slowly. That's right. I have a little present for you. A pair of bracelets that... Ah! Holmes, he's going through the window! <laughs> shoot, Watson, shoot, confound it! I can't! Why not? Well, blast it all, you're asking me out of the house in such a dither this morning I forgot to slip my revolver into my overcoat pocket. <laughs> Don't look so crestfallen, Watson. I'm rather relieved we didn't get the handcuffs on the professor. Once he's safely behind bars, I'll have no opponent worthy of my talents. I should probably die of sheer boredom. You mean sheer conceit? was quite a story, Dr. Watson. There's always plenty of action when Professor Moriarty's around. How true, Mr. Harris, how true. This particular adventure had a rather pleasant epilogue. Uh, what was that, Doctor? Oh, well, suppose I tell you about it after we pay our respects to the gentlemen who so graciously make this program possible. What hmm? could be fairer? You know, the thing you remember about Clippercraft clothes is not their low prices. Not until you're ready to buy again, that is. What you really live with is Clippercraft's superb styling. The perfect fit, fine tailoring, and long-wearing fabrics. No one would dream your Clippercraft suit had cost only thirty-five or forty dollars, or forty-three seventy-five for a few special numbers, or that your top coat or overcoat had cost only thirty to forty dollars, or your sport jacket twenty-four dollars. No, these exceptional values are made possible by the unique Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of nine hundred twenty-four leading stores across America bringing these fine clothes to you in a pleasant atmosphere where you get friendly, personal attention. Selling beautifully tailored, expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clippercraft clothes are... Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Presby, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat.
And now, Dr. Watson, about the epilogue to the adventure of the corpse in the Roman toga. The officers of the Royal Mint tendered Holmes and myself a dinner in recognition of our invaluable services in breaking up a counterfeiting outfit which had threatened the value of British currency. Holmes received a large illuminated scroll and a, a sizable check. Always acceptable, eh, Dr. Watson? <laughs> yes, quite so. I was presented with a priceless Roman ring of office, which we had found on the dead man's finger, and a magnificent copy of Vitruvius de Architectura. On the flyleaf in Holmes' handwriting was the inscription, One never knows what bit of useless tittle-tattle may save a man's life. The chapter on the hypercost was underlined. Got you that time. And now, Dr. Watson, I wonder if you'd like to give us a hint about next week's story. Well, next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes and I found a man shot under a smashed streetlight. All the evidence pointed in one direction. But the victim had been shot at point-blank range, and there was only one wound. But we heard two shots. Oh, Holmes always referred to it as the case of the well-staged murder. <laughs> Makers of Clippercraft clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Hunger and starvation are the enemies of civilization and democracy. It's up to every American, man, woman, and child, to save a little food every day. In that way, the people of Western Europe can be helped in their fight for decency and freedom. Sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the well staged murder. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast to New York, see your local Clipper Craft dealer and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. This is a mutual broadcasting system. From New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. And so tonight we make our way through a cold November rain to the cheerful firelit study of our old friend, Dr. John Watson. <laughs> you know, you know, Mr. Harris... I'm surprised and delighted to hear you mention my given name. Everyone, of course, knows that Holmes' first name is Sherlock, but to most people, I'm just Dr. Watson. To hear them talk, you might think I'd never been christened. But so draw up your chair to the fire. Feels good to get in out of the wet, Doctor. Only a Sherlock Holmes adventure could lure me out on a night like this. <laughs> That's exactly what I used to say in the old Baker Street days, Mr. Harris. Yes, it brings to mind a case that looked like a neat little murder in Tufnell Park. Too neat, as it turned out. If Holmes, the incurable skeptic, hadn't happened along at the psychological moment, the wrong man would have undoubtedly gone to the gallows and... 
<laughs> but before we become any further involved in what appeared to be mayhem and sudden death, suppose we do homage to our sponsor's excellent product. Hmm? Happy to oblige, Dr. Watson. Every man likes to trade in the leading store in his community, the store that really has its roots in the town, a store run by friendly local people you respect and who respect you. Now, the whole idea behind Clippercraft is to make it possible for you to shop at fine stores like this and get what are acknowledged to be the finest values in clothes in America. The Clippercraft plan makes it all possible, concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores across America making tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. At your Clippercraft dealers, you can buy superlatively fine Clippercraft suits at only $35 and $40, with a few special numbers at $43.75. Top coats and overcoats are only $30 to $40. Sport jackets, only $24. Clippercraft clothes are so exceptionally fine that we urge you to compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, to get back to the neat little murder in Tufnell Park. Right. As a matter of fact, Holmes and I just missed being eyewitnesses to the shooting. It was a night when the century was very young. A night very much like tonight. Rain with a bit of mist mixed in for good measure. Holmes and I were taking a slight constitutional. You mean you went walking on a night like this for pleasure, Doctor? We were out walking, Mr. Harris, to relieve the tension. It had been raining for four days... From Monday to Thursday, I doubt whether it ceased for a moment. When, for the fourth time, after pushing my chair back from the breakfast table, I saw the heavy brown swirl condensing in oily drops on the window panes, I was ready to jump out of my skin. Mm, Can't say I blame you. Holmes' nerves were, if possible, in worse shape than mine. He paced around our lamplit sitting room like a caged animal cursing under his breath in a fever of suppressed energy. Finally, as evening drew in, he proclaimed he was going out for exercise if he had to swim in the gutters. We donned caps and ulsters, and after a certain amount of acrimonious discussion, I persuaded Holmes into his overshoes and muffler. For half an hour, we strode the streets in silence. Little by little, our nerves relaxed, and our pace slackened. By the time we started across Tufnell Park, Holmes was feeling almost amiable. Nothing of interest in today's papers, I suppose, Watson? Oh, only news of the revolution, a possible war, and an impending change of government. Commonplace, my dear Watson. Yes, the London criminal is certainly a dull fellow. The thief or murderer could roam London on a night like this as the tiger does his jungle unseen till he punces, and then evident only to his victim. Well, there have been a few petty thefts. Petty thefts, pickpockets and handkerchief snatches. <laughs> the stage is set for something somber, sinister, violent. Oh, I do wish you wouldn't run on like that, Holmes, at least until we reach the other side of the park. It's, it's uncommonly dark in here tonight. Yes, I was wondering if you'd noticed that, Watson. There should be a street lamp along here somewhere. But either the lamplighter has neglected to light it or... Hello, here's the lamppost. There's glass scattered on the pavement. The light's been put out. Uh, Watson, you heard that. It it, it sounded like someone shooting. Let's be accurate, Watson. There were two gunshots. The second, I think, was particularly... Holmes, Holmes, here comes a woman. She's running along the path. She's terrified. Help! Someone, help! Pardon me, madam. Can I be of assistance? I'm Sherlock Holmes. Oh, thank heaven. You're just the man I need. It's murder. Where? Up ahead there. There's an open circular space with a fountain and a U-head all around. I was walking towards it when I saw a man rise up out of the bushes. He shot at someone sitting on a bench in front of the fountain, and then he disappeared. In which direction? I don't know. Oh, please, please see if the man's hurt. I'll get a doctor. I'll be right there. It won't be necessary. My friend here is a medical man, and judging by your cap and cape, you're not unacquainted with the medical profession yourself. No, I... Matron at the St. Pancras Infirmary. Excellent. Come with us. We may need your assistance. But shouldn't someone go for the police? We mustn't let the murderer get away. My dear Miss... Uh, Mrs. Sidney. My dear Mrs. Sidney, the first thing is to ascertain if it really is murder we're dealing with. Well, the first thing, Holmes, if you'll pardon my saying so, is to save the victim's life if we can. My dear Watson, for once I agree with you. Come along. Oh. 
Help us, Tom. I'm short. Here he is, Watson, uh, on the uh, ground beside the bench. Holmes, light some matches so I can have a look oh. at him, will you? Good Lord. It's Superintendent Jeffers. Uh, His neck. He's been shot in the neck. Yes, I'm afraid it's serious. Matron. Uh, you? Oh, I'm glad. Have them get me to the infirmary. He's right. We'll have oh. to operate. Hurry, Mrs. Sidney. Tell them to send the ambulance and a stretcher. Robert! Robert! What happened? Oh, Robert! What have they done to you? Nellie, where were you? I waited. I came oh. as quickly as I could. They wouldn't let me off duty. Nellie, never mind that. Go get help. Tell them to bring the ambulance. Oh, no, no. I want to stay with him. And what good would you be? Just a probationer? I'm the one he needs now. For the love of heaven, someone go. We've got to get the bullet out of him. He's bleeding internally. All right, I'll go. I'll go, but oh, please don't let him die. <laughs> I think she's a nurse. What does she know? What does she know about anything? Watson, any more wounds beside the one in the neck? Great Scott, no. That's enough, isn't it? But there were two shots. We heard two shots, Watson. Don't bother me now, Holmes. Can't you see I'm busy? He was sitting on the bench. The bullet entered from the front. The shot was fired from this direction. Well, that's right, Mr. Holmes. The man came out of the bushes from over there. He took two steps, and then I saw the flame spurt out of his revolver. Once or twice? Well, I, I don't... Well, oh. that is, once. I'm sure it was only once. Oh. It was... George Shortley. Oh, George McGowan. I sp spotted his cat in the dark over there. Been shadowing me all afternoon. Thought I'd shaken him off. But I wouldn't have kept the, the appointment with Nellie. I knew I was in danger. The minute I saw his cat come out of the bush. Did he say anything? Did he threaten you? No. Didn't say anything. Just shot me. What did his face look like as he came toward you? Oh, oh, oh. Leave him alone. Can't you leave him alone? That's right, sir. Don't try to talk. Save your things. Oh, oh, here comes the ambulance. Oh, thank heaven for that. Oh. It won't be long now. This way. Oh. He's in here. Oh. We brought the ambulance as close oh. as we could, but the path is much too narrow. Never mind the excuses, Nelly. Bring the stretcher over here. Yes, ma'am. Come on, there. All right. Down, George. That's right, boys, now. Easy, easy, I'll take the shoulders and the head. Oh, I brought oh, a lantern. Oh, you keep away from him. You've done enough harm already. No, no, no. Come on. Carry him to the ambulance. Careful, keep out of step. Oh, his head, you fool. You've got his head lower than his feet. Watson, when you finished operating, be sure to save me the bullet. I'm not interested in adding to your grisly souvenirs. I'm not asking for a souvenir, Watson. I'm demanding evidence. Be sure I get that bullet. <laughs> it's all my fault. I shouldn't have said I'd meet him here tonight. I knew old George had threatened Dr. Jeffers when he was released today. Who is old George, Miss Nelly? And what did he have against the superintendent? Well, nothing, really. George McGowan is just a tragic old man who drank too much and couldn't get on with his family. His daughter stood it as long as she could. And then she had him committed. I see. The first few days were pretty bad. He had DTs, you know. And he kept yelling for his revolver to protect himself. Fortunately, Dr. Jeffers had taken the gun away from him when old George arrived. That's when he first took a dislike to Dr. Jeffers. And even after he was better, he went on hating him. Is Dr. Jeffers generally disliked? Oh, no, he's wonderful. That is, well, I suppose he is strict. But you have to be if you're in charge of a place like St. Pancras. You wouldn't by any chance be prejudiced. Well, I... Perhaps I am, just a bit. It's a secret... But, uh, well, Dr. Jeffers and I are engaged to be married. Yes, I gathered as much. Tell me, Miss Nelly, does anyone else suspect this uh, attachment? Oh, no, no, I'm sure no one does. Dr. Jeffers was most particular. None of the other nurses should find out. He said it would be bad for hospital discipline. I see. Tell me, what did Dr. Jeffers do with Mr. McGowan's revolver when he took it away from him? Oh, he put it in the safe. That's what they always do with the patient's valuables when they arrive. They're handed back, of course, when the patient is discharged. You say George McGowan was discharged today? Yes, sir, at 10 o'clock this morning. Did Dr. Jeffers return his revolver? Oh, no, sir. That was what they had the row about. That and old George's cap. Hey, there you are. I've been waiting this half hour for me discharge. Well, here it is, George. And how many times do I have to tell you to take that cap off when you're in the house? I'm wearing my bonnet because I'm ready to go. Very well, then. But see you go straight home. No dropping in at any pub on the way, mind you. Eh? Well, 
What are you waiting for? For you to give me back my pistol. Don't you think you're better off without it? Uh, who's to be the judge of that? I brought it with me from Grasky. Well, you're not going to get it. If you're going to stand here arguing, take off that dirty cap. It's no dirty cap. It's my fine Scotch bonnet. It's the McGowan cotton it is. I've kept it on in the presence of better men than you be. That will do, George. You are not allowed to talk to the superintendent like that. Oh, I ain't, ain't I? Matron, you and your nurses may be daft over this doctor, but you better look out for old George. I'll get even with Mr. Superintendent Jeffers if it's the last thing I do. I begged Dr. Jeffers to be careful, but he just laughed. He said if a doctor was going to worry about all the patients that took a dislike to him, he'd better give up medicine. Oh, do you think they'll be able to save his life? Dr. Jeffers, I mean. Fortunately, my dear, Dr. Watson is a much better surgeon than he is a detective. Your friend is in good hands. Dr. Watson? Why, then... Then you must be the great Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Hadn't you guessed? Well, uh, no. I suppose I was so upset. And then the light here is so dim tonight. All I can really see is that peak cap of yours. Yes. Dr. Jeffers says it was Mr. McGowan that shot him. But I suspect all he saw in this light was a Scottish bonnet. I rather imagine that was why the street lamp was extinguished. Of course. Old George hoped to get away without being recognized at all. I wonder... What are you looking for, Mr. Holmes? Confound this rain. It's drowned my match. Well, try another. Here, I'll hold my cape over it. Thanks. Yes, that's better. No footprints on this gravel, confound it. Yes, hello. Here we are, just as I expected. Right here on the ground under the yew hedge. A trifle waterlogged, but still recognizable. Why, that's old George's cap. He must have lost it in the excitement. And look, there on the grass, Mr. Holmes. There's his revolver, too. Don't touch it, whatever you do. Don't touch it. Don't want any unnecessary fingerprints. I'll handle it with my muffler. Good thing Watson bullied me into wearing it comes in useful after all. Although what fingerprints we have are probably badly smeared. The gun has recently been discharged. Yes, only one chamber has been emptied. Interesting, very interesting. But, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Jeffers had only one wound. Quite right. Two shots were fired, however. I heard them myself. But I don't understand. I'm not sure I do either. That is not entirely... But I have a few rather definite suspicions which I shall endeavor to confirm. How will you do that, Mr. Holmes? By means of some experiments with this revolver and with a bullet Dr. Watson is even now removing from the neighborhood of your fiancé's jugular vein. Yes, suppose we get along to St. Pancras Infirmary. I'm counting on you to procure me some rather important information. Anything I can do, Mr. Holmes, anything at all. You can look through the files and get me Mr. McGowan's home address. I think a visit to his daughter is indicated. Let's see, 17 Burberry Mews. 17, yes, here we are. Dilapidated little villa. Ah, oh, well. What do you want? Miss McGowan, I presume? I wonder if I might speak to your father for a moment. No, you can't. You needn't be afraid I've come to harm him. In fact, I think if you'll let me talk to him now before the authorities arrive... Once you're too late, Holmes, you'll not be playing ducks and drakes with the law this time. Well, well, if it isn't Lestrade, the super snooper of Scotland Yard. <laughs> you can laugh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, but this is one time we don't need your assistance. I'm here to arrest George McGowan for the murder of Superintendent Jeffers of St. Pancras Infirmary. You mean to say he's dead? No, but from what the matron tells me, he will be before morning. So I've come to arrest his murderer. Don't you think you may be underrating both Dr. Watson and myself? How so? The superintendent may pull through. And it's just possible McGowan is not the man who shot him. Oh, no. Superintendent Jeffers saw him. The matron says you found McGowan's cap and revolver, a Webley six-cylinder, on the scene of the crime. What's more, I've got the bullet they took out of Jeffers' neck. Possibly. But what makes you think the bullet was fired from that particular revolver? Well, it's the right size and caliber. That's enough for me. Furthermore, the young nurse tells me you made off with the gun and the cap. I'll thank you to hand him over. So sorry, but I can't, you know. Not until I've conducted a few rather important experiments. So, obstructing the law, that's what it is. You've overstepped yourself this time, Holmes, and don't mistake. I'll have a warrant sworn out for your first thing in the morning. Aren't you forgetting the real purpose of your visit here? What's that? The apprehending of your so-called murderer, Mr. George McGowan. I don't need you to remind me of a duty. <clears throat> now then, miss, tell your father I want to see him. Immediate. Well, you can't. But why not? Because I didn't come home. And if you had the sense you're born with, you'd go and look for him lying drunk in some pub or some alehouse. 
Who would be in Texas for, I'd like to know? Why didn't they keep him in the hospital till he was cured, eh? And why don't you smart Alex mind your own business? Either both of you. <laughs> it seems Miss McGowan has put us both in the same class. Congratulations, Lestrade. You've been promoted. Uh, you go to blazes. And another thing, you bring that cap and that revolver down to the yard first thing in the morning, Holmes, or I'll see you put behind bars. You've made your little ultimatum, Lestrade, now I'll make mine. You bring that bullet they took out of Dr. Jeffers' neck around the 221B Baker Street before midnight tonight, or I'll make you the laughing stock of London. Oh, that's bluff, pure bluff. Possibly. Look here, Lestrade. I'll stake my reputation that that bullet was not fired from McGowan's gun. You can bring a warrant with the bullet. If I'm wrong, you can arrest me for trying to conceal evidence. Pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? All right, it's a deal. I'll bring the warrant and the handcuffs. All right, George, the coast's clear. You can come out from behind the rain barrel. Uh, thank you, sir. Where will you be for, for no turning me in? Don't mention it. Oh, just one thing. Tell me the truth, George. Did you shoot Superintendent Jeffers tonight in Tufnell Park? Uh, so help me, sir, I don't know. I followed him about all afternoon, but it was that wet and aurora. I had to stop in now and again for a, a wee drap, and uh, pretty soon I... I was in a bit of a fog, as you might say, so I don't rightly remember what happened. <laughs> when, I, when I come to, I was lying in the gutter with my bonnet gone and my hand here covered with blood. It could be me in blood, sir. I've got a nasty cut over my left eye. Let's hope it is your own blood, George. If it's not, we shall both then end up in jail. sense do you think you're doing? Shooting? Yes, that's obvious. I may say it was obvious the moment I turned the corner of Marybone Road. What's the idea of target practice this hour of the night? This is not target practice, Watson. You'll notice I'm shooting into a large cylinder filled with cotton wool. It's a little experiment whereby I hope to convince Inspector Lestrade that Baker Street is more sapient than Scotland Yard. Oh, that, if I'm not mistaken, is the minion of the law in person. Oh, I'll go down. Don't bother, Watson. I told Mrs. Hudson we were expecting a midnight caller. She'll let him in. Yes, 12 o'clock. Come in, Lestrade. Come in. Your promptness itself. Well, Holmes, I brought the bullet and the handcuffs. Fair enough. Now, here, take this chair here by the microscope. I'll turn the lamp up a little higher. Now, then. If you'll give Dr. Watson the bullet he extracted from Dr. Jeffers' neck and allow him to place it under the lens. All right, but no hanky-panky, mind. Oh, really? By the way, Dr. Watson, how is the victim? Did you pull him through? Well, I'm glad someone is interested. I left Dr. Jeffers resting quietly, thank you. Holmes never thought to inquire. My dear Watson, I have every confidence in your medical ability. No, what I'm really curious about is the pattern of the marks on this bullet. Pardon me while I focus the lens. Yes. Now, let's see. I thought so. I thought so. He may know what you're talking about, Dr. Watson, but I'm completely in the dark. How about you? I confess, Lestrade, I'm quite frequently in your predicament. But it's all so childishly simple. This bullet could not possibly have been fired from George McGowan's revolver. The bore patterns are entirely different. Oh, uh, what's he raving about? Here, look in the microscope while I explain in words of one syllable. I'm looking. Go ahead. Notice the pattern of lines, falls, and scratches on that bullet. Fix them well in your mind. All right, I'm doing it. A few years ago, Lestrade, I persuaded Scotland Yard to take up the science of fingerprinting. Fingerprints are now recognized as the one sure method of identification. No two sets of fingerprints can possibly be alike. Granted. I'd like to introduce you to the science of ballistics. Oh, what's that? Every gun that's capable of firing a bullet leaves on that bullet a pattern of its own. A pattern that's as individual as a man's fingerprints and as incapable of duplication. Now, Watson, if you'll dig one of the bullets fired from Mr. McGowan's Webley out of that cotton wool... All right. We'll have a look at it under the microscope. Here you are, Holmes. Lestrade, you've memorized the pattern made by the killer's revolver on the bullet. Now, have a look at this one, fired from old George's gun. Well, it's Scotch, all right. They're different. Different is night and day. Therefore, the Webley did not fire the shot that was supposed to kill the superintendent, and McGowan is not the potential killer. But look here, Holmes. You just had a look at the second bullet yourself. What made you so sure earlier this evening that McGowan wasn't guilty? Uh, for one thing, the stage was too carefully set. 
Why was the street lamp extinguished? So Jeffers couldn't really recognize the person who wore McGowan's cap. Why were both the cap and the revolver left at the scene of the crime? To incriminate old George. Fortunately for him, McGowan was the one person who couldn't possibly have fired the Webley because it was carefully locked in the hospital safe. But who could have taken it from the safe? Almost any of the officers of the hospital staff, I imagine. But how could we find out which one? By paying a return visit to the hospital, Lestrade. Whoever fired that shot will be quite chagrined to learn it wasn't fatal. I rather suspect a second attempt will be made on Dr. Jeffers' life in the very near future. Take a good long look before the mirror. If you hadn't seen that Clippercraft label, how much would you say that beautiful suit costs? Well, many, many dollars more than the figure on the price ticket. It's pretty hard to believe you can buy clothes that fit so beautifully. Such long-wearing woolens, such smart styles and superior tailoring at prices so remarkably low. Suits at only $35 and $40, with a few special numbers at $43.75. Top coats and overcoats at only $30 to $40, and sport jackets at only $24. Without the famous Clipper Craft plan, it would be impossible. It concentrates the buying power of 924 leading stores across America. Gives you the savings that result from group buying at the store you can trust. At your own local independent store. Selling beautifully tailored expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clipper Craft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clipper Craft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clipper Craft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. Watson, in which wing of the hospital have they put Dr. Jeffers? He's on the ground floor, over there to the left, where the light is burning. Good. The window's partly open. You shall be able to stand behind those bushes and see in without being observed. Come along, Lestrade. Oh, I'm coming. Quiet, you two. Here we are. We can see over the sill. Nurse has her back turned. She won't notice. Everything seems to be quiet enough. Jeff has just moved his hand. He's coming out of the ether, I imagine. Color looks good. Quiet, the door's opening. It's the matron. She's coming in with a glass of something in her hand. I brought him some warm drink, nurse. Why don't you go have your supper now? There's a kettle boiling in the pantry. I'll sit with him for a while. The nurse is leaving. The matron's smoothing out the covers. Robert. Robert. Can you hear me? He's opening his eyes. You are going to live, Robert. They saved you. I thought that. I was the one that found you. If it weren't for me, you'd have bled to death. <laughs> you were a fool to throw me over for that young nurse. Matron, life is like that. Couldn't help it. We love each other. Going to be married. Sorry. Don't worry about it. What is to be, is to be. Here, drink this. It'll make you feel better. Jeffers, go and touch that glass. You, what are you doing here? We came back to prevent your making a second attempt on Dr. Jeffers' life and to find out why you made the first. <laughs> Watson helped the stride over the sill before he strangled himself. Yes, matron, you've just given us the strongest motive that exists for murder. Jealousy. You think you're smart, Mr. Holmes. Well, you can't prove anything. You'll never find my fingerprints on any revolver. And you'll never find the revolver. Mr. Lestrade here knows you can't convict anyone without proof. I think the contents of that glass will prove you tried to murder Dr. Jeffers. Take that glass away from her, Lestrade, quick, before she can empty it. No, you don't. Good Lord. She drank it, Holmes. She drank it herself. Oh, let us 
nothing Holmes or I could do, Mr. Harris. That glass contained a very lethal dose of prussic acid. She was dead inside of two minutes. Good Lord. Tell me, Dr. Watson, when did Sherlock Holmes first suspect the matron of trying to kill Dr. Jeffers? Well, almost at once, or perhaps I should say, from the moment we entered the circle of yew hedge that surrounded the fountain. You may not know it, Mr. Harris, but a good English yew hedge is as impenetrable as a brick wall and much more impossible to scale. There was only one entrance to that circle, the one through which the matron ran practically into our arms. No one else could have passed without our seeing him. Consequently, no one else was in the circle with Dr. Jeffers when he was shot. It had to be the matron who fired the revolver, uh, who fired the two revolvers, I should say. The one to incriminate George McGowan and the other to do the job. Thank you, Dr. Watson. And now, what is in store for us for next week? Next week? Well, now, let me see. I think I'll tell you how Holmes unearthed a stolen naval treaty that threatened the peace of Europe. It involves a careless young employee of the British Foreign Office, a beautiful lady with a lamp, and a mist-shrouded garden. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the Stolen Naval Treaty. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. This is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Holmes. This is the world's largest network, serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasting systems. New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men, and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Tonight, the stars are frosty bright. No wind, no clouds, just clean, clear cold. Feels good to be sitting in front of your cozy fire, Dr. Watson, with our feet stretched on the fender. <laughs> Don't get too comfortable, Mr. Harris, because tonight I'm going to tell you about, about one of Sherlock Holmes' most important cases. The case of the stolen naval treaty. A naval treaty, Doctor? A highly explosive document. Explosive? Yes, it threatened to blow the piece of Europe into bits. And did it? Now, really, Mr. Harris, you, you mustn't get ahead of the story. And let's not forget your part in the program. Right, Dr. Watson. And my part in the program is really a very simple one. My job is to tell our listeners the great big idea behind Clipper Craft Clothes. It's just this. To bring you the finest values in clothes in America at the friendly local store you can trust. Now, naturally, this is not easy. It takes real planning. It's the remarkable Clipper Craft plan that makes it all possible. Concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores across America making tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. You've a treat in store for you if you've never seen Clippercraft clothes. Beautiful Clippercraft suits that look like twice as much money and were like it too are only $40 and 43 dollars 
Top coats and overcoats are only $40, and sport jackets only $25. They're so amazingly fine that we urge you to compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, how about that solar naval treaty? Mm, yes, uh, let's see. One July morning, it was the July which immediately succeeded my marriage, I, I received a communication from an old school friend, Percy Phelps. Percy's mother's brother was Lord Holhurst, the great conservative politician. This uh, rather gaudy relationship was of little value to him when we were at school, I can assure you. However, the letters seemed to be very urgent, so I hurried around to Baker Street. I found Holmes in his dressing gown, plunged in the middle of a chemical investigation. A large curved retort was boiling furiously in the bluish flame of a Bunsen burner. Seeing the look of concentration on Holmes' face, I seated myself in my old armchair and waited, hardly daring to breathe. Most enlightening. Most enlightening. Yes, you come at a crisis, Watson. If this slip of paper remains blue when it touches the solution, all will be well. If it turns red, it means a man's life. I, I say... Shh, don't interrupt, Watson. This is the crucial moment. Now, watch carefully. There. But I see it has burned red, a nasty blood red. Blood red is quite correct, Watson. A very commonplace murder. Well, that's the end of that little experiment. I ho fill up your pipe, then hand me the Persian slipper. All right. There you are. Hmm. So you've come on business, Watson. Yes, but uh, how did you know? The letter clutched so tightly in your right hand, not to mention the look of excitement and anxiety on your face. You are the stormy petrol of crime, eh, Watson? What is it? Well, this letter, it, it came in the morning mail. Read it to me, that's a good chap. It's from an old schoolfellow of mine. I haven't seen him for years. Yes, but what does he say? The letter is headed Briar Bray Woking. My dear Watson, I trust you still remember Tadpole Phelps, who was in the fourth form when you were in the third. You may even have heard that through my uncle's influence I obtained a good appointment at the foreign office where I was in a situation of trust until a horrible misfortune suddenly blasted my career. Do you think you could persuade your friend Sherlock Holmes to come down here to help solve this terrible mess? Assure him that the only reason I have not asked his advice sooner was because I have been completely off my head for nine weeks. I am, I am still so weak that I have to write by dictating, as you see. Your old schoolfellow, Percy Phelps. Hmm. Let me see that letter. Doesn't tell us very much, does it? Oh, hardly anything. Yet the writing is of interest. But it's not his own. Precisely. It's a woman's. But it looks like a man's. No, it's a woman's. And a woman of unusually strong character. It's always interesting to know that your client is in close contact with someone who, for good or evil, has an exceptional nature. Yes, my interest is already awakened in the matter. Then you will take the case. The next train for Woking leaves in exactly 43 minutes. Hurry, Watson, or we shall miss it. Gentlemen, I'll find out if Mr. Phelps can see you. Dear, dear. Oh, the old place hasn't changed since the days when I used to visit here on my vacations. Makes me feel quite young again. Ah, Sherlock Holmes, I perceive. And Dr. Watson, too, I presume. So glad you come. Percy's been inquiring for you all morning. Poor chap. He clings to any straw. My dear man, I may look as thin as a straw, but I promise you I have more weight mentally. I perceive you yourself are not a member of the family. Oh, dear me, how did you know? The monogram on the pocket of your blazer, J.H. Oh, of course, of course. For a moment, I thought you had done something clever. My name is Harrison, Joseph Harrison. Percy is engaged to marry my sister Annie. So I shall soon be a relation by marriage, at any rate. Uh, my sister is with him now. She's nursed him hand and foot during these trying two months. Soothing his fevered brow, eh, lucky fellow? Yes. You'll find them in his room. Uh, my room, rather. At least it, uh, it used to be my room. 
until he came home after the catastrophe and collapsed. They couldn't carry him upstairs. He was in such a state. So they took him into my room. Well, we'd better go in at once. I know how impatient he is to see you. Yes, this conversation is delightful, but after all, we did come to see Mr. Phelps. Oh, yes, yes. Quite so. Come this way. It's in this wing, the dining room, you see. This is the door. I'll leave you here. You can come in if you like. Oh, no, thank you, no. Invalids are always depressing, and with this misfortune hanging over his head... Oh, poor fellow. You will. Come in. Oh, you've cut last. At least, I presume this is Sherlock Holmes. Quite. And how is your patient? Oh, he's much better, thank you. Watson, my dear fellow. Well, Terry Badger. Hello. Hello. Glad to see you. I hardly knew you under that moustache. Del delighted to see you both. Oh, uh, this is my fiancé, Miss Harrison. Uh, please, sit down. Shall I leave, Percy? Oh, no, don't go, Annie. If you don't mind, Mr. Holmes? Not at all. I feel much steadier when she's here. Quite. And now, Miss Phelps. Well, you see, Mr. Holmes, it's like this. I was a happy and successful man on the eve of being married, and then this dreadful misfortune wrecked my life. I'm a broken man. My honor gone. I, I'm ruined. Ruined the case. Percy, please, you'll make yourself ill again. I'm sorry, Annie. Perhaps you'd better just tell us the facts as quietly as you can. Yes, of course, Mr. Holmes. I was, as Watson may have told you, in the Foreign Office, in a responsible position. My uncle, Lord Holdhurst, is the Foreign Minister, you know. Well, nearly eight years ago, uh, weeks rather, the 23rd of May to be exact, he called me into his private room and informed me that he had a commission of trust for me to execute. Come in. Come in. Oh, it's you, Percy. Anyone out there in the hall? No, sir. Good. Come in and lock the door. Now, come over here. I want to make sure we can't be overheard. That's it. What's up, Uncle Bert? You look tremendously solemn. It's a solemn matter, Percy. You see this piece of paper? It's a secret treaty covering our naval situation in the Mediterranean. Harmless enough in itself, but a bombshell if it should fall into the hands of, well, a certain government. What do you mean? The very wars may have ears, Percy. Let us merely say the country of X. You understand? I understand. I want you to make a copy of it. I must have a complete copy by tomorrow morning. You may have to work on it the better part of the night. Oh, that's all right, sir. Uh, uh, Joseph and his brother, you know, is going to stop by for me. We're going to take the nine o'clock train together. He can tell the family I've been kept in town on business. Very well. But leave the message with the commissioner downstairs. I don't want anyone in your room when you're copying that document. Very good, sir. When you've finished, you can put the document and the copy in my safe. You know the combination, I believe? Certainly. That's all, Percy. But don't forget, you hold the piece of Europe in your hands. I won't yet. Good night, Uncle Bert. Good night. Well, looks as though I'll have to make a night of it. <clears throat> I hope. <clears throat> what? Hello, Gorno. You still here? Oh, yes, sir. I had some details to clear up, so I thought you'd want me to stay. Oh, that's uh, all right, Gorno. You can finish tomorrow. Yes, sir. Are you sure you won't need me? No, thanks. Well, doesn't look as though I have a chance to go out for dinner. At least I can ring for coffee. Oh, confounded, that bell pull is twisted again. Ah, there we are. The rain's coming down harder than ever. Nice, jolly little evening, sister. Uh, you're sure there's nothing I can do, Mr. Phelps? Good Lord, no, Gotta Run along. Good night, sir. Good night, Gotta. Thunder, are you? I'm the commissioner's wife, sir. What's more, I'm the char lady around here. The char lady? Oh, I see. I, I don't believe I've ever had the pleasure of making your acquaintance before. No, sir, that you haven't. If you mean what I think you do. Oh, would you inquire if your esteemed spouse would spare me a, a cup of the excellent coffee he keeps hot for any pay slaves of the empire who are obliged to work at night? You mean Herbie should bring you up a cup of coffee? Yes, please. I'll see what I can do about it. Yes, use your influence. Well, now, let's have a look at that treaty. 
Great Britain, a triple alliance. Yes. French fleet, a complete ascendancy. I'm too drowsy. Oh, you think I better have a cup of coffee? Herbert! I say, Herbert! Coffee! Oh, just found the fellow. Do I have to go all the way downstairs? Herbert! Mm hmm. Fast asleep. Hey, Herbert! Wake up! Hello, hello! Oh, it's you, Mr. Phelps. Yes. I came down to see if my coffee was ready. But I think the front doorbell just rang. Bell? Yes, sir. But if you was here, who rang that bell? What bell? I told you it was the... It's the bell of the room you was working in, sir. Great thunder. My bell? There's no one up there. The treaty. Oh, good heavens, I left it on the table. Quick, Herbert. We've got to get up there. Something terrible is happening. What? Oh, no, don't run so fast. Pray God, it's too late. Oh, wait, I'll open the door. Stand back, Herbert. Uh, you may be armed. I've got my army revolver. What? There's no one here. What? Oh, look, the treaty. The treaty's gone. Who could have taken it? No one's been in the front way tonight. And there was no one in the rooms but yourself. My wife says so. Then he must have come up the stairs from the side door and slipped out that way, too. After him, Herbert, quickly. Uh, it may not be too late. Hurry, man, hurry. Don't you go out, sir. You'll be, you'll be soaked to the skin. Uh, there's a policeman on the corner. Maybe seen something. I say, Bobby. Yes, sir. There's no robbery in the foreign office. Has anyone passed this way? It's standing here a quarter of an hour, sir, and only one living soul's passed in that time. Who was it? A tall old lady in a paisley shawl. She seemed in a hurry. Well, that was my wife. Which way did she go? You're just wasting your time, sir, and every minute is of importance. Yes, all right. We'll go back home in Scotland Yard. Oh, this is terrible, Herbert, terrible. We're ruined. Ah, never you mind, sir. You'll lose your post, perhaps. But they can't do nothing so dreadful to you. It's not myself I'm thinking of. It's England. <laughs> Officers from Scotland Yard were waiting for the charwoman when she got home. And what did they find? Nothing, absolutely nothing. And Goro, did they trace him? He had Mr. Holmes, but again nothing was found. Oh, I, I was frantic, out of my mind. They had to get a doctor to take me home. I was delirious for some weeks. And these two people, Goro and the charwoman, they've been under observation ever since, I suppose? Yes, with no results. You say it had been raining all evening? Yes. But you found no traces of any kind in the room? No footprints, I mean? Absolutely none. Not even those of the charwoman's muddy boots? How do you explain that? Well, the, the charwoman in the habit of taking off their boots and wearing just carpet slippers. No footprints, eh? That's enlightening. Must have come in a cab and got away that way, too. Well, that explains the policeman's not seeing him. Now then, Mr. Phelps, could anyone have been concealed in the room or a corridor? Impossible. There was, there was no cover of any kind. Windows? Thirty feet above the ground, locked on the inside. And it must have been the side door. Who knew you were to have the treaty in your possession? No one. I, I'd stake my oath on that. In your opinion, what would happen if those papers were to fall into the hands of a rival government? War. Almost instantaneously. But it's eight weeks and we're not at war. Therefore, it's not unfair to suppose the treaty hasn't reached them. I don't imagine the thief took the treaty in order to frame it. Quite, and he's undoubtedly waiting for a better price. There's only one clue that puzzles me. What is that? Bell. Did someone need to prevent the crime, or was it an accident? If we only knew why the bell was rung, we should have the solution of this case. It's even possible that he didn't. Ha, ha, of course, of course. What a fool I was not to think of that before. You, you think you can help me? Possibly, possibly. God bless you for that, Mr. Holmes. If we can keep our courage and our patience, the truth must come out. But Percy has one more adventure to tell you about. You're sure you're strong enough, darling? Oh, I feel better than I have for days. Hope is a splendid tonic, Annie. And what was this other incident, Mr. Phelps? Well, you see, Mr. Holmes, uh, last night was the very first night I've slept for a nurse in my rooms. I was rather wakeful. I had a nightmare or two. And suddenly, I, I heard a slight noise. What kind of noise? Like a mouse gnawing a plank. It grew louder. And 
All at once, there was a sharp metallic snick. Someone forcing the window. Yes, I realized that, too. I jumped out of bed and flung open the shutters. A man was crouching in the window. He was gone like a flash. What did he look like? I don't really know. He was wrapped in some sort of cloak which came across the lower part of his face. Oh, uh, one thing I am sure of. He had a long weapon in his hand. It looked like a knife. I saw the gleam of it as he turned to run. I shouted after him. And then? Then I must have collapsed from the effort. The next thing I knew, I was surrounded by the entire household. Oh, uh, Joseph and the groom found marks in the flower bed outside this window. You can see them from where you sit. Hear me, yes. I'm afraid Joseph and the groom have been a bit too energetic for me to learn anything from the traces. The flower bed looks as if it had been trampled on by an army. Oh, I'm sorry. Why should a burglar, if it was a burglar, choose to enter this room? The dining room windows are much larger and more accessible. I can't imagine unless... Well, unless it's a plot against Percy. Oh, that sounds a bit melodramatic, Annie. Not at all. There's something in what Miss Harrison says. So much that Dr. Watson and I are going to take you up to London with us. Yes, but he's not very strong, you know. The trip to London will not be nearly so dangerous to your fiancé, Miss Harrison, as another night in this room. Good heavens. And another thing, Miss Harrison, you can be very helpful to us and to Mr. Help, uh, Mr. Phelps if you'll do one thing for me. It may take courage, but I think I can promise that you'll be in no great personal danger. What is it you want me to do? Stay in this room until you go to bed tonight. Don't leave it for an instant. Mr. Phelps' reputation and my whole future may depend on it. I'm not going to ask you to sleep here, but when you leave for the night, I want you to lock the bedroom door on the outside. Yes, but look here. Something might happen. Shh. Not a word to anyone. It's for his sake, remember. Come in. Lunch, everybody. Something especially nice for you, Cassie. Come along, Annie. Oh, oh Joseph, if, if you'll excuse me, I, I have a slight headache. I, I think I'll eat in here by myself. There's breeze and I, I, I want to be alone. I can't say I enjoy country walks in the middle of the night, Watson. I thought we were going back to London. That's what you told everybody. We get on the train with Percy and the nurse, and then we get off at the next station and leave Percy and the nurse to go up to London alone. It doesn't make sense. Stop fussing. He'll be all right. I sent him on to Baker Street. With any luck, we should be there ourselves in time to have breakfast with him. Yes, but why sneak back to Briar Bray like this? Shh, not so loud. There's the house now. You can see its gables in the moonlight. Follow me here, through the hedge. Yes, but why the hedge when the gate's open? Not so loud. We've got to get as near to the house as possible without being seen. I say there's quite a mist rising. Ghostly-looking white strips of it over there in the meadow. I say, look. The lamp is still lit in person. Uh, I mean, in Joseph's room. Miss Harrison must have kept her promise. Shh. Yes. There she is, reading a book. Now she's put it down. She's picking up the lamp. I say, Holmes. She must be getting ready to go to bed. Quite possibly, Watson. I only hope she doesn't forget to lock the door on the outside. There she goes, to the dining room. Now the light's gone. I say, the mist are creeping up from the meadow, Shh. aren't they? If only the thief doesn't wait until they blanket the house. Look. The service door is opening. Excellent. I didn't think he'd wait very long. Here he comes out into the moonlight. He's wearing a long black cape. You can't see his face. He's forcing the window. He's got it open. He's climbing over the sill. We must get closer so we can see. I see his lighted candles on the mantel. Look, he's pulling back the rug. In the floor, I thought so. He's lifting up a board. Now, Mr. Joseph Harrison, <clears throat> be good enough to hand over papers you've just removed from that hiding place. Look out, Holmes, he's got a knife. <laughs> to see Clippercraft clothes to know their excellence, and it's easy enough to see them right at your own local independent store. You have to see them because such superlatively fine quality, sold at such low prices, amazes even the experts. Suits are only $40 and $43.75. 
top coats and overcoats are only $40, and sport jackets only $25. The fit is beautiful, the woolens are long-wearing, the tailoring is really superb. The famous Clipcraft plan makes this sheer magic possible, concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores across the nation, giving you the savings from this group buying at the store you trust. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clippercraft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. Let's return to 221B Baker Street, where Percy Phipps is anxiously awaiting the arrival of Sherlock Holmes. But it's almost nine now, Mrs. Hudson, and Holmes said they're here for breakfast at nine. Now, don't you worry, Mr. Phelps. If he says he'll be here for breakfast, he'll be here. It's when he don't say. That's when you don't know whether it'll be breakfast or supper he'll be wanting next. What did I tell you? Here they are now, driving up in Aunt's cab. There's the front door, and it's nine to the second. Good morning, Mrs. Hudson. Good morning, sir. Fist is on the table, biting hot. But I say, Holmes, you've been wounded. Your hand's all tied up. Just a scratch. Hmm, breakfast. Three covered dishes, splendid. And plenty of steaming coffee. Excellent. Did you... Uh, I mean... Come, 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 come. Business can wait until after breakfast. You look as if you needed a bit of nourishment, Mr. Phelps. Well, I, I'm really not very hungry. Well, we are, aren't we, Watson? I'm ravenous. Aha. What's this? Mmm, curried chicken. And, uh, this? Ham and eggs. Better and better. Uh, which will you take, Mr. Phelps? Uh, thank you. I, I couldn't touch a thing. Oh, come. Try the dish before you. Uh, I'd rather not, really. Well, then, I suppose you have no objection to helping me. Let's see what that dish contains. Certainly. What? It's papers. It's the Naval Retreat. The Naval... Oh, God bless you, Mr. Holmes. God bless you. You saved me and you've saved England. Don't mention it, my dear chap. Don't mention it. When did Holmes first begin to suspect this Harrison fellow, Dr. Watson? We heard that Percy was expecting him to stop by for him, Mr. Harris. I'm afraid uh, Joseph's character was blacker than one would judge from his appearance. We learned later that he had lost heavily in dabbling in stocks. And he thought he could turn the treaty into money. Yes. Besides, no one but Joseph could be so anxious to get into that bedroom because no one but Joseph could have concealed anything there. Also, the attempt was made the first night the nurse was out of the way. Therefore, the intruder was well acquainted with the house. But the bell, Dr. Watson, why was that so significant? Well, Mr. Harris, it showed that the thief uh, had not come there to Percy's office to steal the papers. He, he came for another reason, by appointment, as we know. He rang the bell and then happened to see the papers. Uh, Dr. Watson, was he convicted? No, the case was never brought to court. It would have been a too tillish a position for the foreign office. He was advised, however, to get out of the country and stay out. And did Percy marry the sister doctor? He did. And to this day, I don't believe she knows why her brother never returns to England. Why, that was an exciting case, Dr. Watson. And now, what story are we to have next week? Well, uh, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell, uh, tell about the Cornish horror, or the cradle that rocked itself. The cradle that rocked itself? Yes, Mr. Harris, the, the rocking cradle was supposed to indicate that someone in Trevining household was about to die. As a matter of fact, there were two deaths and another that Holmes... 
Well, suppose I leave that till next week, eh? The makers of Clippercraft clothes and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in case of the cradle that rocked itself. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. Hi, <laughs> Harris speaking for Clippercraft Holmes. This is the world's largest network, serving more than 450 radio stations, the mutual broadcasting system. of Clippercraft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley. Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Well, here we are again in front of Dr. Watson's cheerful fireplace, ready for another story about the fabulous Mr. Sherlock Holmes. What's it to be tonight, Dr. Watson? Personally, I always refer to tonight's adventure as the Cornish horror, or the case of the cradle that rocked itself. The cradle that rocked itself? Why, that sounds fairly fantastic, Dr. Watson. Not only fantastic, Mr. Harris... Sinister. But before we become further involved in the exceptional events that occurred on the Cornish Peninsula, suppose you tell us of something exceptional that goes on all the time in the United States. I allude, of course, to the Clippercraft plan. With a great deal of pleasure, Dr. Watson. The Clippercraft plan really is something exceptional, and it goes on in the hometown of every man listening in. As a matter of fact, the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan is to give you the finest clothes at prices far less than you expect to pay. At your own local independent store. At the store you can trust. Now, here's how it works. The remarkable Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 924 leading stores across America, making tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. It passes on those savings to you. That's why you can buy beautifully tailored Clippercraft suits that look like twice the money at only $40 and $45. Top coats and overcoats are only $40. The values are so amazingly outstanding that we urge you to compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now to return to Cornwall. What were you and Sherlock Holmes doing down there, Dr. Watson? Recuperating. Holmes had spent a particularly active autumn solving three dangerous and exhausting cases in rapid succession. And a vacation was indicated. I had visions of basking in the south of France or sunny Italy. But not Holmes. He elected to return to the small cottage near Paul du Bay, which we had occupied once before. Uh, during the adventure of the Devil's Foot, if I'm not mistaken, Doctor. Right. Now, the bays and inlets of the Cornish Peninsula are green and sheltering in the sunny, sunny summer weather. But in December, the blustering gales whip the surge, swept reefs and black and sinister cliffs. Well, one particularly violent morning, Holmes and I were ensconced on either side of the fireplace. Holmes was engrossed in a consignment of books on philology, which had just arrived from London.
Watson, has it ever occurred to you that the ancient Cornish language is akin to the Chaldean? Well, inasmuch as I understand neither Cornish nor Chaldean, I can't say it has. It's quite logical, you know. These shores were undoubtedly visited by early Phoenician traders in tin. In fact, many historians believe that the pirates who later operated from this coast had more than their share of the old Phoenician heritage. The find is reputable background for any district. Profitable is the word, Watson. Hello, who's this fighting his way up the path in the teeth of the gale? Ooh, looks like your rotund friend and fellow archaeologist, Mr. Roundhay, the vicar. I wonder what's occurred to bring the good dominie out in this weather. I'd sooner expect to see a cat go swimming in a mill race. Well, don't let him stand there in the wet. Well, I'm going, I'm going... But you couldn't answer the door now and then. Why, Mr. Roundhead, delighted to see you, old man. Come in, come in. You, you, you look half drowned. Not half, entirely. Totally and entirely soaked to the skin. Morning, Roundhead. How about a spot of hot grog with the tea kettles boiling on the hearth? Watson, fix the vicar a drink. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I, I'm afraid I need it as much for my nerves as I do for the chill, you know. Oh? Yes, Mr. Holmes. I have a problem, a, a rather serious problem, and... I really don't know whether to come to Dr. Watson for help or to you. Well, why not consult both of us? Uh, It's not the first time we've collaborated on a case, eh, Holmes? Quiet, Watson, don't interrupt. Uh, Just what is your problem, Mr. Roundhead? Well, it seems that the cradle at Trevining Water has been rocking again. Is that so unusual? You don't understand, Mr. Holmes. That cradle has been in the family for over five centuries. All the young Trevinings are placed in it at birth. It hasn't been used, however, since Wilfrida Trevining, the present Mrs. Gregory, was a child. In fact, the nursery has been kept locked ever since old Matty, the Trevining nurse, was sent off to the home for indigent females at Red Roof three months ago. Uh, she'd been in the family for nearly 60 years, you see. Well, seems rather heartless to get rid of her, eh, Holmes? My thought exactly. But Mortimer Gregory, he's the one who is married to Wilfrida Trevining, was quite determined about the matter. He said that old Matty was making his wife quite ill with her talk about the rocking cradle. What sort of talk? Well, you see, that there's a sort of legend in the Trevining family that when one of them is about to die, the cradle starts to rock all by itself. Mm, nice, eerie little superstition, eh, Holmes? As a matter of fact, the cradle had been heard rocking once or twice, but, but inasmuch as old Matty was still sleeping in the nursery, the family took it as a rather a grim, practical joke, all except Wilfrida. She became quite ill and upset. At which point her husband, who, who has a violent temper, s- said the old nurse had to go. Dr. Dennis Trevining, who is Wilfrida's cousin and physician as well, was ag- inclined to agree with him. So they sent for a nurse from Mr. Ives Hospital to take over. On the day that she arrived, I was summoned to drive Matty to the old lady's home in Redruth. I-, I can't say I look forward to the event. Were your fears justified? Completely justified, Mr. Holmes. When I arrived at Trevining Water, the old woman was sitting on her boxes just inside the front door. Mr. Gregory and Dr. Trevining were endeavouring to quiet her catawall. Calls herself a nurse, does she? What does she know about bringing babies into the world? I've given three generations of Trevinings the whack that drove the breath of life into their bodies. <laughs> After all, Matty, I am a doctor. When Wilfrida's baby arrives, I expect to be on hand too, you know. You a doctor? <laughs> I wouldn't trust you to treat my Timothy here. Hey, Timmy. Timmy agrees with me. He may be a cat, but he knows as much about what's going on around here as I do. That'll do. that's plenty. Matty, that'll do. You've made enough trouble already. You've upset my wife so that she's had to take to her bed. Me upset, Miss Wilfrida. My Miss Willie, that I taught to walk and play patty cake and eat a porridge like a good girl. It's not me that's made her sick. And what's more, if any harm comes to her, I'll put a curse on this house. Though there's ten miles of moorland between here and Red Roof, I'll come back and rock the cradle somehow. And you know what that means? Well, Mr. Holmes, I felt sorry for Matty, of course, but I... I must say I saw Mr. Gregory and Dr. Devining's point. A screaming old crone like that isn't the most soothing influence around a house in which there is an expectant mother. Quite. Uh, Tell me, Vicar, is this Mrs. Gregory, the former Wilfrida Trevining, easily upset by these these family superstitions about rocking cradles and the like? I really couldn't say, Mr. Holmes. Wilfrida was always a delicate girl. Uh, She was an only child, you see, and the one heir to that branch of the family. Significant, eh, Holmes? 
I suppose she inherited quite a tidy estate. She did indeed, Dr. Watson. Her father would have disinherited her if he could when she ran off with that Gregory chap. But the estate is entailed, and uh, I must say the marriage turned out better than most of us expected. Then you don't think Mortimer Gregory married her for her money? Uh, not necessarily, Mr. Holmes. Gregory was an artist who came to these parts one summer to do a bit of sketching. And naturally, the Trevinings thought he was one of those uh, near-do-will bohemians. But it seems he's rather famous and sells his pictures for quite handsome prices. I see. I take it the girl and her father reconciled. Yes, Mr. Holmes. When he heard that she was to have a child, he sent for her. Although the child will bear the name Gregory, he will inherit the Trevining estate. The Trevinings are always born a Trevining water, needless to say. Any other arrangement would be unthinkable. Oh, quite. Uh, Wilfrida Gregory and her new husband came back as soon as possible after receiving her father's letter asking for reconciliation. One week after the return, old Mr. Trevining was dead, and Wilfrida had inherited the estates. I take it her father's death was sudden and unexpected. Oh, quite unexpected, Mr. Holmes. He'd been as fit as a fiddle up to Wednesday night. Thursday, shortly after his mid-afternoon whiskey and soda, he, he complained that his uh, mouth and throat felt sore. Half an hour later, vomiting set in, followed by violent cramps and uh, general collapse. Did no one send for a doctor? Mr. Trevining's nephew, Dr. Dennis Trevining, was in the house at the time. There was, of course, an autopsy and an inquest. Good heavens, no, Mr. Holmes, whatever for. Mr. Trevining had been subject for some years to violent gastro-digestive upsets. It was all perfectly unavoidable and natural. An autopsy is always indicated in any case of sudden death, Mr. Ronte. But, but, but what good would it do? It might just possibly prevent another fatality. Just when did Mrs. Gregory's health begin to fail? Her father's death was a shock to her. She took to her bed for about a week after the funeral. It was quite understandable, eh, Holmes? Don't interrupt, Watson. After that, she was up and about for a month or two, but uh, her color was bad, and she seemed to be decidedly nervous. Like a good many women in the early stages of her condition, she experienced a certain amount of uh, nausea. Has that nausea persisted? It has, Mr. Holmes, and when old Matty began to rant on about the rocking cradle, Mrs. Gregory became thoroughly alarmed and well, had to be put to bed. Did her condition improve, Mr. Rondhay, after they got rid of the old woman? For a time, she seemed greatly improved. She was up and about for nearly a month, and week before last, she suffered a rather frightening relapse and has been in bed ever since. I see. How soon is her baby due to be born? Oh, in about a fortnight, I believe. Has Dr. Trevining called in any outside medical opinion? No, Mr. Holmes, but that's not too incredible when you realize how removed we are from civilization. Possibly if they knew that Dr. Watson was here in the vicinity. The, the, the new nurse made that suggestion to Dr. Trevining, but both he and Mr. Gregory were decidedly hostile to the idea. The nurse is, I may say, rather badly frightened. Today was her day off, and she dropped in at the vicarage shortly after breakfast. She admitted she had never been so terrified in her entire life living there in the old Trevining house, part keep, part castle, but she said she wasn't the only one. No? Poor Mrs. Gregory lies there, stiff with terror, with her eyes fixed on the ceiling, waiting for it to begin. The sound of the cradle rocking. Getting dark. Light the lamp. Very well, Mrs. Gregory. Uh, that's better. When I was a child, I was afraid of the dark, and now it's all come back to me. I dread the coming of night. When one's sick, that's only natural. The nights are so long, I always think. Uh, it's not badness. When night comes, it, it begins. The rocking of the cradle. I lie here, watching for it. Yes. Listen. I don't hear anything, Mrs. Gregory. Oh, if only I could be sure my baby's born before I die. It, it's so terribly important, Miss. But you're not going to die, Mrs. Gregory. <laughs> yes, I am. That's why the cradle's rocking. And listen. There it goes. Rock. Rock. like delirium, eh, Holmes? A cradle that is heard only by a desperately sick woman? But you don't understand, Dr. Watson. Mrs. Gregory isn't the only one who hears the cradle rocket. The nurse can hear it, too. The nursery at Trevining Water is directly over the master bedroom, and that rocking cradle can be heard several times a night. But only intermittently. That's right, Mr. Holmes. And never in the daytime? No, always after dark. 
Uh, Miss Henderson, the nurse, says it's having a, a dreadful effect on Mrs. Gregory. She's in a state of great exhaustion. In the last few days, the nurse has also noticed a, a local pustular eruption. Um, that could be induced by the nervous strain, I suppose. Not necessarily. Yes, I think Dr. Watson and I had better pay a visit to Trevining Water shortly after dark today. I trust we can persuade her family to allow Dr. Watson to have a look at Mrs. Gregory, and I think I can suggest what he's to look for. As for myself, I'm more interested in what causes that cradle to rock. Did you have to drag us out in this beastly weather, Holmes? Besides, it's all so dashed irregular, contrary to medical ethics and all that, you know. After all, I haven't been called in by either the doctor on the case, nor the family. Huh. You doctors and your confounded medical ethics. I suppose you've let the poor woman die just because you haven't been properly introduced. This is where we turn in, Mr. Holmes. Notice the trevining coat of arms over the gate? Aha. Very significant, Mr. Roundhead. Oh, what's so significant about it? I could hardly see the blasted thing in this fading light. For one thing, the trevinings have the bar sinister. For another, that was the Jolly Roger up in the upper right-hand quarter. That's right, Mr. Holmes. The Trevinings have more than their share of pirate ancestors. They, they boast of the fact, you know. Well, here we are. This is Trevining Water. Frightening-looking old pile, eh, Holmes? You bet. Wait for us here, Jonathan. Right. We may be leaving in rather a hurry. Give the bell a pull, Watson. Uh, no, wait. I, I sent word to Miss Henderson to be on the lookout for us. Ah, Miss Henderson, I, I thought you'd be watching for us. This is Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Come in, please. I'm so glad you've both come. Both. Mrs. Gregory was having a particularly bad spell when I returned this afternoon. Have you told Mrs. Gregory's husband and her doctor that you expected us? No, Mr. Holmes. Fortunately, there was no opportunity. The doctor was called out on a confinement case an hour or so ago, and Mr. Gregory has had to go to St. Ives for the assizes. He shouldn't be back until after supper. Excellent. You will take Dr. Watson to see Mrs. Gregory immediately. Mr. Roundhay knows the house well enough to direct me to the nursery, I gather. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Top floor, second right. I'm afraid the door is kept locked, Mr. Holmes. My dear young lady, it takes more than a locked door to stop Sherlock Holmes. Come along, Vicar. Here we are. It's the next door. It's locked right enough. Then there's nothing we can do. On the contrary, I have a very neat little jemmy that I acquired when I was instrumental in apprehending a certain famous cat burglar. Hmm. Quite a breeze coming through the keyhole. You mean you're going to pick the lock? It may take a moment or so. Well, I, I do hope no one comes and catches us at it. I, I, I don't know what my flock would say. Mr. Holmes, did you hear that? There it is again. It's, it's inside the nursery. Yes. Yes, it's the cradle right enough. But it's rocking. It's, it's rocking in there all by itself. It, it's not just a superstition. Confound it. This lock must be rusty. No, here it comes. Blasted. Did it have to make that noise? Easy now. I need to open the door. It's so dark in there. Give me the candle. I'm going in. But the room is empty. Completely empty. But look here, the cradle is still rocking. And feel the mattress. It's still warm. But look, good Lord, what was that? The branch of a tree scraping against the window. Yes, it's broken one of the small five-inch square panes of glass, and that explains where the draft came from. It also explains something else. Yes, interesting. Very interesting. Who let you in this room? Ah, Mr. Gregory, no doubt. I am Sherlock Holmes. What in blazes do you think you're doing here? Trying to solve the mystery of the rocking cradle. Rotten rubbish! Old wives' tales. I'll not have my wife upset by any more of that nonsense. You misjudge us, Mr. Gregory. We only want to save your wife and possibly your child. I don't need your help. Get out, both of you. Get out! With pleasure. I imagine Watson's had time to give the nurse full instructions, and we've seen all there is to see up here. Come on, Ron Hay. We're now right over to Red Roof. The final piece to this puzzle is doubtless to be found in the old lady's home. <laughs> you you mean you're, you're going to question Matty? I trust you have no objections, Mr. Gregory. Uh, objections? No, go ahead. You'll get nothing from her. Nothing at all. <laughs> Mr. 
so kind of you to see us, Matron, particularly this late in the evening. It is well after our visiting hours, Mr. Round. But when they told me it was the vicar of Tredanic Wallace, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I'll admit my curiosity got the best of me. But you gentlemen must be congealed. May I offer you a cup of tea? Uh, thank you, Matron, but we've no time for social amenities. Our night's work has only just begun. So, if you'll allow us to have a few words with one of your inmates, uh, Miss Matty, what's her other name, Vicar? Bless my soul, I don't know. But she was nurse in the Trevining household for many years. She, she came here to the home three months ago. Oh, you mean Matty Fennelly, Ah, Of course, of course. Well, I'm afraid you can't see Matty, gentlemen. Why not? Is anything wrong with her? Is she ill? No, Mr. Holmes. Matty Fennelly died six weeks ago. Died? Yes, Mr. Holmes. But why wasn't I told? Why wasn't her body brought back to us for proper burial? Oh, I understand her family didn't want Mrs. Gregory to know. They were afraid the shock of Maddie's death would upset her. Quite. Matron, how did the old woman die? Had she been sick long? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. She'd had a very good day. Mrs. Gregory had driven over from Tredanic to have tea with her. She brought a pancake for Maddie. Pancake was her favorite, it seems. How soon after Mrs. Gregory left was Maddie taken ill? Not to the middle of the night. Seems she sneaked the rest of the pound cake off to bed with her and had eaten it after the lights were put out. Well, people and children frequently make pigs of themselves, I'm afraid. We sent for Dr. Dennis Trevining at once. He lives halfway between Redruth and Tredanic Wallace. He was here inside of an hour. She seemed to get better when she saw him. Shortly thereafter, she had another attack, which ended in a complete collapse. Oh, this is an exasperating case, eh, Holmes? One blind alley after another, old Matty turning up dead... Slams the final door in our face. On the contrary, we may very well find out more from Matty dead than we would if she were alive. But where will you go to question her, Mr. Holmes? To the graveyard, of course. Where is she buried, Matron? In the churchyard at St. Stephen's. It's on the cliffs at the other side of the town. I don't suppose you could supply us with a couple of shovels, Matron. Oh, Holmes, you're not thinking of exhuming the body at this hour of the night. Why not? Just one more question, Matron. What happened to Matty's cat after her death? Timothy? Yes. Oh, he disappeared shortly after the funeral. No one knows what happened to him, Mr. Holmes. I think I can make a guess, Matron. Yes, I think I can make a guess. Ask the millions of men who wear Clippercraft clothes. Ask the fine stores that make them available to you everywhere, from coast to coast. The reason there's so much talk about Clippercraft is that they're so extremely fine at the price of just ordinary clothes. It's a pleasure to discuss Clippercraft on this program because I know I do a good turn to every man listening in. Regardless of price, you've never seen finer tailoring, longer wearing woolens, or more perfect fit. Suits are only $40 and $45. Top coats and overcoats are only $40. The famous Clippercraft plan makes all this possible. It concentrates the buying power of 924 leading independent stores across the nation. You get the savings that result from this group buying. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, in Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, and in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Oh, here, you take the shovel, Holmes. It's your turn. I'm exhausted. That's what comes of letting yourself get out of condition. Yes, I like that. Oh, thank heaven the gale has gone down. But the sea is still boiling. The moon's trying to break through the clouds. It makes the breakers down there look like a devil's cauldron. Job's done. Now, Watson, if you and Mr. Roundhay will help me lift out the coffin. Uh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. Oh, the authorities will probably raise Ned. Uh, now, all together. One, two... I see. Holmes... The coffin was remarkably light. Oh, Matty was a very little woman. 
Holmes, look. There's someone galloping over the moor as if the devil were after him. He's coming here. Good Lord, it's, it's Dr. Trevining. Oh, we're in for it now. Hold there, Vixen. Steady, steady. Now then, just what's going on here? Uh, uh, Dr. Trevining, we're uh, just taking a, a look at old Matty, uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and his friend, Dr. Watson. Oh, Dr. he did. Busy body, meddler. I heard you came to Divining this afternoon and saw my patient without consulting me. And now this. I suppose you've got a permit for this. No, I can't say we have. We couldn't afford to take time. Why not? We didn't want to give you the opportunity to finish off Mrs. Gregory the way you did her father and old Matty. I finish off my uncle and Matty? Why, why should I do that? Because you were determined to inherit the estate of Divining Water. If you had to kill off half the parish to do it. You're mad. There's no proof. The bodies are both decomposed. I wonder... Would you like to help us pry off the lid of this coffin? Watson, hand me that chisel. I protest. This is monstrous. Not as monstrous as murder, Dr. Trevining. Now then. Slide the lid off the other side, Watson. All right. Now, Mr. Roundhay, if you'll bring the lantern over here. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Good Lord. The body... She looks exactly the way she did when she died. When she died in agony, remember? No, no. Put back the lid. It, it's too unnatural. Her, her eyes, she's staring at me in that awful grin. There was no autopsy on old Mr. Trevining. In this case, however... But I... Would you like to put your hand on the body, Dr. Trevining? No, no. There's a local superstition that when a murderer touches the body of his victim, blood will flow. No, no. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. He's right. He's right in the wrong direction. He's headed for the cliffs. Good Lord. He rode the horse straight over the edge. They'll be smashed to death on the reefs. The Devil's Cauldron, as Watson called it, has claimed its own. Yes, the rocks on which his pirate ancestors wrecked so many helpless ships. I'm not surprised the sight of old Matty's body unnerved him. Who would suspect that after six weeks there would be almost no signs of decomposition? I not only suspected it, Mr. Roundhay, I knew. How so? Dr. Dennis Trevining chose one of the few poisons that also tends to act as a preservative. I allude, of course, to tartar emetic, commonly called antimony. By that story was a corker, Dr. Watson, and Dennis Trevining was certainly a throwback to his pirate ancestors. Yes, Mr. Harris. But look, why didn't he finish off his uncle and his cousin years before? Because as long as Wilfreda had no child, he was due to inherit anyway. You mean the estate wouldn't have gone to her husband? No, Mr. Harris. In England, the laws of inheritance are rather rigid. If a married woman who owns estates dies after giving birth to a living child, her husband will hold the lands for life as tenant by the courtesy of England. And that's what Dennis Trevining was determined to prevent at any cost. But why didn't Wilfrida die as quickly as her father, Doctor? Because more than one sudden death in the family would have been suspicious. Therefore, Wilfrida was given repeated small doses of the poison, which produced rather different symptoms. And what about Maddie? Matty undoubtedly suspected what was going on, but was afraid to say anything. Hence the cradle rocking. She was trying to warn her mistress. Eventually, when she was taken ill from overeating, the temptation to get her out of the way was too great, and Dr. Trevining killed her too. But the cradle, Doctor, it continued to rock after her death. Who rocked the cradle? The cat. Matty's black cat, Timothy. He found his way back to his old home, climbed up the tree outside the nursery window and entered through the broken window pane and made himself at home in the most comfortable piece of furniture, the old cradle. Holmes knew at once what had happened. Well, how, Doctor? By observing some short black cat hair on the mattress. Of course, it's also obvious. Yes. One Sherlock Holmes points out the explanation. <laughs> Got me that time. Well, Dr. Watson, what's our story to be about next week? Next week, I think I'll tell you how Professor Moriarty ran amuck during Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, stealing famous jewels, robbing banks, blackmailing millionaires, and uh, finally how he came very close to blowing up a ball at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> Makers of Clippercraft clothes in 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, 
Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of Professor Moriarty and the Diamond Jubilee. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. Speaking for Clippercraft Code. This is the world's largest network, serving more than 450 radio stations with mutual broadcasting systems. From New York, the makers of Clippercraft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Well, here we are again in front of Dr. Watson's cheery fireplace. A bitter December wind makes us glad to be inside, toasting our toes and listening to a Sherlock Holmes adventure. What's it be tonight, Dr. Watson? Well, now, let me see. Tonight, I think I'll tell you how Holmes' arch enemy, the diabolical Professor Moriarty, came close to disrupting the Queen's Diamond Jubilee festivities. You mean the celebration that marked the 60th year of the reign of Queen Victoria? Right. On that occasion, London was a mecca for adventurers and thieves drawn by the many visiting potentates and notables, all wearing their most fabulous jewels and elegant trappings. Uh, and, oh, by the way, speaking of glad rags, as you Yankees call it, aren't you um, rather dressy yourself tonight, Mr. Harris? I wondered how long before you'd notice my new suit, Dr. Watson. Mm, not bad. Stand up, let's have a look. Yes, not bad at all. Uh, is it... Uh, you mean, is it a Clippercraft suit? You bet it is, Doctor. Now I know why my friends say Clippercraft means what the well-dressed man will wear if he wants to get his money's worth. Yes, I wonder if I spoke to Santa Claus, I'd find something like that in my stocking, eh? Huh? All I can say is there's nothing the average male would rather find under the Christmas tree than a Clippercraft suit. But the mystery to me is, how do they manage to turn out that handsome rig at the price? Well, Dr. Watson, that mystery doesn't take a Sherlock Holmes to solve... Here's how Clippercraft makes it easy for a man to look his best on Christmas morning and hundreds of mornings thereafter. It's through the Clippercraft plan, which concentrates the buying power of 924 leading stores across the nation, making tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. The plan brings you the finest clothes at prices far less than you expect to pay at your own local independent store at the store you can trust. Beautifully tailored Clippercraft suits are only $40 and $45. Top coats and overcoats are only $40. Yes, indeed. The friends who drop in on Christmas Day will think your clothes cost twice as much. For Clippercraft values are so amazing, we urge you to compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson... Supposing we get back to Her Majesty's Diamond Jubilee and the gentleman who tried to spoil the celebration. Yes, well, uh, all London was on fate, Mr. Harris. The festivities were endless. Garden parties, concerts, parades. The entire city was in a holiday mood. All but my friend Sherlock Holmes. He had drawn the blinds to shut out the brilliant spring sunshine and lay moping on the sofa, morosely pulling apart the tassels of his ancient dressing gown. For heaven's sake, Holmes, buck up and stop uh, strewing bits of silk all over the carpet. You look as if you were molting. 
Everyone else is overjoyed at the celebrations. Leave me alone. I'm having my own private celebration. Oh, what are you celebrating in this particularly lugubrious fashion? Watson, do you realize it's just six years since Professor Moriarty and I pushed each other into the Reichenbach Falls? You know, came back, poor chap. Well, you're not going to tell me you're sorry you finally reached society of that monster. No, I suppose not. But think what an occasion of this sort would have meant to him. Theatres and ballrooms fairly dripping with jewels. Intrigue and cabals on every street corner. But a veritable El Dorado for a master criminal like Professor Moriarty. And what's happened? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Well, you, you might give Scotland Yard some credit. They've been working night and day to protect the holidaymakers. Scotland Yard. How would Scotland Yard have prevailed against a mastermind like Moriarty? Yes, the one antagonist I ever found who was my mental equal. Army. Oh, well, you forget if you hadn't finished him, he'd have finished you. You ought to thank your lucky stars. He's gone instead of moping about like a dying duck. See what it is, Watson. That's a good fellow. Inactivity. That's wrong. What's wrong with you, Holmes? If you're engaged in any normal occupation, you... Oh, yes. Oh, thanks, Mrs. Hudson. There's a letter for you, Holmes. Mrs. Hudson says it was delivered by hand. Probably some female whose pet poodle has eloped with someone else's spaniel. I'm not interested. Purple letter paper addressed in a large, scrawling hand. There's a strange sort of crisscross in the upper left-hand corner of the envelope. What's that? Watson, give me that envelope. Well, all right, you needn't snatch it out of my hand. By all that's holy, that's not a double crisscross. It's a letter M. Watson, it's Professor Moriarty's handwriting. Oh, you're off your head, Holmes. This Moriarty business has become an obsession, an ED fix. You'd better go out in the fresh air and get some exercise, or you'll be imagining that you see him... Shut up, Watson, and listen to this. To the world's greatest detective, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, warning... At least he doesn't underrate me, eh, Watson? Oh, go to blazes. You will doubtless be astounded to learn I am alive. I managed to survive our little personal encounter in Switzerland, not without sustaining physical damage which kept me in the hospital for over a year. The remainder of the time which has intervened since we last met has been spent in building myself a new organization. You destroyed my last one, if you remember. I shall not soon forgive you for that. You doubtless look on yourself as society's protector. You are wrong. I like that. Don't interrupt, Watson. The more I am thwarted, the greater is my thirst for revenge on society. I have held my hand long enough. From today forward, look out for me. I shall begin this afternoon by staging a daring jewel robbery in the Strand. Tonight, a certain lady at the command performance in Albert Hall will lose her famous emeralds. Tomorrow and the day after, I shall perpetrate some new outrage. He's ranting like a madman. And last but not least... You and your colleague, Dr. Watson, will be put out of the way. What? I take pleasure in advising you of the fact that your hepatitis friend, Dr. Watson, will be the first to go. Signed, Moriarty. So, I'm to be the first. <laughs> it doesn't frighten me, the old babble-headed blowhard. Yeah. Oh, I say, Holmes, uh, what is hepatitis? Hepatitis, my dear Watson, means rather blunted mentally. Oh, it does, does it? What's happening at Albert Hall tonight, Watson? I believe it's a concert by Adelina Patty. Everyone will be there. You weren't thinking of attending, I suppose. Why not, Watson? Why not? Uh, you might tell Mrs. Hudson to shake the camphor out of our evening clothes. I wonder if I have a clean, stiff shirt. Oh, dash it all, these... Seems to be the difficulty, Watson. Oh, everything's shrunk. My collar, my waistcoat, even my evening pumps. Why is it when anything's laid away in mothballs for a few months, it inevitably comes out a size smaller? It couldn't be because you've grown a size larger, I suppose. Oh, shut up. I... There, you see? You see what happens when I lose my temper? What? I just popped another button. I suggest you descend to the kitchen and allow Mrs. Hudson to repair the damage. No. Now what? It sounds like one of your confounded clients. Don't worry, I'll get rid of him in short order. I'd better take the back stairs down to the kitchen, Watson. You don't want to be caught in uh, disarray in case the client is a lady. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> Flowers that bloom in the spring trolley. Come in. Mr. Holmes, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Yes? I am Hector Pomfret, a Pomfret, Pomfret and Smog. We're the best-known jewellers in London, Mr. Holmes. By appointment to His Highness, the Prince of Wales, no less. Of course. Of course. You have a shop in the Strand and you've just been robbed. But, but, Mr. Holmes, how did you know? It happened less than an hour ago. My dear Mr. Pomfret, I have rather special sources of information. <laughs> it's incredible. I haven't informed anyone, not even the police. You see, some of the stolen jewels weren't my property. 
Lady Biddlesford's pearls, for instance. Uh, she said they'd be restrung. Then, of course, the uh, great Burmese ruby. I had that on consignment. I practically sold it to that wealthy Mrs. Tecumseh Jones from Denver. Oh, it'll ruin my business if they're not recovered. Pity. Well, it's outrageous that such a thing should be allowed to happen in a civilized country. And in broad daylight. What's happened in broad daylight? The Stroud, where did you come from? And what in thunder do you mean bursting in on us like this? Mr. Pomfret, I understand you've been burgled. I've come to see about it. I'm Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. Well, I don't want you. Go away. You may not want me, Mr. Pomfret, but your partner, Mr. Smart, does. He's the one that sent for me. He told me where you'd popped off to, so I came round to make sure you didn't get any bad advice. Thank you, Lestrade, for the vote of confidence. And now suppose you sit here quietly while Mr. Pomfret tells me just what occurred. Well, Mr. Holmes, I was in the shop alone. It was getting late and I was about to lock up when a nice, respectable, youngish man walked in the door. He wore a Prince Albert, carried a silver-headed malacca stick, a small black satchel, and had just the suggestion of a limp. Pardon me, you're Mr. Pomfret, I believe. Why, yes. Is there something I can do for you, sir? I was on the point of locking up, but if there's anything... No, no, want... no, no, nothing very important, I'm afraid. I, I've just broken the crystal of my watch. I'm a doctor, you see, and my watch is a rather important bit of equipment in my profession. Of course, I understand. Well, I'll see if we have a crystal to fit. Uh, do you don't mind waiting a moment? No, no, not at all. I amuse myself by looking at the handsome baubles in this... Uh... Showcase here. <laughs> They're more than baubles, I assure you, Mr. Um... Watson, Dr. Watson. Well, that ruby in the middle is worth a king's ransom, as they say. Very. Oh, yes, here we are. This crystal's perfect fit. Just a slight bit of pressure, so, and there we are. Here's your watch, Dr. Watson. The charge will be two shillings. Keep the watch. It served its purpose. I prefer the ruby and the other baubles. What, what, what do you mean? Stand back or you'll be cut by flying glass. Why, well, Dr. Watson, put down that case. Oh, stop him. I'm being robbed. Stop the... Stop! Quick as a thief, he'd snatched the contents of the showcase, ran out the door, and was lost in the crowds. Showing no signs of a limp, I take it, Mr. Pomfret. Why, no, Mr. Holmes. The limp certainly wasn't in evidence he ran out of the shop. Leaving his watch behind? Yes, I brought it with me. I've heard you can deduce a man's entire history from his watch. Well, here it is. Interesting. Very interesting. The thing that interested me about Mr. Pomfret's story was the thief's name. Watson. Dr. Watson. My dear Lestrade, you don't suppose any jewel thief is going to be foolish enough to give his right name? I'm not so sure. What did he look like, Mr. Pomfret? Oh, I don't know. Not bad looking. A bit above medium height. Military moustache. Slightly grey at the temples. Yeah, I think uh, I think that'll hold if I don't take a deep breath. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, as a matter of fact, the thief looked very much like... Oh, no, by Jove. He was this gentleman who just came in. Well, what thief are you talking about now? Oh, good evening, Lestrade. How is the Scotland Yard's prize watchdog, eh? Uh, Holmes, my watch. Where on earth did you find it? Well, you left it, Dr. Watson, in my shop when you smashed my showcase and made off with a Burmese ruby, not to mention Lady Biddleford's pearls. Holmes, what's the man raving about? As if you didn't know. So, you turned thief, eh, Dr. Watson? This association with Sherlock Holmes is responsible, no doubt. I've always suspected you two work both sides of the street. What's this all about, Holmes? Has everyone gone mad? I think I can explain the confusion, Watson. You'll not talk your way out of it this time, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. We've got the goods on your friend, Dr. Watson. Mr. Pomfret has made a positive identification. <laughs> I've been looking forward to using these handcuffs on you chaps. For heaven's sake, Lestrade, sit down and try not to be a bigger fool than the Lord intended. Uh, it's also perfectly simple. Here. Read this letter I received this morning and see if you can comprehend what danger we're really in. It'll take more than a letter. Shut up and read it. Now then, Watson, when did you first miss your watch? Why, uh, let me see it. Uh, it was this morning when I wanted to take Mrs. Hilton's pulse. I, I was positive I slipped it into my pocket when I dressed this morning, but I suppose I left it behind on the bureau. I sometimes do, you know. No, Watson, you took it with you. Remember you told me the times you were about to leave? That's right. So I did, but... Then how did it get here? The watch was lifted from your pocket by one of the light-fingered gentry in Moriarty's employ. Later this afternoon, it was used by another gentleman who impersonated you and robbed the jewelry shop of Mr. Pomfret here, leaving the watch behind to incriminate you. What oh, the blackguard, the filthy blackguard. Why, I've been in the entire afternoon. 
Why, well, you can give me an alibi, Holmes. Naturally, he's in coach. If you won't believe me, Lestrade, perhaps you'll take Mrs. Hudson's word. She spent the afternoon letting out Dr. Watson's dress shirt and fitting it to his person. But this is incredible, fantastic. The thief was exactly like your friend, Mr. Holmes. All oh, this hanky-panky about Professor Moriarty and his outfit. I've never even seen the man. How do I know there is such a person? We'll just have to take my word for it, Lestrade. Incidentally, we shall miss the first part of the concert at Albert Hall unless we hurry. Oh, good Lord, and I have to rush home and dress. I'm sitting in Mrs. Tecumseh Jones's box, you know. Who cares? I shall have to go to keep an eye on those blasted tiaras, I suppose. Ha! I hate music. I know, but you wouldn't want to miss the professor's next robbery. Come along, Lestrade. Mm-hmm. 